Hey everyone. Welcome back for the second part of Legacy Undone. As always, huge thanks to all of my Patreons, making these videos would be impossible without you guys' support, especially with all the restrictions YouTube places on my type of content. As always, the full story is already out over there for you guys along with about 30 other different stories you can enjoy. Also, feel free to send me any messages over there if you have any questions or even if you just want to chat. Link to all of that will be in the description. Anyways, everyone, enjoy the video. Chapter 14 Orochimaru's finger tapped against the steel, hand grasping it to try and bend the weapon. It didn't. An odd choice. He muttered. Most children wish for swords. Yeah well I ain't most children Ryoko shot back with air quotations. That and I got a wind affinity. What's best for that than, this. Her choice was something akin to the Fuma Shuriken four large blades in a cross pattern. Except that, rather than four blades it was more akin to two double-headed volgues with a ring in the center for the spinning motion. He gripped the weapon in his hand tinkering for a moment before he disattached them to show off twin volgues. Whoever came up with this had certainly been, eccentric. I would have no idea how to teach you to use this. He confessed. In truth. It'd be completely impractical without your wind element. But I do have a wind element and with that, the weapon's unpredictability outweighs its awkwardness. No one will know how to fight against it. She reasoned. It's freestyle. She grinned. Orochimaru's lip curled. He didn't like it personally. He'd seen others fight with Fuma Shuriken as a distraction, a way to buy time or confuse. Not win a battle. The weapon was meant for mid-range combat. It was too awkward for close range and too heavy for long range, unless you were Tsunade and could hurl the thing across a village. In his experience, discipline with sparse seasoning of surprise maneuvers won a battle. Not, on the fly unpredictability. Especially when one had no more surprises left in their arsenal. But Ryoko's independence and quote-unquote wild behavior was not something he was going to be able to quash out. If he didn't do this for her now she'd just do it herself later and get herself injured in the process. At least this way he could make sure she didn't cut open an artery in her thigh or something when practicing. The steel was excellent. He could always say that about Iwa, they had the best forges in the elemental nations. Only one that surpassed them was Kiri with its legendary blades, but those weapons were custom made and unique for their onbu. Iwa could mass produce better steel overall. This piece could channel chakras which was vital for the wind element, and was adding to its price tag. It was expensive. Almost prohibitively so. Still his team had their weapons stolen and had set a new record. As a reward for that last bit he'd been willing to buy them new shuriken, kunai, wire, tags and one choice of another weapon. Quite frankly he expected them all to simply go for swords. Naruto had declined and so had Kyofu. Ryoko was the only one who took him up on the offer and she was buying something he'd never seen before let alone fought or knew how to teach her how to use. Why couldn't these children just be predictable? This is robbery. The shout was almost a deafening roar that echoed through the store. Rochimaru raised an eyebrow handing Ryoko her strange choice of weapon back before he began to make his way towards the counter. Naruto was standing there. Glaring at the man for all he was worth. Kyofu was not far behind. Where Naruto's glare, on his cherubic face could be called cute by some, hers was just menacing. The store manager was glaring back at them and Orochimaru when the Sanin came into view. Is there a problem? The pale man drawled. He's charging us three times the price tag for all of these. It was Kyofu that answered. These things don't cost nearly half this in Konoha. Well we ain't in Konoha Leaf. The man barked back. If you people can't afford my goods maybe you should head out back to that charity case you call a village. The three Genin looked ready to do some harm, especially Naruto who looked about ready to jump over the counter before the Sanin's hand on his shoulder held him back. Rochimaru patted him on the arm, smiling with a placid calm that set the boy's teeth on edge. Kyofu, Ryoko, please place your equipment on the counter so he can tally up a price for us. The three Genin looked at each other before the two girls marched up, setting down their chosen assortment of kunai and shuriken along with Ryoko's custom fuma shuriken. The man began racking up the price tag on his register, whole minutes passing with nothing but the grinding and pinging of edited sums. Finally, the final price tag was set. Nearly 3,000 yen. An absurd final price even with Ryoko's choice of weapon that could have accounted for triple the money for the amount of kunai and shuriken they'd each bought combined. Rochimaru cleared his throat. The man started speaking. Now you listen here. The snake promptly ignored him, 
marching around the counter as the man kept on ranting. With a start the three Genin easily realized what was going on. Genjutsu. The snake hadn't taught them anything on the art, save for how to detect and dispel it, claiming it was the most difficult but also the most dangerous and they could see why that last part held true as it was displayed right before them. The store clerk was doing a tremendous job of throwing verbose insults at thin air. The serpent printed out the receipt, marched back around the counter, tossed each of them their weapons and took more weapons from the counter, then began to march out with the three following behind him. Zero. We have one month, he stated. None of you were injured or suffered any complications in the whittling portion of the exam. So each of you can participate in the spectator portion. I have no doubt Anaki will do whatever he can to sabotage your performance there. Ryoko snorted. They already tried. We set a record anyway. Hell I wouldn't be surprised if that jackass left us higher up the mountain than he had too. Don't think the Sanin drawled. That a single Chonin's little stunt will ultimately be the equivalent of whatever Anaki decides to throw at you. He won't try anything before the examinations that would simply be too suspicious and far too damaging to his reputation. But during the exam, HN, accidents happen all the time here. It wouldn't take much to mask one up even with the eyes of everyone in the village on you. I dare say most within Iwa would revel in the knowledge of your injury, or death. He let the three of them stew in that for a moment. You really are batshit crazy for bringing us here huh? Ryoko muttered for her team. Rochi smiled. A moment later he continues. As such the three of you will train a single discipline for the next month. Ryoko has already chosen her chakra element and weapon. The girl moved to open her mouth when she snapped it shut looking at the expensive piece of metal now in her grip. Suppose she did it that. He turned to the remaining two. But now that just leaves. Summons, Kyofu shouted, eyes gleaming before she realized what she'd done she blushed in embarrassment as all eyes turned to her. I, I would like to learn summoning jutsu please. The Sanin raised an eyebrow. The summoning technique is difficult. Chances are you won't be able to master it in time. He drawled. Yeah, well, high risk high reward right? She ventured. Summons are powerful with a multitude of uses besides you just standing on their heads. They drain a lot of chakra. He countered. With your reserves, at best you'd be able to summon three decent sized serpents before you fell to exhaustion. We can beef up my reserves. And even if we fail no one has seen my techniques in action yet. Naruto and Ryoko attacked, I merely came up with a plan. The Sanin raised an eyebrow. Merely, isn't how the role of the strategist should be held. He'd have to have this discussion later. He stared at the girl, thinking. Finally after nearly a minute he nodded. High risk, high reward it is. He determined. Then, he turned to Naruto. Now, you. He drawled. The blonde's hackles started to rise as they always did when the Sanin singled him out. The serpent cocked his head to the side. I've been wondering something, and it might take some experimenting. Naruto blanched and the serpent realized that somehow, that had been the wrong thing to say. Hell no, he cried backing up. You're not slicing me up you. That's called dissection. He interrupted before Naruto started going off on a tirade, of sorts. We will be practicing your last two elemental affinities. Naruto's eyes narrowed suspiciously. You're not sticking me in a lab and cutting me up? We're just doing elemental training? That's it? Geez princess you don't have to be such a bi Ryoko stopped. The two remaining team members looked at the girl finding her wide, disbelieving eyes fixed on a spot off to the side. They followed her gaze and couldn't help their jaws falling slack. One of them thought. Blue. The other. No, fucking, way. The monster of Kiri looked every bit the part, striding across the training grounds towards them. He towered over everything into Naruto, who was especially small. He felt as though he was looking at a giant version of this childhood nightmare. If he saw a flash of red clouds. The only thing that snapped him out of a repeat of what Itachi had witnessed the day he re-met her brother, was the sight of the two children at his side. The beady-eyed shark man grinned passing his eyes over each of them and lingering a little more on the blonde that held something more than mere suspicion behind that gaze. Then he looked to Orochi. Hey! Guess you weren't too crazy after all if your team busted the record beat mine by a whole 72 minutes. Did you want something? Orochimaru questioned we have training to get to. Proposal, he said with a chuckle. Mine are the only genin from Kiri to make it through the first phase. 
Soon is out completely and you're obviously the only leaves. Hmm, Orochimaru chuckled. And how many from Iwa and Kumo? You didn't mention the lesser villages. Kyofu muttered, only to receive deadpan stares from both men as a response. Evidently they held the lesser villages to a low standard or something. Two from Kumo, four from Iwa. Kisame eventually said. 37 teams and only 8 made it through? Orochi nodded. Yup, Kisame chuckled. And 6 of them are gunning for you. It would seem it'd be best to keep your distance then. The Sanin crossed his arms. Not really. He seemed to think for a moment before he turned around snapping his fingers. Haku. Tell us why? The Kiri Janan seemed to start for a moment before thinking. Well. Was the tentative start. Once they're done with the Konoha team. That's right, he laughed. Kumo and Kiri have fought side by side before. They'll do it again now. Once the leaves are gone, you two will be dead center of the new bullseye. It doesn't matter. Kimimaro asserted. We can defeat them all. The shark man raised his hand and let it fall in a half-hearted backhand onto the boy's head bopping him. No. You think you can beat them all. Kiri's not the only one with bloodlines bone boy. But, that still makes no sense. The Chunin examinations in Konoha have been one-on-one tournament-style competitions. Even if we were to cooperate we'll still just be fighting. Why is that? Orochimaru interrupted. Kyofu's mouth clicked shut. What? Can you tell me why it is our exams have consisted primarily of tournament-style, one-on-one competitions for the spectator portion of the examinations? The Sanin drawled. The three Genin thought, but each came up with a blank. The Sanin spoke. Take in the entire picture. Konoha has a grand total of eight large clans. The Sinjuu, the Uchiha, the Hayuga, the Abarame, the Akimichi, the Inuzuka, the Yamanaka and the Nara. And while two of those clans have no blood lines all of them have strict, regimented training. The only village that can slightly match that number of Keke Genkai clans is Kiri, whom hold six. We are the ones that are most likely going to feel the strongest Genin because ours will have the advantage of powerful clan techniques. Kisume nodded. Even if you end up losing those Genin we'll end up making a good show and we'll show off just how diverse those bloodline and clan techniques are. Even one lone Hayuga can burn through the rest of the inexperienced competition that doesn't know enough long-range jutsu to make up for it normally. And if they do the proctors will be sure to rig the numbers to keep that person as far away from the Hayuga as possible, hoping someone else takes them out or weakens them. Konoha doesn't rig exams, Ryoko hissed, smirking after a moment. We leave that to the lesser villages. Oh I like you kid. The blue man laughed. But that not how things work outside of La La Land. Insults or no insults. Orochimaru cracked his neck as he kept talking. Every Chunin examination, on any shinobi's territory will be subjected to a bending of the rules as much as they can get away with to favor their own teams. In this examination, with such an overwhelming numerical advantage, what do you think Anaki will end up doing? Naruto came to the conclusion at once. He'll make it so we have to fight them all at once. A big group fight, Haku concluded. I saw it happen once before in one of Kirigakura's exams. Kumo and Iwa prefer the tactic. Kumo's always been the most militaristic of the villages so they enjoy a numerical advantage over all others. Iwa has always used overwhelming force where it can be applied to most devastating effect. It's a strategy Tsunade, myself and Minato had to counter during the Third War and why so many of them were in one area when Minato's Hiraishin was finally prepared. Suna prefers surprise attacks with small elite forces rather than a mass rush. They don't have the numbers for it. It's why they compensate with their art of puppetry. Kiri Nin just like getting close and biting your face off. Kisame offered with a shrug. So what do you say? Allies? The three looked to Orochimaru. The Sanin shrugged. It'll be you taking the exam you'll enjoy the advantages, and the risk. Ah yeah risk, Kisame chuckled. Because remember kitties we can always be lying to stab you in the back later. The two girls and his own students looked at him oddly. Naruto took him at his word. Still he wasn't allying with Kisame. He was allying with Haku. He could trust Haku. Let's do it, he declared first. Ryoko shrugged. Either way we're outnumbered. At least now it's got a shot of being 5 to 18 not 21 to 3. Kyofu nodded slowly. I suppose. Kisume grinned. Great. He reached behind him, 
literally plucked Haku by the shirt and shoved the genin towards Orochimaru. Heard you're gonna be doing some elemental manipulation stuff. See how you can help with that. Don't manhandle me Kisame-sensei, Haku hissed. Yeah yeah. Now, Yuhi pointed right at Ryoko who stiffened in surprise and sudden dread as the man grinned. It's been a while since I've seen that weapon. Let's start practicing and see how well you can take an ass kicking. The silver-haired girl looked at her own sensei for salvation. Orochi shrugged, a smirk tugging at his lips. I told you I wouldn't know how to teach you. Seems to me as though you've just found someone who can. He stood, eyeing Haku, Kyofu, and Naruto. Now let's see how much information we can beat into your skulls by month's end. Zero. I called you both here a week ago, Anaki hissed as his door opened and the two men entered. And we're responding to you now. Han's voice would have been soft if not for its deep resonance caused by the armor. What do you want Anaki? The Tsuchikage's face darkened, a palpable fury radiating from his features. You do well not to test me right now Gobi. When I call you here I expect you to get here when I call you. Not at your own fucking convenience. Though his words started out in a normal tone his volume had been increasing until, by the end he was shouting, red-faced with a thick vein trailing down his forehead. The two Jinchuriki remained where they stood. While they were both powerful, they knew their place. Their lives were a precarious thing held by mere convenience of having them battle ready, rather than their tenants be confined to Genin with years left before they could be fully effective. They'd have left if any place was any different. People like them were born and tolerated because of convenience. People didn't want them in the village. Why trade one master with a leash for another with a whip? They railed against this status underscore quo, particularly Han, who took every opportunity to push and tug at the leash around his neck. But they knew their place. Right now though Anaki seemed to be in no mood for that. It's been decades since either of them had seen that Tsuchikage so murderous. The Sandaime was getting ready to untie the leash holding back his attack dogs it seemed. Roshi stepped forward clearing his throat. What is it that you need? Zero. Naruto was beginning to dislike Earth Chakra. Wind he picked up quick, well, because he'd done it before. And when he did it before he had the luxury of clones and a giant vulpine in his gut. He doesn't have nearly so many luxuries now. So he had to concentrate to pick up something new. Now mind you that was always the intent, regain his techniques with age and time and add to his experience and power as he grew older and got back to his teens. To try and pick this up now seemed more, intimidating slash frustrating than it perhaps should have been. Especially because Earth just felt so different. With wind you had to picture a blade. Two masses of chakra rubbing together until they formed a fine edge. This was because you couldn't see wind so you had to picture it and your chakra molded itself to bring about your will. With earth it was just the opposite dot picturing the earth coming up, forming a dragon head and eating Orochimaru wasn't gonna do jack. He had to make it do what he was imagining as opposed to imagining it and watching the results. It was a completely backwards process from what he was used to. That was why most of the time earth techniques were more simplistic. Walls, spikes, mud. You could coax the unbending rock to move just so. Whereas wind was complete freedom. Orochimaru had a feeling this would be his hardest element to master, and he was getting the feeling the bastard was right. That was why they started this now, to see if he could get it down in time to try and practice at least some rudimentary water techniques. Before moving on to Kyofu though the Sanin had surprisingly turned to Haku. What is it you want to learn girl? Naruto perked up. Aha! Haku was a girl this time. The Kirigenin scowled. Don't call me girl. My name's Haku. Naruto's eyes narrowed. Was that a demand to speak her name? Or did that imply that she wasn't a she? He could feel his teeth grinding together in frustration. Why couldn't someone just flat out say it? After a moment of Orochimaru staring Haku shrugged. Kisame sensei says my taijutsu is still subpar. Show me, he demanded. Haku turned taking up a stance before the sanin scoffed. Don't do a kata girl. Hit me, he demanded. Haku flushed, whether it was from irritation or embarrassment none could really say before she jumped, spun and aimed a spin kick at the Sanin's face. It missed. The serpent hadn't even moved the foot pass so close to his face it ruffled his bangs. Haku cursed as she landed. The serpent raised an eyebrow. More than sloppy. He surmised. How in the world did you manage to remain so inept at close combat with a sensei like Hoshige Kisame? SH shut up. 
She growled Kimimaro does the close-range combat on our team on long-range support. She seemed to blanch as she realized her tone. You are inept at it, he said. Hey stop putting Haku down, Naruto demanded. Yeah. A distant voice cried through the trees. Leave Princess's crush alone. He could all but hear the snickering laughs before the sharp, loud owl. Orochimaru raised an eyebrow but shrugged. We'll work on that. Seeing as how Kisame is already helping Ryoko with her choice of weapon. Uzumaki, mind your own training not hers. Kyofu. The girl stepped forward, all but dancing on her tiptoes. I won't be giving you my serpents, he declared flatly, watching the girl deflate at the news. Manda would more than likely eat you. You will memorize the 243 hand seals needed for the first summoning then we will perform it once you have and we will find you your contract animal. Zero. It was later in the date hat the teams were, by the insistence of Ryoko and Naruto, choosing to eat together. For Naruto's part he didn't trust Kisame. Not by a long shot. The man was part of the organization that had been hunting him his entire life. The man had helped Toby. That was enough to put him firmly on the do not trust slash kill as soon as needed slash possible list right beneath Orochimaru. But Haku was, a friend, the Haku he'd known had been his first real friend and the one that taught him what it was to have precious people. Even with all the pain it had brought him that lesson was still worth it. He'd like to be friends with this one if it was possible. And it's not like he could do anything about Kisame anyway. He hated being six. Insufferable age. So he insisted they all eat together. Ryoko agreed because evidently she wanted to continue insisting Kisame show off that awesome sword he had on his back. His teammates unanimously pushed for something other than ramen. They suggested sushi. Then Kisame glared. So they settled on some bistro steak place. Zero. Yeah well I don't do delicate. I break bones, snap limbs and rupture organs with my fists. Does she look like she's got the body type for that? Kisame muttered drinking straight out of a bottle. Naruto almost wept. Finally. Confirmation from someone that knew. Now he could safely call her a she. That doesn't explain how you've allowed her to be so dismal at it. Rochimaru shot back drinking a bit more conservatively out of a saucer. In the room. The girl hissed blushing in quiet anger. She hasn't needed it. The man grinned. You should see her with a senbone. Yeah, she sucks at close combat. It's a shame you'll never get there. Again. In. The. Damn. Room. Kisume Sensei. Kimimaro spoke up for, the first time in the whole day. You're giving away tactical information. He's been doing that all day. Kyofu muttered to herself, though Ryoko heard it snickering. Kisume waved his student off. May. You'll live. You won't always fight an enemy that's completely ignorant of you. I suppose not, it would be rather difficult to find such when it's being broadcast in the middle of a crowded restaurant. The bone wielder drawled. The blue man shrugged. Details. He drank again. Is it just me or is he basically confirming that they're planning to betray us? Ryoko questioned. Kind of a crappy sneak attack. Naruto ventured. Haku slapped her forehead. This is the weirdest table conversation ever. It doesn't involve two summonings, a rope. And five livers. Kisame strangely, was the one who finished for the Sanin as both gulped down their drinks. You haven't touched weird yet. The blue man laughed with Orochimaru nodding sagely. The students inched away. When their food arrived, with Kisame ordering a slab of ribs that he was swallowing, bones and all by the by. The Kiri Nin leaned forward. All right here's the girl will learn how to use that weapon enough to put the pointy end in someone else and not herself, within three weeks. You get Haku too. Naruto turned towards the dark-haired girl seated across from him and the pale-haired boy. So why are you guys a two-man team? He asked, turning his gaze from one to the other. We're not a team truth be told. The Kaguya answered. We're both apprenticed to sensei. In order to advance to Chonin, Mizukage-sama deemed our skills more than made up for a lack of a third member and formed a quasi-team. Haku shrugged. Zabuza-sensei is my normal sensei and Kimimaro-san is Kisame-sensei's. That's why Kisame-sensei doesn't know how to teach me very well. None of his techniques are suited to my and Zabusa's style. Naruto nodded in interest, not noticing how Kyofu and Ryoko giggled beside him, figuring he was hanging on every word when he was really remembering how much destruction Kisame could bring on a place to level it. 
where Zabuza with the silent killing was far more precise. Kisame and Zabuza Sama competed in order to be the ones to escort us here. She finished. Really? Naruto asked, somewhat excited. He remembered how strong Zabusa was. That must have been some fight. Haku's eyebrow twitched in irritation. They flipped a coin. She growled dryly. Best two out of three. Something told him Zabuza wasn't exactly in the realm of Zabuza-sama in this version of history. Aw oh, don't feel bad Haku-chan. Ryoko nudged her shoulder against the girl. Naru-chan here will fight for you. Eh? Zero. The doors of his office opened, and in March the one student he had left in the village. You hear the news yet? She asked smirking as she marched into the room planning herself on the chair. Sarutobi was biting down on his pipe. Wisps of thin smoke rising from its cup. Do you mean, did I hear that the Konoha team recently managed to set a new record in the first exams they've attended in Iwagakur since the Chonin exams were established? No. I don't believe the grapevine reached me yet. She let out a laugh. This is good eh? The cloud of that alone will draw in clients and it definitely makes a hell of a statement to Iwa and Kumo. H took in a deep breath, pulling the pipe from his teeth as he settled back in his chair and looked at her. My lessons at subtlety clearly rubbed off on you the most. I almost didn't see the pink elephant dancing across my face holding the make nice with Oro sign. Her face scrunched up in a displeased scowl. All right fine you old grump. You've been sulking up here miserable for three weeks now. Yeah I was pissed at him and worried about Naruto too but come on. Clearly they were ready if they managed to set a damn record. Isn't that enough to bring out a smirk? A smile? A chuckle maybe? He shook his head, muttering to himself under his breath as he seemed to flounder over whether he should smoke and talk or talk then smoke. It isn't about that. Then what is it? It's about the fact that neither of you know responsibility. She rolled her eyes. Oh great now I'm being dragged into th. You are. He interrupted again and the slug princess was starting to realize that she was about to be the subject of a tirade that seems to have been building up for a while. The old man took a breath opening his mouth to speak before he stopped himself, closing his eyes and taking another deep breath before his head hung down. Tsunade-chan, just go, I'd rather not talk right now. Her eyes softened. He looked, worn. Sensei, are you okay? It was a moment before he took a breath, lifting his head again. I'm supposed to be relaxing, he said, confusing her. I'm supposed to be, in my home, relaxing, someone else should be sitting here. I gave him the job. But he up and quit on me before the remains of my office could gather a film of dust in storage. He shook his head. And I am just, so tired. He finally said as he looked at her. But, who can I trust with it? Who can I leave it to? I have one student about to get married, start a family of her own. It's enough responsibility. Are you, blaming me for getting married? She questioned, incredulous. Never. I just, I know this job does not go well with parenthood. She didn't say anything to that. The estranged relationship between her sensei and his eldest son, Asuma, was something of an open secret. And she didn't want that to be her. She loved Dan, just as sensei had loved his wife and children. That didn't save them from the long hours, sleepless nights and emergency conferences that cut into every hour of the day every day of the week. She didn't want his life to be hers, and if that was something he took into account, she was grateful. He took another breath, smoking before tossing his pipe on the desk, bits of tobacco leaves sprinkling out of the cup as it tilted over. He rubbed the bridge of his nose. And then I have another that goes pulling games for his own amusement. Looking to Tawny Wagakur and the whole world with his success. Dragging the daimyo straight into the crossfire and putting us all at risk of another war when he almost laughed then, but despite the smile it was something that sounded like a scoff, or even a sob. We would even have trouble fighting one of the lesser villages. He tisked I have 800 active shinobi when before I had well above a thousand. I have, an economy struggling to hold itself afloat with the far reduced volume of missions we can take, no jinchuriki. And that's one secret that once unearthed it'll be open season on us. I'm entering talks with Kumo as a backup in case soon as hostility boils over with their daimyo hiring us for missions even though I know they're far less trustworthy. I'm trying to hold together a trade agreement with Kiri when we have no funds to hold a merchant navy together. I'm trying to keep an eye on Donzo, and whatever he's been scheming recently and, and, and the only one I could possibly have left this to, is dead. 
He shook his head and the only other is a man who puts children in danger for his own amusement, with you and I just giving him a faux pass and laughing at his ploys or grinning when it turns out he was right and, and I am just so sick of it. His last words made her jump. He never shouted but this one had just swallowed the room. It was the despondent look in his eye that truly brought her short though. She didn't see anger there just. Disappointment. He was disappointed that his fears had evidently been confirmed. He had no one he could count on. She'd never seen him like this he looked withered and aged far more than his normal vibrant facade. She wanted to say she was sorry, but it just seemed so, worthless. Still. I'm sorry, Saru sensei. He took a breath still looking down at the table. He nodded. When I'm gone one day, he said after a moment. Promise me you won't let yourself accept this job Tsunade. Slowly his hands reached back down, gripping the file before angling it up to continue where he'd left off. His momentary lapse left behind now like so many other things. Zero. You almost got it that time. She praised. Naruto scowled. It's an ant hill. Which is more than you had before. Haku smiled. You're getting there. Naruto squinted. Can't tell if teasing. He growled aloud. It was supposed to be a spike. She giggled. So after this you plan on learning water? The blonde nodded. Then he glared down at the dirt at his feet as though it was guilty of some grave crime. Yeah, once I can make more than a damn ant hill. She smiled again. It's not so bad. You're catching on quick for your age. She frowned. Which reminds me, how old are you? This many. Naruto teasingly held up his two hands, five fingers and a thumb on display. All of you are old. She fiddled with one of her senbon. Orochimaru was gone for the day. Apparently having gone with Kyofu somewhere to find her summon animal or something. How exactly that worked Naruto didn't know. He'd just signed the contract and that had been that. The nuances of forming a brand new contract that hadn't existed before were completely lost on him. And no, those things weren't just sign here and we pledge eternal service there were details and things that had to be hammered out and agreed on. Summons didn't just accept anyone. Game Ubuntu, despite all his bluster had trusted Jiraiya and had recognized him as both Minato's son and the QB Jinchuriki. The Toads wanted him to be their summoner since before he could walk. Jiraiya had been the one to do all the work on the original summoning agreement. Needless to say that wasn't the norm. Orochimaru and Tsunade had followed his lead on that and had made their contracts later in life. He didn't know how dangerous Katsuyuu was, but Manda would eat people that tried to summon snakes and were found unworthy one had to be careful when they tried to make a contract. Hence why Orochi was following her. If things went to hell he could go into a fight with the beasts. He lowered his hands. So. He ventured. What's your other sensei like? He fished for conversation even as he answered his own question. Big, scary, uses a huge sword, sharp teeth, no eyebrows gray skin, eats children and small animals. Zabuza sensei is great? She said quickly. He's one of Kirigakur's seven swordsmen, Kisame sensei is another. But Zabuza sensei is the greatest user of the silent killing techniques of the show Daim Mizukage. We'll be scaring off every potential boyfriend in the future, probably by growling angrily and glaring maliciously or just plain old cutting off an arm or two. He smiled at his inner jokes. What can you tell me about Orochimaru Dono? He poisoned us, and he bites. The blonde deadpanned. She raised an eyebrow. Bites? Why is it that the poisoned us part is the one that takes a back seat here? He still nodded though remembering the forest of death. The first forest of death. Oh yeah. You want an unnecessarily creepy fight. He's the one to go see. Bites, peeling skin, sword out of stomach, licking. He shuddered at the last one. Haku's eyebrow rose. This was certainly not what she had been picturing for the legendary death dealer. You're making this up. She accused. Naruto was about to open his mouth when he realized that, he might have just, okay he did trip over his own blatant stupid here and just spouted a whole bunch of things about a guy that he hadn't seen yet. He grinned. Had you going though right? Then he frowned. Seriously though. He did poison us. She nodded. Zabuza and Kisame sensei have their eccentricities but what you were saying was just absurd. Again, why do you not seem to give a rat's ass on this poisoning thing? He decided to move the subject away from the snake. So you and Kimimoko are bloodline users? Kimimaro. Right, that guy. Why could he never remember the name? 
he was normally good with names. We are, she said. He's of the Kaguya can, they can manipulate their bones. Which I'm sure you gathered since Kisame Sensei keeps calling him Bone Boy. So what about you? What are your skills to graduate so early? I'm just awesome, Naruto laughed, catching the unsubtle shift in conversation. He wanted Haku and him to be friends but he wasn't about to brag. Especially when he had very little to brag about. There were a lot of things he could do. But there were more things he couldn't. The Rasengan, his shadow clones the summoning technique, his sage mode. These were all staples of his fighting style that he simply couldn't do yet because he couldn't explain them yet. He didn't have access to the shadow clone technique, he didn't know Jiraiya and the Rasengan had never been taught to him, he didn't know the summoning technique let alone be able to just summon toads. He could just pull all of this out of his ass but there was only so very much people would buy from my false memories told me to do it before they called him out on his bullshit. His graduation was less about how exceptional his power was and more on how quickly he learned things. Sure his experience in the war gave him more options and skills per se but he was still very limited. In comparison to Haku, who despite being younger no doubt already knew and had mastered a great deal of her bloodline, along with Kimimaro, they might be younger than they'd been when he fought them the first time and thus, weaker, but they could very likely be stronger than him as it stood right now anyway. Gara had supposedly had to bury the bone guy a mile deep. The only weapon he had that could match those two Keke Genkai was his wind element and that's if Haku didn't pump him full of Senbone before he could get too close. Still, that would change. It was just the anxiousness of waiting for that change to come that was killing him. He grinned, starting up some of his hand seals again. This was enough of a break. Hey Haku after the exam and we're done beating each other up, he said after a moment. Wanna be friends? She smiled at him somewhat bemusedly at the innocence of his question and he suspected, that she suspected Ryoko's teasing of his supposed crush was in fact more than just teasing. But if he was gonna be stuck in this six-year-old body he was gonna use the one advantage it offered. Cuteness. She let out a soft laugh. Sure we can Naruto-kun. Chapter 15. The Chonin exams Naruto remembered were held in an arena, one big enough to sight thousand spectators or so surrounded on three sides by rows of bleachers and open to the forest on the fourth. It had been built by the San Daime when the Chonin examinations were agreed upon at the end of the last war. Iwa's Chonin exam was held in a barren field. Konoha wanted to not only have the title of strongest of the five. They wanted to look the part too. Iwa was a bit less extravagant in their efforts. The only people that mattered were high-paying clients and those high-paying clients could pay the pittance of a D-rank assignment it cost Genin to raise these platforms up in a day or so. That and because a field of nothing but dirt and rock was something of an advantage for Rock Ninja. Anyone who wanted to could show up. There were no admission fees, unlike Konoha's exams. Good luck trying to see anything if you arrived late though. The only people with proper seats were those who had them sitting on wooden towers that had been built before the exams. In other words the nobles from around the village with a pretty penny to spend, or visiting dignitaries. Or of course the cage's seat. That tower stood higher than all the others, wider too, wide enough for civilians to climb up on its support struts to find themselves a better view. The reason for its girth became clear when, atop its plateau one could see five chairs beneath a gazebo-like tarp, spread out for those that would be observing the exam from its shaded vantage point. It was tall enough for Koto to see as he rode out of the village, still half a mile away. Do you think we'll feel a breeze up there? He drawled. It looks like the sun will be biting the flesh off your face today. Who can say? Orochimaru shrugged, walking alongside the man, his students trailing behind him. You didn't bring your armor Megajiro-sama. Koto gave the sun in a sidelong glance. Have you ever tried sitting for hours on end in it? Hashirama knew how to forge something to protect you, that doesn't necessarily mean it was made to be comfortable it might be decidedly less comfortable to be stoned by angry civilians. The snake replied dryly. Koto hummed. Anaki wouldn't try anything now. Too open and far too damaging to his reputation, but some of those villagers were looking more than a little miff now that he cared to look. Can I trust you to guard me from thrown rocks and shuriken, courtesy of Academy hopefuls Orochimaru? It would be a rather embarrassing way to die. The Sanin chuckled. Agreed Mega Jiro Dono. By the time they arrived where the exam was to take place the Jounin were beginning to push the crowd back, forming the ring for the actual fight. They would create a wall of elite protectors between the Genin and the civilians to keep stray attacks from cutting the crowd to pieces. It also gave them a front row view. 
Between the press of people backpedaling and the people still pouring into the area behind them there was a sheer crush of humanity that made progress, even with the Jounin escorts opening a path for them through the crowds, a decidedly slow thing. Still before long they had made it to the base of the burgeoning tower with Koto dismounting easily, his men taking hold of the horse with two more flanking him. He looked at the Konoha team he had dragged himself into enemy territory to supervise and do his part to keep safe by his mere presence. The man smiled. You look ready. He appraised. Damn re the silver-haired girl seemed to catch herself her face turning scarlet in embarrassment. Ah, uh, I mean. He laughed. He didn't know the children very well, the trappings of power always prevented easy conversation. They would not know how to address him because of his station. He wouldn't know how to address them due to their differing societies and the massive age gap. But he supposed for now he could offer one comfort. He fell onto one knee in front of them, getting to eye level. I met your shot I'm once. Did you know that? The three shook their heads. I was just a boy, he remembered eight years at most, I asked him how it was I could become as powerful as him. Do you know what he told me? Hmm? They shook their heads, offering each other curious looks. He said I was already stronger than he was. That the strength of those that came before is carried by the new generation. And so, every generation will be stronger than the last. And to date, I've never known Hashirama to have been wrong. He stood dusting off his knees before he looked down at them. The three of you are the newest generation. So you three are the best Konoha has ever had to offer. I know you'll do us proud. The children bowed. Thank you Megajiro-sama, Kyofu said respectfully. We promise to do our very best to win. The man nodded, before looking to Orochimaru. I'll leave you to your students. Come join me when you're done. Just like that the man turned and began marching up the stairs that wound around the wooden tower like a serpent, winding to the top. Orochimaru wasted no time before walking to stand in front of his three students and began speaking. Remember, there can be only one winner in this fight. He drawled. You are allies with Kiri due to convenience. Do not turn your back on them. Do not assume they will not do their utmost to win just as you will. Once you feel the tide against Iwa has irrevocably turned in your favor, they are your next greatest threat. The Yuki and Kaguya bloodlines are strong forces that beat back many challengers in the time of unending war. Do not underestimate them, but more importantly do not be caught off guard by them, he who strikes first, strikes twice. He saw Naruto frown, even as the other two girls nodded in understanding. Whatever infatuation the boy had with the Yuki girl he could only hope it wouldn't cost the team once push came to shove. If it did, well, it'd be enough of an embarrassment for the boy to serve as a good enough lesson. You've trained yourselves well. It was as close to open, unabashed praise as they were going to get from him. Now go out there and show these Iwa fools that even without the Yondaime they're only fit to serve as our bootlicks. And without another word he turned and marched after the Daimyo and his guards. Zero. Megajiro finished climbing the last step, grunting as he did. He was getting old already. His joints and muscles aching even if his heart was still beating normally. He found Anaki already waiting there, beside him was another man he'd never met but could recognize easily enough. A hulking mountain of muscle, white hair framing a scowling face as he stared down at the hissing mass of people below. Anaki turned, facing him as he heard his approach. Nodding. No bow this time, no. He wouldn't be getting any of those today without offering some of his own first. Megajiro Dono. The daimyo nodded. Suchikage Dono. He turned to the other man who turned to face him. Rakage Dono. A looked at him, offering little more. Koto made his way closer to his designated seat, trailing his eyes down towards the widening ring of people in order to give the Genin plenty of room to fight. Jounin could easily defend against any attack a Genin could pull off but there were always some outliers that could pull off some crazy stunts every once in a blue moon. So it's true. The rakage looked back to him again. You actually had the nerve to show up yourself. Koto smiled. It was as close to an open threat as had been offered during his stay, not counting Anaki's granddaughter of course. Of course I did. In my shoes, you'd like to see your Genin win as well. A's lip curled. Koto found his candor to be a pleasant breath of fresh air. So much posturing already. A feminine voice replied, drawing their eyes towards a copper-haired female. She was younger than any of them had been expecting. Early twenties at best. Rumors had been flying over a dispute for the position of Yondaime Mizukage that had threatened to break into all-out civil war. 
If she'd managed to oust her competitor or competitors then she must be more powerful than her age warranted. Mizukage Dono. Anaki greeted, watching as the woman was soon flanked by two monstrously tall men wielding massive blades. The demon of the bloody mist and the monster of Kiri. Besides himself, May had brought the greatest escort. A had brought none, the only other kumonin here were the sensei of the two participating teams. Koto had. It looks like we're all here then. The serpent slithered out of the floor, his body melting out of the wooden panels at their feet with that smirk plastered over his face, hair falling over one eye as the other glinted in a practice look that was meant to inspire unease. Anaki's lip curled at the sight of him. What he wouldn't give to wipe that smug little smile permanently off his face. I assume your respective teams are ready. He addressed them as he turned away and stepped onto the edge of the platform. With no words of protest emerging from any he decided to proceed. All right, let's get this started then. Zero. Ryoko-san. The silver-haired girl's head snapped up at the sound of Haku calling her name, swiveling her eyes this way and that way, she found the dark-haired girl waving over the heads of the crowd to get their attention. Hey. She spoke towards Kyofu and Naruto. This way. Pushing through the thin crowds near the front lines the three students made their way closer towards their de facto allies. Once they did, it was easy to find the Iwa teams. That them? Naruto asked, squinting to try and get a better look. It was Kimimaro that nodded. It is. There is at least one bloodline user in Iwa's team, though we've not been informed of who it is, or what bloodline it is. Well that's helpful. Took a load off my mind right there. Ryoko muttered. The bone wielder scowled at the sarcasm while Haku giggled. Still squinting Naruto decided to offer a bit of sagely advice. Look for the weird looking one. He nodded to himself. Bloodline users always look weird. Excuse me. His Sakura angry danger senses were going off at Haku deathly sweet tone. Ah, uh, I mean, that is all of them except for pretty Yuki clan members. He ventured with one foot poised to run away. Haku patted him on the head, a sprinkle of frost glimmering there, sending a shiver down his spine. Nice try. Smooth princess. Um, any information on the Kumo teams? He asked, desperately trying to change the subject. None. It seems that they were skilled enough to make it through the first portion of the exam but not much more than that. They're average at best. Don't underestimate your enemy. Kyofu muttered, remembering how many times Orochimaru had hammered those words into her. They might still surprise you. Iwa will be heading straight for you, Haku said. Kumo and Kiri are also bitter enemies, they'll most likely target us if they don't go after you. Hold out until Kimimaro and I defeat the Kumo teams, then we'll return to help you with the Iwa Genin. Hey, Ryoko chuckled. What makes you think you guys will be done first? She spun the custom Fuma Shuriken in her grip once before bringing it to a stop. The rock heads won't know what hit M. We're outnumbered 3 to 1. Kyofu pointed out. They'll most likely try to isolate us, one team for each one of us. The fourth team means at least one of us could be subject to fighting six. If that happens, try to evade and stall while one of us deals with a weaker team. They can't all be up to par here. Wouldn't it be better to regroup? Naruto asked, frowning. That's what they always did in the wars. Isolated units got picked off, unified men and women, even outnumbered were a bigger beast to try and chew. It would normally, but earth techniques when they're not defensive can get pretty big. Just because one of us can dodge it doesn't necessarily mean we all can. Us bunching together in this case just increases the chances of us getting hit by one of the bigger attacks meant for someone else. Or worse that the Genin can pummel us with coordinated volleys. You think they know elemental manipulation? Ryoko asked. Kyofu shrugged. We do. She answered simply. You think they have their own batshit crazy sensei that teaches Genin high Chun Nin level chakra exercises? They might. Point taken. Kyofu nodded. Isolation is best in this situation I think. Naruto's frown deepened. I don't know. Oi. The Genin looked, finding one of the Iwa Jounin staring at them. Get out here. It's time to start. Confused but obeying the Genin marched out of the front lines of the crowd, following the Jounin Proctor as he led them to the center of the ring. Naruto and the others could now get a clear look at their competition. Zero. What are you doing here? Akatsuchi had never seen Kuro-chan stand so very stiff. A metal rod would have had more curve than her at the moment. Or him for that matter. Both children turned, 
eyes trailing up to find the stern face of Kyuchi glaring down at them. Weren't you forbidden from leaving the estate for the duration of the exams young lady? We just wanted to see. She defended. I wasn't planning on doing anything. Honest. The Jounin's jaw twitched beneath his skin. Turning his eyes towards Akatsuchi, his daughter's partner in crime for half their stunts. And you aka? The boy opened his mouth to speak when Kuro jumped in again. I went to go get him. She barked. More than likely he went to get you out of that house. His daughter had been absolutely miserable for the past month. But her misery of being locked indoors was only overshadowed by her self-loathing at having Anaki so angry with her. The old man had been furious and rightfully so. Kurotsuchi had risked a flat-out open war. But more than that she risked her own life. Even if she didn't fully comprehend the ramifications of her actions it wasn't something the old man could do anything but get angry at, child or no. Still, a month of not leaving the house along with the other punishments leveled on her would drive anyone crazy. He supposed an hour or two wouldn't exactly spoil the girl, or spark the fourth war. Stay here, don't move. Once this is done you're both going with me, back home. They nodded. He marched off to join the wall of Jounin as his father's voice cut through the morning air. Zero. In the duties of a shinobi. Anaki began, his voice easily carrying over the hum of the crowd far below with the chakra carrying his voice. Our roles are not limited to espionage and silent assassinations. While darkness and shadows are our element often we are called upon to lend our might to the open battlefield against the enemies of our daimyo, be they samurai or other ninja. He paused, letting the word settle. For this reason, this part of your Chunin examination shall be one of open combat. You have no allies in this battle. Only one team can be the victor. Your objective is to see yourself and your team safely through the chaotic rampage of the battlefield and be the ones to emerge victorious. Take your places, wait for the signal to be given and then fight well. He stepped back, taking his seat between the Rai and Mizu cage. A seemed displeased, Mei was carefully neutral. It was a thin pretense to tip the scales in favor of Iwa. But the same was always true no matter what village hosted the exams. It was his turn this year. Zero. So the snake was right huh? We really are gonna have to fight them all. Naruto frowned. Ryoko nodded. Yeah. I get ya. Kinda hoping to avoid this headache too huh? Yay. He grumbled. He was still going to win. He'd be damned if he lost again and after everything he'd been through but it was still gonna be a tough fight. They made it to their corner of the makeshift ring, going clockwise from their left there was an Iwa team, Haku's team a Kumo team and Iwa team, another Kumo team and finally the last two Iwa teams before coming back around to them. The proctor made it to the center of the ring. Are all the teams ready to begin? He panned his eyes around him to see if there were any objections. Take note that this is your last opportunity for any last-minute preparations or objections if you're injured or ill. Zero. Come on start already. Kurotsuchi growled, glaring out from where she stood between Akatsuchi and slightly behind her father. Who do you think's gonna win? I heard those two from Kiri are really strong. We'll win of course. She scoffed as though it were obvious. Why are you so sure though? Because aka. She huffed. We've got more teams. That Kiri team isn't even complete, the Leaf team have a pipsqueak for a third member and the Kumo teams are nothing special. How do you know? I, shut up I just do. Are you, ah, uh, what was the word? Posturing. Kyuchi threw back helpfully with a smirk over his lips. Yeah. That. I am not. Zero. Begin. The proctor jumped back, towards the edge, vanishing from the center. For a while, no one really moved. Then, with little more than a smile and a wink as a warning Naruto took off to their right, making a beeline straight for the two Iwa teams. Hey! How many Iwa teams does it take to take down one Genin? He laughed, all but frolicking towards them. Kyofu and Ryoko nodded. Evidently Naruto was determined to take the lion's share. They'd have to be quick with theirs. He was strong. But he was still only six. The two girls split up and rushed their own enemies. Zero. Kisame laughed. Now that kid knows how to have fun. It's arrogant of him. A snorted, casting a sideways glance towards Orochimaru. I expected better from the so-called death dealer. Was it brash tactics like this that brought you to heal Anaki? Koto snorted in laughter. The man was bold. 
but to criticize brash tactics when he just insulted his host and another dangerous shinobi was rather bold-faced by anyone's standards. Orochimaru couldn't look more bored. Zero. Naruto smiled as he swerved mid-run, avoiding a hail of thrown shuriken as he rushed headlong into the six genin. The first one that reached him tried to kick. The blonde rolled beneath it, came up behind the boy, latched onto his back like some demon gremlin from hell, climbed up higher, using chakra to keep himself in place before he solidly boxed the genin's ears. The slap of his hands and the additional wind chakra he'd infused into his palms, rushed into the ear canal and instantly ruptured the eardrums and disrupted inner ear functions. The genin screamed, clutching at the now bleeding ears before tripping over himself, the vertigo hitting him a second later as he tried to hold down his stomach. Naruto laughed as the other genin shouted out their anger at the injury of their teammate. The whole group attacked this time. Naruto grinned, tensing his muscles as wind chakra danced around his limbs a gust picking up around him before this side of the ring was blanketed in a dust storm, swallowing the seven genin instantly and hiding him from view. Zero. Up above Kisame was giggling under his breath like an idiot. Snickering through his teeth. Boxed, ears, ha ha. Can't say I would have thought of that. Konoha's wind elements are rare, May said contemplatively. He seems to have a remarkable grasp of it given his age. He didn't use hand seals to cause the dust to rise. She looked to Orochimaru in askance. The Sanin would have flatly ignored her altogether, if Koto hadn't chuckled, taking his cue to step in on her behalf. Trained him well did you Oro? He's always picked up things quickly. Wind has come very naturally to him. He offered, absolutely nothing at all really. Meanwhile, Zabuza and Kisame were making their own entertainment. Kimimaro's already taken down one. And done Jack with the other two. Haku's ripping her three to pieces. She'll cut them up good but she'll be tired by the time those pin pricks take down any of them. Betcha she'll need help for chakra exhaustion after this is over. Bet your boy's gonna be running around chasing his enemy for the duration of his fight. He'll still get M. Like a rushing bull eventually has to crash into something. May sighed, irritated. You're blessed with two wind elements it seems. Anaki grunted, drawing everyone's attention towards the silver-haired Ryoko, whose strange weapon was now nearly three times its previous size, four razor-sharp blades spinning rapidly in her hand as she stalked the three Iwa Genin in front of her like prey. The girl's weapon spun almost languidly in her hand. She seemed confident, and while that could definitely be true given that it was a Genin, it could just as easily be a blustering bluff in the face of three opponents. If she waited very long the Genin might come up with a decent enough strategy to attack her with. Luckily, Ryoko was never known for her patience. The silver-haired leaf Genin rushed forward with a battle cry, a length of ninja wire tied around the center ring of her weapon as she swung it around like a massive guillotine at the three Iwa Genin that scrambled to get out of reach. Zero. Inside of his self-made dust bowl Naruto grinned as he formed set of seals. Zero. Kyofu cursed, abandoning her hand seals for her fire technique to block one of the Genin's approaching kicks lashing out with her own, the Genin dodged before his friend came around to strike at her exposed side with a kunai. She contorted her body, wincing as the muscles in her back made their protest sharply known before reaching around and latching onto the boy's wrist, twisting harshly before yanking him forward and all but shoving him into his friend. She formed her hand seals, a gokaku exploding out of her lips that was immediately quelled by the kunoichi's water technique coming between them. Kyofu cursed, tossing shuriken even as she was forced to dodge and weave away from the other two that were now recovered and attacking. She leapt back, another fireball making them scatter and giving her some breathing room. She landed and was forced to fall flat onto her back as an earth spike rose up to gore her on its surface, the Iwa Genin were on her already. She pulled out a fist full of explosive tags, throwing them up in the air, letting them fall like rain before she made them burn with a flick of chakra. The concussive force battered her body and knocked the wind out of her. It hurt, her ears were ringing. But heat rises. The brush of uncomfortable fire against her flesh was gone in the barest instant before she was already pulling herself off the floor and onto her feet, rushing away from where she'd fallen. She landed and cursed as the Kunoichi in the team was already attacking her, not giving her a moment to breathe. She took her stance, blinking the blur from her eyes and trying to will the ringing from her ears as she braced herself. The move to lunge. Then she was neck deep in the ground. Hey! WH what the hell is this? It was a basic earth jutsu. Kyofu blinked, confused and startled, her confusion was partially diffused though when a tuft of blonde hair and two blue eyes rose up from the barren dirt at their feet. 
turning and looking before it began drifting closer towards Ryoko's fight, sinking fully into the ground a moment later. Kyofu didn't waste another second, rushing forward and delivering a full, unobstructed kick at the girl's face that might have broken something in the process of knocking her unconscious. She smirked at the last two boys. Three against one was pushing her to use her jutsu to level the playing field. Her reserves were the weakest of the team, even if she was the oldest. Two against one she could manage and hold back her jutsu repertoire for later. She tossed a glance at the Kaguya boy who barely even flinched as an explosive tag went off point blank in front of him, looking decidedly bored as the smoke cleared. It seemed as though they might need it. Zero. If Kisame could see her expression clearly, or hear her, he would have found something of a kindred spirit in his quasi faux month long student. She was laughing like the crazed resident of a psych ward. The weapon was swung up and around, over her head and abreast, the massive wind shuriken forming a dervish of razor-sharp blades that battered aside their kunai and projectile weapons with howling gusts and kept them far far away as they tried to gain enough distance to not be threatened by the thing. It was only when she felt sweat trickle down her temple that she realized just how much chakra she'd been eating up. Instantly, she pulled the weapon back, beginning to feel the edges of weariness eating at her as the adrenaline began to taper off. The other Janan pounced seeing her relentless assault finally abate. If it wasn't for the fact that they'd wasted most, if not all their kunai, shuriken and a few explosive tags trying to get to her beforehand, she might have been worried over having been drawn into a trap. She gripped one end of her weapon, the coating of wind chakra over it now was gossamer thin, not enough to drain her but enough to give the weapon enough of an extra bite to make it worth more than its awkward unwieldy nature. The first boy threw shuriken that she batted aside with a swing of the four blades in front of her, the second genin was a split second after his friend, throwing his weapons in such a way to tangle her own with ninja wire. Several were sliced right off, some did take hold in parts of the weapon she wasn't focusing her energies on though. The third landed behind her, weapons drawn to drive them into her shoulders. She let go, stepped back, into the swing so it was his forearms that struck her collarbones rather than his blades. She focused chakra into the back of her head and threw herself back. Her smile was vicious at the feel of warm blood at the back of her head and the satisfying crunch of bone and cartilage. She reached up, grabbing one wrist before pulling it forward and down, crashing the elbow against her shoulder with a solid impact that, while not breaking the tough joint, certainly hurt, making him drop the weapon with a scream. The other two genin charged at her, she reached into her pouch, drawing a handful of shuriken, cutting her hand in her haste. She held on tight though, and threw them at the genin, wind chakra infused into them. One of the boys ducked, forming hand seals before slamming his hands down on the ground, two earth walls sprouting up between them and the shuriken. The bladed stars struck the stone, nearly going straight through the packed earth. One genin, the one that had formed the technique was unaffected because he was crouching. The other, standing at his full height got a face full of dirt and dust as the shuriken speckled it in his face with their near exit. He coughed and sputtered, eyes tearing up as he tried to wipe them in order to see. Rog. The next thing he knew the crazy silver-haired girl was punching through the earth wall, fist coated with wind chakra that she used to just drill straight through it, before grabbing him by the face and using her momentum to slam his skull against the packed earth at their feet. She moved to turn but before she could there was an arm coiled around her neck in a brutally strong chokehold. She choked as she tried to suck down a startled gasp, coughing as her hands rose to elbow the genin behind her, only for him to move out of the way, grip the back of her head to avoid the headbutt she was about to do and squeeze. She grit her teeth, trying to throw him off as she lunged forward. She opened her eyes finding the one whose nose she'd broken approaching. His friend was regaining his bearings as well. She didn't want to cut off his arms and kill him with wind blades but if this asshole didn't get off her. Dynamic entry. And with a moment of deja vu, Naruto appeared from flat out nowhere, giggling as he latched onto Broken Nose's head and started beating him with the ring end of kunai. The one holding her slackened his grip for a moment in surprise, enough for her to move her head and bite. Hard. She didn't stop until she felt the coppery tang of blood in her mouth. When he finally let go she turned and hurt him. Badly. She turned to the last boy once she was done, who was already calling to forfeit and all but running towards the jounin as Naruto gleefully let go of his choking, half-drowning teammate with the bloody nose. She panted, rubbing her own neck and spitting to try and get rid of the taste in her mouth. Thanks. Naruto grinned. No problem I'm just about. Before he could finish his sentence the Naruto before her vanished, leaving behind only a mound of dirt in his shape that quickly fell to pieces. Atsuchi Bunshine. 
Her eyes widened, turning around in time to see the dust cloud beginning to dissipate. More than that though she saw her teammate a second before he hit the ground, evidently having been hit, or thrown. She could see four other Iwa Genin in the last vestiges of the dust cloud that weren't moving. There were only two that were. Problem was, Naruto wasn't moving either. She moved to step forward when a lancing pain shot up her whole leg, a scream prying itself from her throat as she fell, blood gushing out the back of her knee. She turned, looking behind her and finding the damn Genin with the busted nose getting back to his feet even as he tried to cough air back down his abused throat. His friend had surrendered, he hadn't. She limped, back, away from him towards her weapon even as she growled like a beast with the promise of retribution. Zero. Your boy there seems to have bitten off more than he could chew. Anaki pointed out. Unable to keep the glee from his tone. He chewed plenty. A was quick to point out. Helping his teammates and taking down four Genin isn't exactly something to scoff at. The girl was careless though and too impulsive. Not Chonin material as far as I'm concerned. Kid could take a punch last time I checked. Kisame was frowning. Was he hit by a mule or something? Koto sighed through his nostrils. The team had put up a good show. But their victory always had the odds stacked against them. He looked up to see if he could get a read on the Sanin, only to find the man as bored as when the fight started. He turned his eyes back towards the fights, watching as the two Iwa again and marched forward. One wobbling unsteadily on his feet, the other much more easier stride. The probable culprit. He could only repeat the mental mantra of get up get up as he watched the blonde lump on the floor remain unmoving. To his surprise however, before the Genin could finish crossing the distance, five shimmering mirrors of ice hovered between them and their target. The dome that had surrounded the careless Kumo team vanishing in wet cascades. Zero. Haku's image appeared in the mirrors, as they surrounded the two, glaring at them. The hell is this? One of them the bigger one that didn't look nearly so exhausted hissed out. Kiri's making nice with the leaf now? Haku brandished her senbone eyes cold as her mirrors. The panels angled themselves. You want to surrender now? The smaller Genin swallowed nervously looking around at the five Hakus that glared down at him and daring a peek at the Kumo team that were struggling to walk in a straight line right now. I'm, he gasped. Gonna need a second, he said nervously to the bigger boy. The big one just glared at the ice mirrors. Nah, I don't think we'll be doing that. Way I see it you're almost out of chakra Kiri. This thing can't be cheap and you were holding more of these things over the heads of the Kumo idiots over there so you're almost out of juice. Haku frowned. Was her exhaustion that obvious? She gripped her senbone. In that CA. The thin boy stood ramrod straight and let out a piercing shriek. She had to clutch at her ears even within the protection of the mirrors as her senses were assaulted, her concentration coming apart at the seams. The mirrors began to melt and the big Genin rushed straight towards one with a heaving hammer fist. The mirror cracked but held. But just the fact that it could crack under the weight of a bare fist showed just how weak she was right now. She looked up, ears and nose leaking blood as she forced herself to focus. A mirror shifted and she jumped. On the way her foot smashed into the screeching Genin's face. She was sure that the burning pain she felt lancing up her ankle wasn't normal. The impact threw her off course, her mirror coming apart she was forced to hit the ground. When she rolled to a stop, finding her limb twisted at the sheer speed she'd been flying at when it came in contact with the boy's face and the searing pain that now made itself known, she came to the simple conclusion that it had been sprained, rather badly at that. Zero. What the hell was that? Zabuza growled stalking forward to the edge of the platform. One second Haku had been preparing her attack, the next the whole thing had fallen to pieces with her flying out of one mirror to hit the ground. Don't get your titties in a bunch. Kisume drawled. She's fine. For the first time Orochimaru shifted his expression. Chuckling softly, he drew the eyes of Koto, A and Mei. Ah the Yodosori clan. And here I thought they were wiped out along with your would-be Abarame Anaki-san. Keeping an ace in the hole eh? What the hell are they and what did the kid do? Zabuza hissed. They bend sound. Orochimaru answered simply. He'd encountered one member of this clan in the early days of the war. The ability had made him tinker with the idea of something that could do the same. A seal construct housed in a gauntlet perhaps. We heard nothing. Your girl, and more likely than not, Naruto as well received a full, agonizing assault on their senses. The boy's use is, crude, from what I can tell but effective in terms of raw power. Anaki sulked. After the death of, 
virtually the entire clan in the series of battles known as the Bloody Marshes near Ame where they'd fought Hanzo the Salamander, the fact that they still had a handful of surviving members was a fairly decently kept secret. One that they'd been planning to keep from their greatest enemy as long as possible. Now that was out of the question with Orochimaru so easily identifying the bloodline. No doubt Hiruzen would file this information under the important to remember category rather than the oh that's nice file. Zero. Haku groaned struggling to limp to her feet, favoring one leg heavily she watched as the Iwa Genin moved to check on his friend. A moment later, there was a hand on her arm, steadying her. She didn't turn her eyes away from the Genin. Thank you Kimimaro-san. Not quite so pale. Kyofu muttered startling her. Can you walk? Reserves? Not really, and lo. It shamed her to admit it at the older girl. A second later she was admonishing herself for revealing her limits to the potential enemy. The girl nodded. Get behind me. I'm still okay. If that hit of yours managed to sprain your ankle that bad you most likely gave the Ewan in a concussion. She surmised. Haku nodded, grateful even as she limped back from the fight. The Genin saw them, growled, turning to look at the still-prone Naruto before he rushed at the Genin. Kyofu cursed, and moved to give chase. The young man was barely two steps away from the blonde when she shouted. Touch him and your friend is dead. The boy froze, looking over his shoulder to see Kyofu glaring, holding a kunai over the throat of the Genin Haku had disabled. You ain't got the guts leaf. Kyofu's eyes narrowed, obsidian orbs glinting like flint knives. Try me. The Genin hesitated, conflicted for a moment before the decision was taken out of his hands. Two bone spears sprouted out from the ground behind him, running him through at the hips with a gory spray of blood. He howled bloody murder, and would have fallen if not for the same instruments that were causing such agony to be the ones holding him aloft. Blood drenched the ground at his feet as he cried and whimpered tears of pure pain. You're done, Kimimaro said softly, marching up behind him, Ryoko's arm over his shoulder. The boy hissed glaring over his shoulder. You, cheated. The soft-spoken boy shrugged. You made your alliances. So did we. Don't feel bad because we're just better than you. Ryoko taunted. Oh my head. Naruto groaned rubbing his skull as he sat himself straight up. Oh, Sakura-chan you're losing your touch. Both of his teammates raised eyebrows. Sakura-chan? Ahem. They turned to look at the proctor of the exams. While choosing to ally yourself falls within the parameters of conduct and tactics that are allowed within the Chonin examinations, I'm afraid there can only be one winning team to this part of the exam. He reminded pointedly. Kimimaro disentangled himself from Ryoko, letting the girl fall back onto her rump before letting go of her hand and marching across the grounds towards the limping Haku, Kyofu marching past him to check on her own teammates. Zero. A huffed out a breath. An alliance. He turned his eyes towards Oro and Kisame. You two were the ones here. You orchestrate this? Partly, Kisame laughed as several med nin used the lull in the fight to start collecting the injured. They're the ones that took to the idea so much though. Bitter that your teams didn't think the same? Perhaps if you or Iwa had cooperated before the exam things could have been different. Seems to me that your team was the one that got the most out of it though. Anaki snarled. With the Yuki girl saving that Uzumaki and Kimimaro saving the girl. Kiri's two eliminated my Genin from the competition only to do nothing more than secure their own weakness and the strength of their adversaries. This is why no alliance is worth it. You sound bitter Anaki, Orochi chuckled. Perhaps we'll ally with you and hand you your victory next time to make up for it. The Sandaime's features darkened. They'd soon see how smug the serpent could be with this, victory. Zero. How capable are you for battle? Kimimaro asked. Not very Haku winced with guilt. My chakra is low. Another minute at best with my dome. And I can't walk or jump very well right now. My speed will be affected inside the mirrors as well. Kimimaro hummed in thought. He was running on nearly full reserves. His bone armor didn't require chakra once it settled, his bones only needed chakra to be moved and grown. Still with Haku like this it would be one against three two of those with a wind element. More than that, he hadn't seen Naruto's skills, which must have been considerable seeing how he managed to defeat four Genin. If he was still relatively unharmed, that was bad. Kyofu was also reserved in her fight and was most likely in the best condition out of the three. The only one of the three he would have been able to disable quickly was Ryoko, and even then, 
she still had a wind element. He'd never pitted his bones against the impossibly sharp blades and one kunai from her might be enough to injure him. He took a breath, faced the proctor and bowed at the waist. We surrender. What? Naruto shot straight to his feet with that. Kimimaro-san. Haku protested. A ninja risks his life every day. He intoned, standing straight again. But that risk is a measured one, based on information, preparation and planning. Not on blind luck and the hope that sheer force can overwhelm the position. He looked to Haku. Victory is too uncertain as such, the words of our knee dime must hold true. Pull back to push back. This, this feels, I kinda feel like crap. Ryoko muttered. You guys helped us, and lost because of it. Kimimaro nodded, if he regretted offering aid they couldn't really tell behind his placid face. Haku offered a sad little smile. It's okay. Doesn't feel okay. Naruto muttered looking over towards the proctor. Can we surrender instead? Zero. It was a chonin that shunshined onto the platform informing them of the Kirigenin's surrender. Before anyone could get another word in edgewise, Anaki stood up from his chair marching over towards the front of the platform with quick, determined strides that set off alarm bells in the Sanin's head. Rai out and been cleared his throat. Congratulations to you three that have won this part of the examinations. Now we move towards the final part. The serpent's hackles rose. Do your scales tip too far Rai Outenbin? He wondered. Zero. Kurotsuchi blinked as her father started walking out onto the field. Dad? Don't worry Kuro-chan. He smiled over his shoulder. I'll be back real soon. A.K.A., make sure she stays put. Yes sir. Her big friend nodded. She felt a nervous sliver of unease settle in her stomach. Zero. In the battles of a shinobi. Not all factors can be taken into account, not all threats can be known beforehand. You must adapt accordingly to surprises and unexpected conditions. These conditions will rarely be favorable and rarely will your enemy fight you on even terms, Anaki continued, watching as his son, a man on the level of Konoha's white wolf, Hatake Kakashi, made his way onto the field as the medics cleared it out and the proctors pulled back the Kiri Genin, leaving his three targets on the field. You will find enemies in this world that are stronger than you. And at these times retreat will not be an option. As such you must defeat him, or endure him for three minutes. These are the conditions you must adapt to. I object to this. Orochimaru stepped forward, a scowl on his features. Anaki turned to look at the snake coldly over his shoulder. This is a part of Iwagakura's Chonin selection exam Sanin. The serpent hissed, his tongue flicking out between his teeth. I can taste your lies, Rai Outenbin. And your bloodlust. Bloodlust snake? He drawled. Projecting are we? My Jounin can control himself just fine. But accidents do happen don't they? He snarled. That's true for anyone. It happened to your Yondaime after all. That was about as close to an open declaration as he would ever get and everyone knew it. Anaki panned his eyes behind him. His fellow cage were watching closely, neutral expressions on their features. Koto sat in his chair, brow scrunched as though he had a headache, mouth set in a grim line with his eyes closed. He looked back to Orochimaru. A cruel smile threatening to pull the side of his lips up. He'd go through a thousand accusations of breaching the treaty, take on every sanction and cursed word ten times over before he let another Namikaze walk this world. The Sanin straightened. I propose a change to the terms, he said. This isn't a forum for you. Should my team he spoke over the shorter man. Be defeated or lose without suffering crippling, permanent injury or death against your Jounin. He paused, staring into Anaki's eyes and the Sandaime Tsuchikage could see a glimmer of something behind that gaze. Then you, may kill me. With a crowd of over a thousand people below them the hush that fell over the box was astounding. Anaki's face twisted into a baleful smile, the sheer glee at Orochimaru's folly shining through every pore of his features. And if they win? Orochimaru's eyes flashed. Ever the predator. Then I kill your son. The smile faltered, but reasserted itself after a moment. Three Genin defeating or surviving for three whole minutes one of his most elite Jounin? It was a pipe dream. He could kill the Sanin now, and kill the Namikaze spawn before he could set one foot in Konoha's border ever again. Deal. Chapter 16 The note was a simple thing really. Five words, scratched onto a slip of paper in his father's sharply angled handwriting. Don't kill or cripple them. 
His curiosity was raised. The sole purpose of his being here was in case the Konoha team won. His job was to kill the six-year-old child of Minato Namikaze. He was under the surname Uzumaki but that was a paper-thin shield. Anyone that had ever laid eyes on the double S rank monstrosity that had been Konoha's yellow flash would see the family resemblance here. If his father was now recanting his orders for killing them something big must have gone down in the box. He'd have to ask later what it was. Crinkling the page up in his fist he tossed it to the side as he looked up towards his father then he looked at the proctor and nodded. Accordingly the Chonin spoke up. We apologize for the delay, the final portion of this Chonin exam will now commence. Konoha team take your places please. The team shuffled back into the field, the silver-haired girl limping badly on a leg that had been hastily bandaged by the med nin. He pulled out a single kunai blade, eyes fixed on his three targets as he waited for the proctor to signal the start. Zero. Heard of your son. Zabuza drawled. One of your best or so I've heard. He is. Anaki answered. Isn't that a little overkill then? May ventured, eyeing him through a sideways, narrowed gaze. Surely any jounin would do. Possibly but I'd rather not embarrass my village by placing a jounin that had a chance to flat out lose if the winning genin team was truly exceptional. It was a practiced excuse, but a valid one. With clients watching the very last thing any village would ever need was having one of their elites get thrashed by a mere genin of any other village. The three-minute mark was the victory any team should pull off if they managed to do so. Koto adjusted his weight on the seat, shoulders tense. Orochimaru stood placidly beside him. The daimyo could say the Sanin had the single greatest poker face he'd ever seen. One would never guess his life was now dangling by the threat of the skills and possibility of three genin surviving an elite jounin for three minutes. Zero. Begin. The words were barely out of the Chonin's mouth before Kyuchi was behind Ryoko, his open hand thrusting forward to drive the tips of his fingers into the wound at the back of her knee. The girl howled. It was a sound of bloody murder that deafened her teammates as she fell onto one knee, the wounded one giving out. Kyuchi moved to kick her in the side of the head when Naruto did a leap frog jump over her, latching onto the Jounin's limb and throwing him completely off balance. The man stumbled and was stabbed with a kunai in the leg, only for the limb, and body to be replaced by a log. Above, Kyofu shouted as a shadow grew over their heads. Naruto looked but was blinded by the noon sun's glare, barely even seeing the outline of his enemy before he turned his eyes from the harsh sting. Scatter, he yelled, and they each rushed to get away, or tried to in Ryoko's case, the girl barely got one-third of her normal distance she would have with her wounded knee. She had barely landed before a shuriken found its way into her shoulder. This time she held back her scream, tears of pain leaking from her eyes as she roared, turned and with the mightiest teeth she could muster, threw her weapon. Four spinning wind blades exploding from the four tips to cut anything that got in their way. He swerved to the side, avoiding the blade with laughable ease four of the ninja at the edge of the field behind him formed several earth walls with the wind blade slicing its way through more than half of them before coming to a stop. The jounin rushed her. Kushios no jutsu. There was a cloud of smoke off to the side and a blindingly fast tail whipped out of the smoke, buffeting her with the brush of air of the strike and looking to hit Kyuchi with a blow that could cut the man in half. The jounin barely broke his stride, jumping up and over the tail in a smooth roll, getting to his feet just half a foot in front of her. She drew one of her knives when his foot lashed out, blindingly fast and struck the side of her wounded knee again. The pain made both legs fail, blinding in its agony, her vision swam as she nearly threw up, the already throbbing injury became the center of her awareness and the kunai blade that ran her hand straight through to nail it to the ground seemed like background noise by comparison. There was the heat and glare of fire over her head and in front of her face and the next thing she knew a shadow was blocking out the glaringly bright sun. She groaned in pain, half sitting half laying on the floor, her hand, shoulder and leg pooling her blood over the dirt. Ryoko-chan? She looked up, finding Naruto's worried face looking down at her. She swallowed, moistening an all-to-dry throat. I'm not, feeling so good, she whispered as her vision darkened and her eyes rolled into the back of her skull. Zero. Thirty-two seconds. Koto's face was grim his beard framing a mouth set in the faintest hint of a scowl. Nice knowing Yasanin. Kisame snickered. Think the old man came out ahead on this one. Anaki's smile was a baleful, gloating thing as he watched the field below sparing a glance at Konoha's S-class shinobi. If there was one thing he'd credit the pale ninja with it was a good mask for his emotions. If he didn't know any better he might have believed the man was genuinely bored. 
Zero. Naruto glared at Kyuchi, face losing the last vestiges of levity and humor. He'd fought alongside the man in the war. But if he wanted to play hardball and hurt his friends then they'd play hardball. It was a version of the game Naruto had become very adept at. Beside him, a horned lizard as tall as a horse and twice as long, hissed and lumbered forward, armored scales and razor-sharp claws glinting. Its neck bulged out like a croaking frog before it roared, a pressurized stream of boiling oil exploding from under its tongue as Kyofu breathed out a katanjutsu in front of it, the oil taking up the flame in an instant, turning a chunk of the battlefield into a roaring inferno with a blindingly bright flash. The Jounin leapt back, out of range. Then Naruto added a few Uten, Daibakua to the mix. The furnace turned into hell itself, the blast of fire expanding to gargantuan proportions and Spec King flaming droplets of oil out like a rain. Kyuchi's surprise was evident on his face before he hastily formed an earth dome to protect himself, the crowd screamed as other Jounin nearest the blast had to use their own defensive techniques to guard the crowd. Naruto formed eight mud clones at his side, spreading out his senses with nature chakra to feel out Kyuchi's energy now that he'd lost sight of the man. Kyofu. Below. The lizard darted to the side as the Jounin exploded from the earth, a fire technique flash roasting its hind leg rather than its whole body. It screeched and spat out a mouthful of acid that the Jounin rolled to avoid. Move, Naruto shouted again, his earth clones rushing forward. Unfortunately, Naruto's directions lacked specifics and when the beast moved this time it was right into the waiting arms of a spider summon that darted out of the ground twice the size of Kyofu's, four of its limbs snapped around its writhing prey, fangs punching through a thick armored hide to inject virulent poisons. Kyofu jumped away cursing. Then Kyuchi was grabbing her by the throat. No you don't, Naruto yelled tossing a kunai at the mid-air Jounin. Kyuchi caught it, turned it in his hand to stab his teammate then it transformed in his grip into another smirking blonde. The clone took in the man's surprised face, winked then slapped two explosive tags onto the arm holding him by the collar. He laughed. Boom. The explosion was small by explosive tag standards. But no matter how small, when the explosion was separated from your flesh by a fraction of an inch of cloth, it hurt. The Jounin cursed, releasing the girl as he fell, rolling backwards when he hit the ground, furiously beating at his arm to kill the flame snaking up the remains of his shirt even as he clenched the limb close to his chest. Nasty burns and a weeping, ugly wound with black burnt flesh and soot-covered skin around its edges covered his inner forearm and bicep. It hurt like hell. That last part might have been rather obvious due to the Jounin's muttered cursing. Son of A, motherfuck. He looked up finding the blonde clones pressing their attack, the original, or what he assumed was the original rushing towards the girl that had landed rather hard on her side. The first clone tried to lunge and Kyuchi stomped one foot on the ground a spike of dirt spearing up and goring the bunshine that crumbled into more earth. The second and third one came at him as one, one leaping the other coming in low. Kyuchi ducked, sliding in a half spin on the ground to kick at the one that approached his legs with a brutally solid blow that sent the thing reeling. He reached into his pouch with his uninjured hand when, from the ground a clone formed. It didn't emerge from the dirt it literally formed right under his nose and delivered a powerful uppercut. He bit his tongue with that, cursing in pain and surprise. That kind of skill with a bunshine shouldn't be possible for a six-year-old. Especially one that wasn't even paying attention to the fight. He rolled, forming a one-handed seal out of necessity, cursing the extra chakra it was eating up as he formed three of his own clones that charged at the blondes. The punishment Earth clones could take should buy him some time. Zero. Oh oh ho. Oh. A, surprisingly was the one smiling. Your son got careless. That kunai henge was clever for a genin. May praised. I wouldn't have fallen for shit like that. Zabuza scoffed. Anaki's smile had vanished, his face now as grim and set as Koto's and Orochimaru's. Little over one minute and thirty seconds left on that clock. Zero. Kyofu groaned miserably as she got to her feet, her ribs would be sporting a nasty bruise soon enough. Falling flat from 15 or 20 feet wouldn't go over well with anyone, shinobi training or no. Oh are we done yet? Nope, Naruto yelled cheerfully. But don't worry, I got him on the ropes. She turned her eyes, narrowing them. Few Uten technique. She barked, sucking down a lungful of air as she got to her feet before Naruto did the same, both releasing the blast of fire that, while not quite as big as the one that had been fueled with oil, was nonetheless huge even by Jounin standards, the two elements mixing to form a single powerful blast. Then a rock shot out of the ground, 
It was the size of a fist with the force of a bullet and would have taken off the blonde's head had he been a foot taller. It pays to be short. He never thought he'd think those words. Run, Kyofu shouted needlessly as both of them were already darting this way and that way to try and either get out of range or dodge the attacks now exploding from the ground. Kyofu felt the vertigo hit her a second later. A nausea rising in her gut. She barely had the time to deduce she was under a genjutsu before something smashed into the side of her head with a crunch and a spatter of blood across the dirt as she bled from her head and temple, the world swimming in her eyes as she fell. Then everything went dark when she was encased beneath the walls of an earth dome. Naruto would have fared little better if the innate nature chakra he had running through his systems hadn't given him a heads up on Kyuchi's attempt before it took root and helped him dispel the illusion before it could fully affect him. He turned and sprinted in the man's direction. Once Kyuchi adapted to the feel of his chakra his illusions were going to be much harder to fight off. The wind was knocked out of him when something hit him in the stomach with the force of a ram. He fell onto his back, coughing and gasping for air before something pressed down onto his neck. He blinked, and the pain of the blow and the difficulty in breathing dispelled the secondary illusion hiding behind the obvious red herring that was the first. The blonde grit his teeth. Stupid. He'd fought next to Sasuke for years and he forgot to check for secondary and tertiary genjutsu? Fucking stupid. The only real consolation he had was that this wasn't a life or death situation. Kyuchi stood over him, burnt arm cradled against his stomach and chest. The other hand in his pocket, his boot pressing down on the Genin's chest and neck, staring down at him with a placid, calm expression. Naruto chuckled, or tried to. It was difficult to imagine the calm shinobi was the famously short-tempered Kurotsuchi's fa. You're done Uzumaki. And like that the blonde was somewhere else. Zero. Koto breathed. Two minutes and twenty seconds. Forty seconds had just decided the life of one of Konoha's greatest shinobi. His mind whirled, gears turning in his head as he tried to think of some angle, some means to get the sanin out of this and could only come up with one. Kurotsuchi. I've done you a kindness. One day I will expect one in return. Those had been his words weeks ago. It was now time to cash in the favor and demand that he honor it, even if the life of a ten-year-old girl didn't necessarily measure up to that of Konoha's most dangerous assassination expert. The daimyo sighed. He'd hoped to be able to gain something from this debt between them, but a last breaking even would simply have to do. Then something caught their eye. Zero. You were done Uzumaki. The words rang through his skull echoing in the hollow chamber of buried memories, pulling free the demons of recollection. Dust choked the air in a foggy, brown haze, the sun beating down on his face as he blinked the blood out of his eyes. They were all so hopeful you know. He stares up at Kyuchi's face focusing on the eye hidden behind the spiral painted mask, a palpable fury rising in his chest that twists his features into something bestial. So sure that you'd come back like you did before with Nagato. That their hero would come rescue them. Especially that Hyuga girl. Oh how she screamed. I'll kill you. The words are a hiss, a promise that burns the back of his throat with acid as he stares into those cursed eyes. You'll try. But you'll fail now just like you failed them. The Rasengan forms in his hand before he can think swirling and glowing with a palpable light. He sees Toby recoil, pull away in alarm as he lunges. Zero. Not even the Sanin's ability to hide emotion can fully mask his surprise, taking a step forward as Anaki jumps to his feet, cursing and howling. I knew it. He screams. I goddamn knew it. The Iwa Jounin moves, dodging, forcing the attack to hit the ground in an explosion of shattered stone and upturned dust that swallows them both. Before they see Kyuchi flying out of one side, landing in a crouch. A moment later the dust cloud is dispersed, and none of the people in the stand can keep themselves from rising to their feet. Orochimaru's mouth falls open. Never in all his life, even when Minato was alive had he ever even heard of a wind Rasengan. Zero. Zero. What, is this? Were the words drifting through Haku's mind. The wind battered them both, looking to drag them into the swirling vortex held above the Genin's head. It was his expression though, that caught her attention the most. Until ten seconds ago, she could never imagine little Naruto's face twisted into something of such, hatred. Kimimaro grunted, one hand held up to his eyes. This, shouldn't be possible for a Genin. With barely another moment's hesitation the bone wielder picked her up. We're leaving, he said, 
carrying her away and through the crowds, some of which could recognize that this was quite possibly a greater danger than the thin line of Jounin at the edge of the ring could handle should it get out of control. She couldn't really protest at the manhandling like she did with Kisame-sensei. Zero. You tried this before, are you running out of tricks? Shut up. His voice is strained, the memory that has overtaken his mind doesn't register what he is now. A child. One without the chakra or physical development to endure a technique that could cut a man down at the cellular level. He throws it, screaming as the bones and muscles in his arm snap and tear, the skin parting into bleeding smiles. The Rasenshurik and tears across the open field straight towards this apparition of his hated nightmares and passes straight through him. He doesn't see nearly every Jounin converge in front of the path of destruction to form their earth walls, doesn't see Kyuchi leap away, or when Orochimaru leaps down to pull Ryoko out of its path. He doesn't even see the explosion that knocks the civilians down with the shockwave and nearly topples the towers with the concussive force. All he sees is that mask. That goddamn mask. You can't beat me Uzumaki. And Naruto promised the opposite even as he cradled a broken, bleeding arm, the haze of memory clearing. I'll kill you. I'll fucking kill you. Zero. That's time. Kisame's laugh brings Anaki out of his shock. Blinking, heart pounding against his chest as the words sink in. What? He rounds on him. The shark man is smiling, he points. Time. And the clock is still running, red numbers changing, literally, with every passing second. 309. 310. 311. Congratulations A is the one that remarks. You just signed away your son's life. The words are like a slap to the face. No. He denies. No. He lost. We all saw it. It was. The match was never called. A drawls. Next time tell your proctor to be faster when your son has again and under his boot. He feels a pit forming in his stomach and the bile rises to the back of his throat his face is pale and he suddenly feels violently ill as his heart pounds against his chest. I granted you a kindness once before Anaki. Koto's voice is serious, and when he looks to the man the expression on his face is like that of an adult disappointed in a petulant child. The man stands, red and black robes ruffling. When I did so then I asked for nothing. Now I'll grant you another. But this one holds a price. He swallows thickly. Might we, discuss this in private? No. Koto says flatly. We'll discuss it now. Here before witnesses. Or I retract the offer now and your son is summarily executed by your own Anbu. The daimyo's voice was like steel and though any one man standing here could kill him with barely a passing thought, the thunderous nature of his expression could make anyone believe he was Hashirama or Madara come again. A nods. May gives no outward sign. That Tsuchikage's face was severe, glaring at the floor as this whole thing backfired spectacularly in his face. Name your offer. Though the words are whispered, all hear it. Koto sighs through his nostrils. Zero. On the field, Orochimaru holds the bleeding Ryoko close, red warm blood staining his clothes as the pale ninja hears the screams and confused calls all around him, the upturned dust blanketing the whole field in a reddish fog. He marches closer to where he last saw his student finding the blonde child kneeling on the field, hissing in pain as he cradles a shattered limb. He glances behind him where even now Jounin are struggling to keep the crowd calm, to take stock of wounded. He looks down towards the crater left behind and the wounded elite Jounin who is now struggling to regain his bearings and the jagged, trench that was just carved into the earth by the mere brush of the attack passing overhead ending in a crater that would have made Tsunade proud. He looks back at his bleeding, near unconscious student. What the hell are you? Zero. The waters gleam with the midday sun, the red rock of the mountain that frames the western side of the village gives it an orange hue even as the light sparkles across its calm surface like diamonds. It was such a tranquil sight really, the bustling sounds of the village behind her doing little to breach the placid atmosphere. Her thoughts were another matter entirely though. Itachi had never been one for angst or depression. She seemed the somber person but she was in fact content with both herself and her lot in life on most days. She did not overanalyze or philosophize her work, did not seek some moral justification or dwell on known friends and acquaintances lost in the years of her employ as a Jown and an Anbu. Grief had its place, as did guilt but ultimately things were simple in their world. Everyone died. Be it friends, or enemies people were going to die in these little, everyday wars the ninja villages held against one another. 
It was unavoidable and simply a necessary by-product of the way their society was formed. But this was something that did weigh on her. Had been weighing on her since she learned of it. Rebellion. One where she was to be the tip of the spear. Was she strong enough to outright defeat Hiruzen? Perhaps. Already she was strong enough to defeat Hatake Senpai in half their bouts. Outside of him, there were very few others, if any that could lay a claim on being a challenge. But Sarutobi. The man had been known as the god of shinobi and with good reason. Even on her best day it perhaps was the best any could hope for. Not only that, but Sarutobi was a good man. A good man that was also Toborama's student, and Toborama's hatred of the Uchiha ran deep. Deep enough to infect Sarutobi, Homura, and Koharu. The three didn't trust the Uchiha, relegating them to base roles within the village. Platitudes that displayed favor to the world but were really just another means of control. Of stunting the clan. They gave them a corded off piece of land to build their homes, away from the village proper, nearly isolated, walled off to keep them corralled whereas the Hyuga were nearly in the heart of Konoha proper. They assigned them the role of the police force of Konoha. But how much strength and battle experience does a ninja acquire from dealing with drunken louts and investigating petty crimes? The rare murder conducted by a ninja above the rank of Chonin was handled by T and I or Anbu, or the elite hunter ninja if the culprit fled the village. And even if they weren't, those cases were too few and far between. How much could a ninja clan that never did field work truly grow? How many allies could they gain with the resentment held in the minds of some of the commoners with their privileged status? A resentment that grew when, day after day the Uchiha were the ones that did the dirty work of enforcing the iron rule of the village laws. She was the exception, not the norm. She was one of only seven Uchiha that did field work. 7. Everyone else was stuck in the clan district in perpetual routine. Corralled and meek. Ready for slaughter should it be needed. Namikaze was the one to first break the routine, engaging Fugaku, a man that had been in the same graduating class, in genuine talks of expanding the Uchiha's role within and without the village. Then Minato died. But those seeds of promise were already sown within her father's mind. He wasn't happy just quietly returning to the status quo that had been under Sarutobi. And after being rebuffed by Sarutobi once the older man was back in office left a galling, bad taste in his mouth. That bad taste had malformed into resentment, and from resentment a quiet hatred. And now, here they were. With him plotting to overthrow the Sandaime. What then? Take control of the village? Subdue other ninja and clans that would no doubt rise up against the unwarranted attack from the Uchiha? They were a clan of two hundred. A third of which had never even held a knife, the other part of them that had were men and women that were part of the police force, they were not capable of besting Jounin or Anbu. But in her father's mind, Sarutobi, Homura, Koharu and Danzo were the four, stubborn walls that stood between the Uchiha clan and something better than these worthless platitudes and measures of passive-aggressive control. And he was probably right on that regard. But to think that, after an act of overt hostility the negotiating table could be taken up. Sarutobi was too well-loved, and with good reason for the most part. The sheer mob of people that would be seeking their blood would be enough to overwhelm him no matter how many allies he had or had not secured to help in this coup. He had two. Itachi Ne. She blinked, placing a gentle smile over her features before she turned, finding little Sasuke running towards her, beaming. Sasu-chan. She let out a small laugh at his scowl. He doesn't like the name. Naruto hadn't liked Naru-chan either. How was your first day? She asks turning to face him fully just before he hugs her waist. It was good he says quickly before looking up at her. But you promised to help me practice shuriken throwing today. She nods smiling. I did didn't I? Zero. It is later, after the children are taken by the med nin, after they're treated and cared for that the sanin finally finds an adequate moment to demand his answers. The hand that clamped down on Naruto's broken wrist and twisted jostled him firmly out of the fugue of the unconscious world. He would have screamed if not for the other hand that fell over his mouth. Now, I'm going to ask you some questions. The Sanin drawled, gold eyes glinting. You're going to answer fully. Do we understand each other? The blue eyes narrowed, the ghost of the expression that had forever graced Naruto's features around him since he was four morphing into its manifestation of open hostility. The same technique that had brought so much surprise today began to take shape in his free hand. A dead technique Minato had not passed down. That no one knew how to wield, 
blooming to life in a boy's hand. Orochimaru removed the hand that had been silencing the blonde, now gripping his uninjured wrist with a burst of chakra released into his flesh, disrupting the delicate control, fraying the Rasengan from its perfect sphere into a grinding, flayed array of spinning chakra slivers that soon dispersed. Naruto hissed, teeth clenched and fangs bared. There are only two people that have ever known that technique. Both were dead before you could form a coherent thought. He tightened his grip, feeling the bones grinding together beneath his grip. Who taught you? He laughed, a hissing, pain thing through clenched teeth. White hair, dressed like a kabuki. Peeped on. He tightened the grip and felt something else snap. The boy groaned. More and more it was becoming obvious that this simply wasn't normal. No child no matter how well trained could have a pain tolerance this high. Jiraiya is dead, he hissed. Naruto giggled. I know. Ha ha ha. I know everyone who's dead now. The giggle persisted, morphing into a hysterical mockery as the boy in his grip twitched eyes turning glassy with pain even as he laughed. Rochimaru bared his fangs. Who taught you the Rasengan? I even know you. He answered instead. Hiya hey. I know you. The Genin squinted. Oh but I think you got away. His smile vanished, turning serious, you got away. The laughter returned. That's just, so pathetic. He let go, pulling back before tossing a sleeping illusion over him, watching as the boy's eyes drifted shut and the laughter finally died down with him succumbing to slumber leaving a thoroughly confused Sanin behind. Zero. It's later on at night when he's contemplating whether or not he should indulge in a strong drink like some common imbecile that he finds himself wondering just what it is he can do now that he's drawn a conclusion as to what is wrong with the boy. He's insane. Or at least he should be insane. Fact of the matter is no one just pulls off a dead technique or an even more perfected, powerful variant of it on lunacy alone. The boy's behavior indicates some kind of, delusion, dementia, schizophrenia or dissociation or, something. But, he knew those techniques. He pulled them off easily. He ran his tests on the boy, what few he could, re-examined the seal trying to find something that could explain this. But nothing, just like before, could be found. There was nothing out of the ordinary. Except of course the six-year-old that had just displayed a technique that could level a city. Him knowing more than he should was why he'd nominated him for early academy enrollment in the first place. But those things had been skewed, wrong teachings that his body simply couldn't handle and he'd shown little more until now, to indicate that there had been more that he'd been taught. Especially note more that could be used so effectively. Clearly, these false memories that had been implanted into him were something far more significant than some infiltrator's attempt to cover up his escape after extracting the QB from him. They were also turning the boy insane, if not adding jutsu to his repertoire. The very least he had to do was speak to Sarutobi about this. This situation was very much unprecedented and one of the most tight-lipped secret Konoha had at the moment was that they had no secret weapon. The more people involved in Naruto's life or mental health were more people that could let slip the secret. Well, at least now they wouldn't have to worry about Iwa for the foreseeable future. Still, in regards to his sometimes hostile student, he was truly at a loss. Not just because, of the strangeness of the situation, but most especially because he didn't really comprehend the root of the cause. One doesn't exactly take a course on how a lifetime of false memories can skew the psyche of a developing child. The doors open admitting Koto into the residence's common area Orochimaru looked and nodded over his shoulder. The man took in a loud, deep breath through his nostrils. I was very impressed today, he said marching over to one of the more comfortable seats, the one the Sanin himself had been eyeing before the daimyo decided to plant himself on it. The serpent breathed. They did very well for their skill level. He marched back sitting down on a different seat as well before his fingers came up to massage his right temple, trying to rub away the headache that had been pounding away for hours now. They did well. The ruler of Hai no Kuni agreed before leaning forward smiling. But, truthfully there was someone else that impressed me more. Orochimaru raised an eyebrow, his curiosity peaked. Oh? Koto nodded. There was someone there you see. Someone who looked out on that field with little more than bored disdain. Even when his life hung by a team of children to fight for three more minutes against an elite. The man smirked. Could you imagine my surprise at that? Someone that could stare near certain death in the face in such a calm way? Someone that could hide so much, well, that's someone to be impressed with don't you think? Who knows how dangerous that man could be? Orochimaru snorted. 
Anaki's satisfaction would have come more from seeing anxiety or fear, as much as my actual death. I wouldn't give him that. Yes I see. He nodded. Still, most impressive. Why, he laughed I wouldn't put it past such a man to orchestrate using his own daimyo as a shield to secure an approval to a nomination. This time, the Sanin's eyes turned to him, serpentine gold meeting amused dark brown. He took a breath after a moment it seems I underestimated you Megajiro Dono. And I'll be sure to never make such a mistake with you. It already cost Anaki more than he's comfortable with. He leaned back in his seat. I heard. He admitted. May I ask why you don't seem eager to have me killed now that you've found out? Now? The man scoffed. You insult me again. I knew before I ever left the capital. Then why come? Iwa's dealings are far too unknown to us. They have been for some time. I wish to see it for myself. You couldn't have taken a look at their defenses or anything of import. They have this home watched at all times as they watch all who enter and leave. No I couldn't. He admitted. But you've limited your thinking to mere battlefields as most soldiers do. I did not come here to see the strength of Iwa's sword arm. I came to see the strength of their handshakes. The other cage. He was quick to deduce. Koto nodded. Now we can see that Kumo is as hostile to them as they are to us, how Kiri is reaching out by venturing across the sea and hundreds of miles of land to attend a single Genin team. No doubt it was to open negotiations for trade as they've done with Konoha. They need money some of those rumors of civil unrest must be true. This is all information we can use, knowing how few allies Iwagakur has to call on is a major boon. I used you. But it was you who used me. The serpent couldn't help but chuckle at the fair play. Move your enemy, do not be moved by him. The man quoted. They fell into silence before Orochimaru breached it. How will you proceed now with your information and your, unusual demand of the Tsuchikage? All in good time, he laughed. You're privy to more than most. Be patient. The pale ninja said nothing for a moment before. He may very well try to kill you for this. Koto chuckled. He will try. Zero. Jeez princess what did you do to your arm? Toss it in a meat crusher? Ryoko asked, looking at the cast that covered Naruto's arm from wrist to shoulder, flicking her finger against its surface. The doctors had put it on this morning after they deduced the boy had thrashed enough in his sleep to hurt himself all over again. I heard about the attack you did, Kyofu said, sitting at his side, a bandage wrapped around her head, her hair cascading down to her back in a dark curtain, pulled down from its usual high tail. The cut went from her temple all the way down under her ear, even with the healing chakra that had stitched the wound back together the white outline of a developing scar was still clearly visible. Did Sensei teach you? Nah, Naruto laughed, scratching at the back of his head. His recollection of the events after Kyuchi stepping on him but he did remember a Rasen shuriken and at least a few bits and pieces of the Sanin's late night visit. It's just something I've been working on myself. Doesn't look like I mastered it though. He shifted his arm for emphasis. It just has too much of a backlash I guess. You still bought us the time we needed to win with that from what I hear though. I'm not sure when I went down. How much time was left? I think it was around 30 or 40 seconds. I'm not really sure we got lucky. Kits er, that Jounin is one of Iwa's best from what I hear. You can say that again. How long before they said you can use that arm though? About two weeks. He shrugged. I'll go see Tsunade Ba Chan when we get back, she'll fix me right up. He smiled. Sensei. Kyofu greeted the man that appeared in a corner of the room out of seemingly nowhere. The pale serpent nodded, his face serious. Hey Sensei when are they going to declare us Chonin here? Ryoko asked, the glare between Sensei and teammate going over her head. We won't be evaluating your performance here. Rochimaru answered. Megajiro Dono and I feel it would be best if we leave as quickly as possible given the circumstances of our rather limited welcome here. So we're leaving tomorrow? No. In two days. A request from Megajiro to the Tsuchikage demands the slightly extended stay. I've reserved Konoha's right to evaluate your performance privately with the letters of recommendations from the cage and the Jounin that were present here along with the traditional performance evaluating board. Based on that and my testimony, Sarutobi will decide if you are worthy of being Chonin. Oh okay. Still, three days? What did Megajiro-sama ask for? You'll see soon enough. Take the time to relax. He drawled. I suppose you've earned the respite with your performance on the exam. 
It was as close to a good job as they were gonna get. Zero. Smoke drifted across the man's face, thin little tendrils caressing his eyes and forehead before drifting upwards as he stared out into the nightly splendor of his village. A woman knelt behind him, clad in her onbu equipment, her captain standing beside her, the fierce, snarling visage of the wolf mask looming over her. I see. He drawled. They will not act, not for now. Not until the daimyo's business with us is sure to be concluded. Oddly, it was far more irritating to Sarutobi the fact that his students' contemptuous actions had just saved him and Konoha from the need to use immediate, drastic force, rather than hearing about the Uchiha's plans in the first place. He'd never let him live this down. Orders, sir? Kakashi's voice brought him out of his thoughts. He took in a breath, breathing out the smoke from his nostrils. Leave. I'll need a few hours to think on this then we'll reconvene. Both Anbu nodded with Itachi soon standing to leave and following her captain out. The older man sucked down a deep breath, inhaling the smoke. When it's not one thing it's another. Zero. At the third day, when they were getting ready to leave Iwa, with all of the horses and men that were to make the two-day ride to Konoha, the Genin team was able to, by and large, stand on their own power thanks to the powers of healing chakra that the medics had administered under Orochimaru's watchful eyes. The trail of a white, Discolored scar went down Kyofu's temple and, while Ryoko's scars were well hidden under her clothes they were still there. Naruto's arm, while not in a cast, was still very much injured, braced inside of a layer of tightly wound bandages to keep the bone still. How far is it to Kiri? He asked, standing at the village gates. Ah, is little princess thinking of going to visit his Haku-chan? Ryoko took the moment to tease again. Naruto glared. It's not like that. I'm just curious is all. He genuinely was damn it. Haku giggled. About five or six days travel depending on the winds and how calm the sea is. Don't encourage him, he might try to go visit. Naruto nudged her, rather hard with his elbow. He could normally take teasing and be a very good sport. But those looks he could feel burning a hole into the back of his head from a certain silent killing master were starting to get unnerving. Haku tossed a look to all the daimyo's men mounting up and saddling the horses behind them. How long for you all to reach Konoha by horse? Two or three days, Kyofu said, twirling a kunai a bit farther away as she watched the comings and goings. Haku nodded. I've never ridden a horse before. Don't. All three kids said as one, startling her. Evidently her idle curiosity was some kind of deep transgression. Ryoko cast a look around. Where's Shark Face and Kimimaro-san? Kimimaro said he wanted to read something on some of Iwagakura's known clans. She shrugged. Kisame-sensei's probably giving Mei-sama a headache somewhere. Ryoko trailed her eyes upwards. You know, the sexual innuendo joke there is just too easy. I'll let it slide. Kyofu and Naruto snickered as Haku blushed. Th they wouldn't, that's not she was stuttering as bad as Naruto remembered Hinata doing sometimes. The clopping of horse cloves on cobblestones brought their attention back around, where Koto sat on the black horse, looking down on them with a gentle smile. Saying goodbye to friends is important but we've got to get ready to leave. Mount up soon. The Genin nodded with whispered words of assent before the daimyo moved his horse a bit further towards the gate to give them some semblance of privacy. Guess this is goodbye for now huh? Ryoko scratched the back of her head. Haku smiled sadly. It is. It was nice meeting you all. Likewise, Kyofu said, bowing respectfully. I hope we can remain friends for a long time. Me too I guess. Of course we can. Naruto put in for his two teammates, smiling brightly. Why can't we? Haku smiled gently at him, nodding. No doubt believing it to be the simple naivete of youth. Naruto knew different though. If they could meet on a bridge, nearly kill each other, and he could still consider Haku a friend them parting ways on such good terms as now meant they'd stay friends. It's time to leave. The Genin found Orochimaru riding up to them. Unlike Koto, the snake had little qualms about getting right in their faces with the horse and interrupting their little goodbye. Mount up, he demanded. The two girls moved to obey, Naruto was about to do the same when. Naruto-kun. He turned and was surprised to feel the press of lips against his cheek. He rubbed the spot of wetness blinking up at the taller girl. What was that for? For being so sweet, she laughed before pushing him towards the horse, ignoring Ryoko's exaggerated cat calls. Bye. Naruto waved. 
When he got on his horse he shivered though. Why did he suddenly feel as though his life expectancy was to be cut significantly shorter? Zero. Hey man I brought you some bean free Akisame paused. Zabuza was pouring blood over his weapon. Let's get you nice and sharp he chuckled gleaming, filed teeth bared in a psychotic grin as he eyed the weapon, unholy flames emerging from his murderous gaze. Looks like you're busy. Kisume edged away. I'll come back later. Zero. When they lingered by the gate, not immediately leaving Kyofu leaned towards their teacher. Sensei, what are we, uh, waiting for? Patience. The Sanin replied by way of answer. You'll see soon enough. Soon enough, was ten minutes later and though all were surprised, no one could be more surprised than Naruto himself who watched as none other than Kurotsuchi, two Hinokuni samurai at her flanks, rode up beside them. Judging by the extra sacks and bags along the flanks of all three horses, the girl was carrying quite a few supplies. Her face was a mask of barely contained disdain, as her horse trotted up to Koto's side, Orochimaru and the Genin at her back. What's going on? He hissed, leaning forward. Orochimaru spared him a glance over his shoulder. There was something of a deal made. Kurotsuchi will be fostered by Mega Jiro Dono for the foreseeable future. What? Naruto hissed, eyes widening. Anaki loved his granddaughter more than anything. The man wouldn't trade her away even if they offered him half the continent on a silver platter. What the hell had happened? Before he could think on this anymore though he heard Koto's voice trailing back towards them as he addressed Iwa's princess. If ever you feel you need to rest my girl don't hesitate to ask. I'll be fine. She barely kept the snarl out of her voice. And by barely it's at a level just below seething. You'll need to rest before me. If Koto was at all put off by her scathing tone he didn't show it, smiling gently before he gave the order to march. Soon enough, they were leaving Iwagakura behind them and Naruto was wondering just how much this had just changed, things. Chapter 17 For a whole day, Naruto had been wondering just how to strike up a conversation with Kurotsuchi. He never had known the girl well. They fought together, even once they'd argued over tactics a day before one of the battles but he'd never sat down and had a conversation with the girl. There'd never been any time for that. But generally, his impression of the girl, both then and now were thus. Pissed off, proud, standoffish, like sticking pointy things into people she finds annoying. And right now, being the only Iwa native in a group consisting entirely from Hinokuni, Iwa's most hated enemy, she was probably even more pissed off and standoffish. So, all in all, he had no idea how to actually breach a conversation with her. So he did what he normally did when uncertain how to approach a problem. Bull rushing it head on. Hi, I'm Naruto. What's your name? None of your business. She snarled after turning to him, growling as she waited for the men to finish setting up the camp. That's a weird name. He persisted, hoping the tried and true tactic of persistence would serve him well enough here. Only Sakura had been immune in his experience. Kurotsuchi's lip curled and he has the distinct impression that if she had a knife on her, she would have made him infinitely more familiar with it. She all but jabs her hand into his chest, pushing him back with every harsh blow as she hisses out her words. Look Leaf. You're not my friend. I don't want you to be my friend. Get the hell away from me and stay away. She turns and stalks off, leaving Naruto to rub his chest in phantom pain, looking sadly at the girl's back. People need a friend when they're so far from home. He muttered to himself, knowing it to be true. He'd try again tomorrow. Any more today and it might just piss her off even more. Zero. The message came to them in the dead of night, the wings of the owl were almost silent, the whoosh of air brushed against Roshi's face as he raised his arm, the beast landing there, allowing him to unfurl the message attached to its talons. The beast flew away letting the old man's eyes pass over the scratched words on the parchment. Han said nothing. Our orders have changed it seems. He drawled. The armored man grunted. Zero. How will you proceed? Koharu asked, staring at his back. If the Uchiha want a battle then the best thing to do is let them spring their little coup. Homura interjected. Now that we know they're coming, we can prepare adequately and cut down the co-conspirators publicly. Such bloodshed would be too costly. Sarutobi hummed where he stood at the window too many injured. Too many dead. The rumors of our vulnerability will escalate beyond the point of our control. Few villages can quietly bear the loss of so many no matter what we might feel for the Uchiha. That and their position as the police force does aid in Konoha's internal stability to a degree. 
Donzo drawled, bandaged and solemn. So again, what are you going to do Haruzen? Koharu demanded. The old monkey breathed in the smoke of his pipe. We still have a handful of days before Megajiro Dono is set to arrive and even more time before he leaves. They will not move until after he's gone I will give Okami time to investigate their dealings and how far deep the treachery goes. From there we'll see just how deep we must bury the knife in our own flesh to cut out the cancer of treachery. The other three were quiet for a moment before. What of Itachi? Donzo drawled. What of her? She is the tip of the Uchiha's intended spear. Kill her and that spear is splintered. Hiruzen breathed out the smoke in his lungs. I will not repay loyalty, with treachery. She brought us the information that lets us sit here and plan now. At the very least she should be hidden away. Removed so the Uchiha can't use her and don't attack nearly so early. Koharu suggested. Both those suggestions might tip our hands. Homura put forward. We could always give concessions. The words made all three advisors pause turning to look at Sarutobi's back as though a head was growing out from between his shoulder blades. Concessions? Donzo spat. Under the threat of rebellion, you want to give concessions? What's next? The man spat. You'll give your title if they just ask nicely? Hiruzen turned, dumping out the tobacco leaves into an ash tray with three quick taps of his pipe. Fugaku wishes for more of his clansmen to be out in the field. Why not? We are short-handed as it is. He wishes for some lands to expand the district and the possibility of opening up certain parts of their district to the public. Why not? He shrugged. Seems these are all minor concessions that save me plenty of headache. Homura's eyes narrowed. Have you forgotten what Tobarama sensei always warned us of? How Madara Uchiha tried to kill both him and Hashirama-sama several times, how the Uchiha had to be kept in line in order to ensure the stability of the village. If you allow them to gain too much influence they'll seek to control the village in a perversion of Hashirama's ideal. Isn't the fact that they're willing to try and kill you, and plunge the village into unrest at such a time when we're still so vulnerable, evidence that sensei was correct? Koharu backed. But is it the inevitability brought on by their own nature or merely that of a self-fulfilling prophecy? The old monkey drawled, moving to sit down across from his old comrades. Perhaps it is time to enact some changes in policy. Even if you are correct in that, if you were to come to Fugaku with this now Donzo drawled. He'll smell blood in the water. It will make him bolder. He'll try to take a mile when you give an inch. Sarutobi remained quiet. Donzo raised an eyebrow. You have a plan? The makings of one. He answered before waving them off. Go on. It's late. I'm getting old, so I'm going to bed. He stood and without another word, turned and left the room. His advisors wondering if the old monkey was finally succumbing to his weariness. Zero. In the morning, with the camp already packed and the column already on their horses and moving did Naruto try his hand again. Manu veering his horse to Kurotsuchi's side the faux six-year-old decided to venture into a subject a bit easier to deal with. So what did you learn in Iwa's academy? The girl snarled, using the slack of the reins in her hands to slap his horse across the face, nearly throwing him off as his beast reeled, startled. Get away. Naruto frowns, then grins. They probably didn't teach much from what we saw of your genin. They taught us better than anything your leaf academy teaches. The blonde grinned. Progress. Yeah right. He taunts. The girl pulls back on the reins and the sneer she throws over her shoulder at him. You probably hit like a girl. He sticks his tongue out at her. If looks could kill. Naruto. Orochimaru drawls. Enough. The blonde starts to laugh, despite himself then he stops, eyes going wide. Two chakra signatures, powerful ones, were heading straight for them. He looks to his right and can tell Orochimaru feels the same thing. Before the blonde could say or do anything Orochimaru forms a seal and galloped his horse forward, catching a slumping Kurotsuchi before she slid right off her horse under the genjutsu. Megajiro Dono, he shouted, catching the daimyo's attention. Hey what's going on? Kyofu asked as Orochimaru picked the girl up, off her horse, placed her in Koto's arms as the man untied his red and black cape, handing it off to a samurai who tied it around his own neck and pulled a hay-filled bundle of cloth from the back of his horse. Go! The older man demanded and, as one, the whole column of men turned and began to charge off in a different direction. Orochimaru turned to them, one hand pulling out slips of paper. Come here all of you. 
The command in his voice made them all obey nearly without question, the Sanin placed a slip of paper on Ryoko's head first. Instantly Naruto felt the effects, Ryoko's chakra signature very nearly vanished behind the veil of the seal's effect. Before anything more could be said he placed the small slip of paper over Kyofu and his own heads. Stay with Megajiro Dono. Guard him with your lives. Without another word, the Sanin flew up into the trees, a single leap carrying him to the highest branches. Come on! Koto barked, before bringing his horse to a full gallop, nearly charging off without them before the kids had enough presence of mind to kick at their own horses. What's going on? Kyofu asked again, ducking under a branch. There is too little trust between us for Anaki to let this happen. The daimyo answered. He believes I wish his granddaughter to come with us to use as a hostage. And you don't? Naruto asked. Koto shook his head. She is useful. But never as a hostage. He answered. I didn't come to Iwa to kill children. So what he's just sending these guys after us to take back Rock Girl there? Ryoko cursed as the horse bounced her around. She hated riding. Or to kill us if we were to resist. That's an act of war? Not if he can pin it on Kumo. The man laughed. Where'd Sensei go? Kyofu asked. To stall their pursuit of course. Alone? Koto's smile turned sad. I. He thought. I risked my life for his gamble. It's only fair he return the favor. Zero. Look out. Roshi's words were wasted, Han's hands crossed over his face, the thick, absurdly heavy splint mail armor deflecting the hail of shuriken with clinks that barely scratched at the cloth beneath it. I'm almost insulted. The snake drawled, his voice echoing around them, bouncing off the trees as the man laughed. Merely two? I did not think Anaki's opinion of me was so low. Go, Roshi demanded, holding his place at the side of a tree. He's not the target here. I'll deal with this, get the girl. Oh I don't think so. A serpent, three times as big or as wide as any of these trees exploded from the ground beneath their feet, its maw gaping wide in order to swallow them both. Roshi formed a seal, ready to spit out a stream of molten rock only for the sound of someone breathing to come up behind him. He turned, raising his hand in a hasty block and cursed when a kunai blade was shoved straight through his palm, the spurt of blood spattering across his eyes and face. A foot smashed into his chest, expelling the air from his lungs and knocking him out of the tree down towards the snake's open mouth. With a brutal, unreal drop kick that rattled the bones in their chests, the armored form of Han literally batted the serpent aside with strength that could rival Tsunade. Hirochi raised an eyebrow. He'd have to stay away from that one's blows. Rochi landed on his feet, turning with his hands already finishing their seals before he breathed fire on the dazed reptile sending it back to the summon realm with a screech. Go, he demanded. Han rushed forward, traps and ninja wire springing from the ground to hold him still before he barreled through them with sheer brute force, snapping branches and crunching through trees. Ten bunshines emerged from the shadows of the forest and gave the Jinchuriki barely a moment's pause before steam ruptured from the heavy armored pack behind him, the scalding heat destroyed the six closest ones outright, burning their flesh enough to dispel them. The remaining four reeled, pulling back before Roshi was on them. Fireballs exploding across the forest to blanket the whole place in flames, burning a path that the red armored behemoth barreled straight through. Kukukuku. It is you then. The Sanin laughed, vanishing into the shadows again Roshi, you've gotten so old now. The fiery headed man grunted. No older than your master. I'll kill you this time. You came close before, but things. The Jinchuriki turned catching a kunai before tossing it away the explosive tag going off just far enough to not hurt him. Then he felt pain lance up his extended arm. Jumping away with a curse the Jinchuriki grit his teeth against the searing pain now coating his forearm, dispelling the illusion with a fluctuation of chakra, finding the Sanin standing beside the spot he'd just been occupying on the branch, a gleaming sword in his hand, the edge dripping blood. We'll be different this time I think, he laughed. Roshi sneered, a searing heat emerging from his skin before the branch he was standing on caught a flame, a thin coating of fire and molten rock rising up from his feet to cover his body. The Sanin's grin grew delighted. Oh? Already? I remember that technique well enough. Once upon a time you all but killed me with it. The old Jinchuriki frowned. How much of this confidence was a bluff? My Yutan no Yoroi has never been breached, not by you, not by anyone. I'll be sure to kill you today without your precious Tsunade here to rescue you. 
That smile turned psychotic. Kukukuku. Let's find out shall we? The fire rose up past his neck and swallowed up his face, the whole tree now burning as he charged the pale Konoha ninja. Zero. Han didn't so much as move through the forest as much as he simply plowed through it. The man's leaps were powerful, snapping branches under his feet, swallowing a distance of 20 or 30 feet in single, powerful leaps that sent the limbs of trees, twigs and needle-like pine leaves raining down to the forest floor. He wasn't trying to be stealthy, he was trying to hurry. They were only a few miles from Konoha's border. They couldn't afford to do this too close to the village, if any of the other villages got wind of this the sanctions would be egregious. They couldn't risk anyone finding out until it was done. Then it'd just be a case of Konoha's word against Iwa's and the whole situation could be muddled to the point of obscurity. For that reason alone did they wait that long. The window for getting back their primary target, and eliminating their secondary target, the so-called Namikaze brat, was absurdly small, a stretch of about 10 miles of forest. That sounded all well and good until one realized it was just two men that had to cover 10 miles abroad and more than 30 or 40 miles lengthwise. By the time they'd managed to sense the Genins and Orochimaru's suppressed chakra signature they were already nearly through the area of interception. These Konoha Nin only had 7 miles to go before they reached Konoha's borderline. Pursuing them any further meant risking exposure to the Cho Nin, or worse, Anbu, patrols. The Jinchuriki's eyes gleamed as he caught sight of red armor ahead of him through the trees. It wasn't long before Shuriken flew out of the shadows of the forest, arcing through the air to punch through armor with sheer brute force that belied their small size, the victim screamed as he was thrown off his horse. To arms. In the trees, up there in the trees. Seventeen of the eighteen riders left notched their arrows into bowstrings drawing back as one as they turned in their saddles, searching for a target. More thrown weapons flew from the gloom, killing another of the galloping group before two of the men turned, finding their pursuer before firing, watching as the red-clad shinobi dodged with a sharp movement, more arrows exploding his way as the rest of the troop caught sight of him. Landed on a tree, cursing as an arrow screeched against the armor that covered the lower half of his face. Lucky shot. Steam vented from the engine at his back, a thickened fog trailing behind him as he sped ahead of the group, the thick, heavy blanket of heated water becoming unnaturally thick behind him swallowing the group hole as they continued their dead head charge towards the border. The Iwa Nin came to a stop, drawing free a scroll, four kunai were in his hands, tossing two to each side, linked together by a thick chain, he listened as they were buried hilt deep into trees. The thunder of hoofbeats reached his ears long before he saw them. With a brutal tug that yanked all four chains taut, the Iwa Nin braced himself as the first line of massive beasts slammed headfirst into them snapping limbs and necks as the horses flipped end over end with a sudden and unexpected resistance, crushing one rider under hundreds of pounds of animal and breaking another man's leg and another's arm. The Jinchuriki snarled as he found his target, the one with the cape. Then he noticed the hay that was in the place of hands or feet of a ten-year-old girl. His eyes widened. A decoy? Seven men, quick enough to get their bearings drew back their bows and fired, three others charged in with swords drawn. The shinobi fell into the earth and six more of him exploded from the ground around the group. Red armored fists with force that could have rivaled Tsunade, crushed skulls and snapped necks with brutal, impossibly fast force. A dozen yards away, the real Han emerged from the ground. He couldn't waste time with humans. Zero. No technique is without weakness. This was a law of the shinobi world, there were no exceptions. As often as men had claimed to have discovered the perfect spear, the strongest shield, there was a way to deflect the spear, to break the shield. Orochimaru as a man that knew this. He was also a man that was not accustomed to defeat so when it did happen, as it had happened nearly a decade ago against this very shinobi, he had a tendency to remember. And more importantly think. Lava armor. What weakness could such a thing have? The chakra consumption would obviously be the first. Ah but its wielder was a Jinchuriki absurd levels of chakra came with the territory. That was not a weakness of this particular technique no. But there were always rules that had to be adhered to. One simply had to recognize them to exploit them. He wound, darted and fled through the trees, dodging and weaving, keeping himself one step ahead of the Jounin Jinchuriki even as the sheer heat rolling off of the man scalded his skin and threatened to burn him. The Kusanagi blade, the ultimate weapon of the serpent summons kept Roshi at bay when he got too close. The lava couldn't burn it, nor could it stop the deadly weapon. It's too bad getting close enough for a deadly blow would be tantamount to lighting himself on fire. Still, 
Roshi kept closing the distance, time and time again, looking to exhaust the Sanin through the sheer heat. He would succeed if it kept up for more than a handful of minutes. Finally a respite. The Jinchuriki landed on the ground, staring up at the Konoha ninja as the armor peeled back to reveal his face and shoulders. Is this all you got? This is seriously it? You're worse than what you were ten years ago. At least then you had some balls to go with your shitty fighting. The Sanin bowed at the waist where he stood on the tree. Forgive me. I seem to have gotten lax in my training. Roshi growled, taking a deep breath before lava swallowed him from head to toe again. Orochimaru started counting. Yutan, Shekigaryugan no Jutsu the man shouted before perfect spheres of molten rock were hurtling towards him, smashing through trees with bone-rattling force and exploding when they finally came to a halt, sending the whole forest up in smoke. Zero. Hya. Koto barked at the beast, snapping the reins as he demanded more from the creature. The animal was a powerful creature, bred for war and travel. It could carry a man for tens of miles at a time without rest. But even it was breathing hard under the brutal pace. The three children behind him had given up their mounts and were traveling by their much more effective legs, pulling ahead in pairs to scout before stopping to let him catch up. Are you all right Megajiro sama Koto grunted, keeping himself steady in the saddle. We'll be all right we're close now. Almost. Kyofu answered. We're just two miles or so from the border lines. Naruto suddenly returned, eyes wide and leaves sticking out of his hair. Guys we have a big problem, he cried. What is it? The man asked, snapping his heels against his horse, promising to give it extra water should it not collapse on him. Something's coming this way one of those big somethings Oro went to stop. Is Sensei dead? As if to answer the mocha-skinned girl the sound of an explosion rocked through the forest to the north. Don't think so. Naruto answered. He is busy though. Damn it we just have to get to the border. Naruto blinked. Hey wait a minute. He stopped, literally stopped dead on a tree Kyofu and Koto shooting past him in their run as the boy rummaged through his jacket. The two stopped themselves, with Koto pulling back so hard on the horse's reins the animal reared up on its hind legs. What the hell are you doing? Kyofu barked, hanging from the side of a tree. Come on boy. We have no time. Naruto ignored them, sifting through his pockets and pouches at a frantic speed. The daimyo rounded his horse back around, ready to carry both children on the already exhausted animal when. Aha! Naruto beamed, holding out a pencil-thin scroll and running up to them. Found it? Found what? Koto asked. And Chan gave it to me. She said that if I was ever in danger and within ten miles of the border I could use it. He began to unfurl the scroll. Why didn't you mention this before? Kyofu snarled. Guys what the hell is going on? Ryoko had finally backtracked enough to reach them. I didn't remember. Naruto answered frankly cutting his thumb and channeling chakra into the seal array painted onto its surface. It was a month and a half ago. What the hell do you mean you didn't remember? Kyofu screeched, all but baring her teeth. This is pretty goddamn important when heading to Iwa. What are you all yelling about? A pulse of chakra bubbled out from the seal array. For a moment, nothing happened. Then, the faintest echoes on the edge of his expanded awareness, started coming closer. He grinned. We got back up coming now. His grin fell however when that presence that had been approaching them suddenly sped up, evidently that distress seal wasn't limited to Konoha sensors. Run. Koto turned his horse, he Kyofu and Ryoko took to the trees above. Like a dog snarling at their heels Naruto could feel that Jounin gaining at a frightening pace. Zero. Orochimaru cursed, between the flames and the lava-coated Jinchuriki the heat was going to become overwhelming soon. It was getting difficult to even breathe. Nonetheless Sanin kept counting running as far as he could from the suffocating flames. His foot landed on a branch that promptly gave way beneath his weight. Shifting his feet latched onto the bark of the tree in reflex but before he could gain his bearing a lava-covered foot smashed into his chest. There were very few forms of pain he'd experienced in his life that could compare to the sheer agony of something at a temperature of 2,400 degrees burning through his chest. With fingers emerging from the inside of his mouth and pulling his own jaw apart a new version of the Sanin emerged, flipping in mid-air to rid himself of the sack of skin before he landed with a crouch on the forest floor. He cursed. That had eaten up more chakra than he was comfortable with. At Roshi's battle cry he glanced up, looking up at the fire-coated Iwa Jounin. 
Then he threw the Kusanagi blade straight up. The Iwa Nin latched onto a tree for all of half a second it took to burst into flames at his touch, just enough to dodge the spinning blade. Falling once more he launched another series of fireballs at the snake ninja. He caught a glimpse of that smirk, and the thought that the Kusanagi wasn't exactly a miscalculation on the snake's part was just in time to feel the concussive force of the explosion of his own attack and another at his back. With molten rock covering him from head to toe, it was obvious he couldn't burn, but concussive shockwaves from the blast could be damaging in and of themselves, and trapped between both blasts Roshi felt the air pushed out of his lungs with brutal force, the lava armor vanishing in his laps a second later before he fell to the forest floor with a solid crash. Zero. Ryoko's thoughts could be summed up thus. He's fucking huge. The red-armored ninja chasing after them, held at bay only by a sheer horde of clones Naruto kept spawning had to be the most absurdly large man she'd ever seen. He had to be an easy eight feet tall. And the way he was plowing through Naruto's clones was a beastly, frightening sight. Especially since, between the dodging, the fighting the weaving between attacks and clones he was still gaining. How much longer before our backup gets here, she shouted, latching onto another tree as Koto galloped past her. She sure hoped his horse could keep up the brutal pace. Any minute now, I think. That's not reassuring princess. Naruto grunted, quite frankly, if Han got any closer he was considering walking out of this forest with two broken arms from a wind Rasengan. He fought the Jinchuriki before and even if one discounted the advantages of the Edo Tensei of healing and endless chakra. The man was a born powerhouse in Tai Jutsu and had fought pound for pound and gone blow for blow against Li and Guy on several occasions. No way could he let him get anywhere near his team, or the daimyo. Kushios. There were two puffs of smoke ahead of them, and Naruto rushed past just in time to see leaping lizards, each the size of a large dog, with a tail three times as long rush out of the grey obscurity, fin like wings extending from their forelegs to their hind legs to let them glide through the trees as they hissed and joined the Futsuchi bunshines that were still trying to stall the Iwa juggernaut. Han grunted, raising his arm in time for a tail that had been looking to slice his face and eyes open to coil itself around his forearm. He pivoted, twisting in mid-air to land with his feet on a tree, using the new stability to yank. Wood splintered and cracked beneath the beast's claws, sheer brute force tugging it free, up and over Han's head to crack its skull against the tree trunk on the downswing. The creature went limp, vanishing in a puff of smoke. Han fell off the tree as a hail of wind-powered kunai rushed straight past him. He would have already caught up if not for this boy's damnable wind chakra. It was the only thing outside of lightning that could outright pierce straight through the heavy splint mail. His chakra capacity was worthy of a jounin. If he really was a namikaze and was this dangerous already was no wonder Anaki wanted him dead so badly. The Jinchuriki let out even more steam from the backpack, dispelling the bunshine as he'd done several times already, then he jumped forward, after the Genin and Samurai, the last of the creatures latched itself onto his back, throwing his momentum off. He felt fangs digging into the back of his skull, rows of razor teeth clutching at the back of his shaved head and sending barbs of pain blossoming across his skull to converge right at the bridge of his nose. It thrashed, trying to break his neck. It would have been strong enough had it been facing anyone else. Steam vented from his backpack, boiling hot, it all but flash cooked the creature, making it vanish in another burst of smoke leaving red, weeping tears to stain the white head cloth. He looked up, and saw just then, the silhouette of Leaf Nin reinforcements approaching through the trees. No more need for discretion then. With five hand seals and enough steam billowing from his back as to keep the last of the bunshine away from him. Koto's horse stopped dead, a tremor shaking the ground beneath the cursing daimyo's feet. Five enormous geysers of steam suddenly erupted between his targets and their backup. Just a few seconds to catch up. Konoha would be able to conclusively pin the blame at Iwa's feet rather than Kumo, Ame or Kuza with the sight of his unique steam jutsu, but the anger would be worse if he or Roshi let Koto take hold of such a valuable hostage. That's right, anger. That's all that ever waited for them no matter the result. The Jinchuriki's lip curled beneath his mask, then, wasting no more time, he charged. The two girls attacked first, with one throwing her custom weapon with as enough wind chakra to turn it into a small typhoon, a perfect disc slicing clean through trees and branches before it was lit aflame, the perfect disc becoming a wild swirling inferno that spat out tongues of fire everywhere. Han's fist smashed into the ground, a column of superheated water blasting out of the earth to hit the approaching weapon with force that could have punched a hole through a house, knocking it off course enough to miss him entirely. He rushed headlong, 
speeding past the girl straight towards the daimyo who was even now trying to bring his panicking horse back around to face him. He closes the distance in an instant, hands reaching to crush the daimyo's skull between powerful armored fingers. Rasengan. Han skids to a stop, and it's what saves him, the boy's attack barely reaches, grinding against his stomach armor, metal screeches and leather tears, Sharpnel digs into his guts and the Jinchuriki leaps back in reflex, kicking out and striking the boy in the bandaged, right arm he used to block. He heard the snap of bone and heard the kid scream even as he himself was breathing harshly at the near overwhelming surge of adrenaline. Uzumaki. Koto shouts in concern, finally bringing his horse around and placing himself between Han and the wounded child. Han barely pays attention to the man, eyes wide and staring at the boy who was still visible between the horse's forelegs. What the hell was that? There was no doubt anymore. The boy had to die. He breathes, trying to calm his own heart rate only for seven seconds before fourteen silhouettes jump up, over the wall of steam and landing between the Jinchuriki and Megajiro Koto. The Jinchuriki curses too many. Even for him this is too many. Hawk pattern. One of the leaf nin shout ready to attack. Han doesn't give him the chance. Steam billows from the armored backpack, swallowing him whole before he vanished in the obscuring cloud. As he leaves the Jinchuriki stares at the boy through the steam clouds. Committing face and name to memory, he had no doubt it'd be one he'd be seeing again in the years to come. Zero. The Sanin smiles as the Jinchuriki hits the ground. He waits no longer and forms his hand seals. Roshi dazed and sputtering for breath feels surprise lance through him as eight clones appear around him. He's about to form his lava armor again as the eight formed identical hand seals. He is quickly confused however. Kaden, Gokaku no Jutsu. Nine balls of fire exploded from the clones' mouths in a steady, controlled stream, covering Roshi from head to toe. Was the Sanin an idiot? He couldn't burn. But as the attack lingers on and persisted well beyond the point of normalcy he became alarmed. Mind catching up to the strategy. He charged the nearest serpent, only for his target to back away, the others coming closer to keep as close to an exact distance as possible, the flame still focused on the Iwa Jinchuriki. Roshi rushed forward, trying to attack again only for the snake to keep evading him, breathing out the steady stream of flames. The game of cat and mouse persisted, even after Roshi's fire lava armor fell away. Rochimaru didn't end his technique until Roshi collapsed on his knees, struggling to crawl away from the searing flames that could not burn him. Suddenly, the fires were gone after four minutes of constant flames, they vanished. Then the serpent struck. Roshi's eyes flew open, blood exploding from his lips as he gasped, the sword driving him down to lay flat on the ground, pinning him there. He began to call on the demonic chakra a red shroud rising up to envelop him when. Gagio Fuwen. The Sanin's fingers dug into his back, a greater pain than the sword blossoming across his entire being, the chakra sealed off. It left him weakened, eyes darkening at the edge of unconsciousness, staved off only by the rush of adrenaline through his veins. Every technique. The Sanin snarled. Has a weakness. In this case the weakness was you. Roshi grit bloodied teeth trying to reach behind him to strike the man only to groan as the blade was twisted. You don't burn. The Sanin laughed. But even you need to breathe. You. Roshi coughed, the blood now coated his beard. You, bastard. Three minutes, forty-seven seconds, he laughed again, twisting the blade a little more. You always drop your armor to take a breath. Cover it up with taunting or speaking. Makes sense. Even lava, like fire needs to consume oxygen to keep burning. When I figured that out, deciding to use more fire was easy. Goodbye Roshi. The sword was yanked out, and swung. And just like that the Yinbi Jinchuriki was dead his head rolling across the forest floor. The Sanin smirked, one that quickly fell when he sensed more chakra signatures approaching him from the south. It couldn't be. Had Anaki's Anbu managed to overtake them? This, wasn't good. Orochimaru-sama. He looked up and found seven Konoha Chaunin descending from the trees above, surrounding the red-armored Iwa Nin. How are you here? He questioned before a Jounin appeared at his side. Your student. The man said, pulling free what Orochimaru could now recognize as a beacon scroll. Someone gave Naruto-san a distress call beacon scroll. Myself and two other teams came to investigate immediately. The other teams are moving with Megajiro-sama back to Konoha at full speed. The other Iwa Nin has fled. The Sanin snatched the paper out of his hand. Smirking. 
Sir. One of the Chonin called, looking at his superior. We've got a body here, should we proceed with retrieval to take back to Konoha? You'd better. Rochimaru answered his smile turning predatory. That there is Iwagakura's valuable Yinbi Jinchuriki. The man's eyes widened looking at the dead man at his feet and back at Orochimaru with something approaching awe. Honestly sir. The Jounin shook his head. If it wasn't for you having asked how we got here, I'd think this was your idea the entire time. The Sanin threw back his head and laughed, long and loud. Chapter 18 About a day later, with reports and briefs sitting across his desk from three Genin and one Jounin, it was whole minutes, before Sarutobi said or did anything. Don't move, he said pointing at them. Wait right there. He turned, stood, marched out of his office to the balcony, walked out of sight, then returned after a minute or so, walked back outside again, returned, walked around his desk to stand in front of the four of them. Now. He drawled, closing his eyes in a way that indicated there was a brewing headache behind his temples. Let me see if I'm understanding this right. You went to Iwa. The children nodded. Forged an alliance with Kiri Nin to win the competition? They nodded again. Then he pointed to Orochimaru. Then you say Anaki all but sicked a jounin on them? The Sani nodded even as the Genin tossed some curious looks around. Hadn't that been part of the exam? Then, you. He pointed to Naruto defeated that jounin. Stalled. Orochimaru corrected. There was a time limit and he managed to outlast I. And as a result. He interrupted. Because of some, Bet you made with the Tsuchikage, and some, other kind of debt he had with Megajiro Dono we somehow managed to get his granddaughter in our custody? Megajiro Dono's custody but something like that, yes. And then, he wanted to go back on that so he sent two of his ninja to go after you? Orochimaru nodded. And you ended up killing their Jinchuriki? Another nod. The Jinchuriki of the Inbi? Another nod. That's, been transported here? Another nod. And is currently. In the process of being resealed into an object until we can find a host. Orochimaru nodded. I gave the order in your stead. Hope you don't mind. The old man ignored his snark. And the reason the team with the skills and resources to preserve and transport the body arrived there in time is, because. His finger trailed over to Naruto. And Chan the blonde provided. And Chan gave you a distress beacon scroll? And you remembered to activate it? He nodded, then grinned. Pretty cool for just a Chonin exam huh? The Sandaime blinked, hand lowering to his side before joining the other behind his back. With a sharp about face he turned, marched back around his desk, and walked back outside. The children were guessing he needed some air. So, we make Chonin for this right? Ryoko ventured. Rochimaru cleared his throat. Go. All of you. You're dismissed. I need to discuss some things with the Hokage for now. Zero. He knocked on the door. It was, truth be told, a novel experience. The daimyo didn't knock. People announced his presence or his summons and others either answered or were ready to greet him on arrival. What? He took that as permission to open the door. Kurotsuchi was sitting on the floor, shuriken and kunai sticking out of the wall in several places, little holes and scratch marks on the wood showing off the means by which she'd been entertaining herself since she woke. May I come in? He asked smiling gently. You're the daimyo, she said. You do what you want. You're the princess. It is only proper that you be treated with more respect. He bowed a little at that. May I come in? She scowled, but nodded. He stepped inside and without waiting for any further word, sat himself down beside her. He picked up one of the kunai. It's rude to touch other people's things, she said crossly. He smiled. All too true. He handed it back. She took it, beginning to put it away into her ninja pouch along with the others. Are you feeling well? I'm fine. Why don't I remember getting here? She glared. His smile turned coy and playful. The village hidden in the leaves wouldn't be very well hidden if we simply let everyone look at how to arrive. She scowled. What does it matter you're planning to kill me anyway? I am? He gasped. All you leaf ninja want to do is kill us. I didn't kill you before. He pointed out. The scowl fell for a moment before it returned. Because you're, you. I don't want to kill you Kurotsuchi-san. 
He offered holding his hands up. In truth, I asked Anaki Sama for you to come here so we might become good friends. Grandpa says leafs always lie. I'm not a leaf. He answered. I am the daimyo of Hai no Kuni, and I never lie. He paused, extending his hand, palm upwards. You're to be with me until you're sixteen. I would like to be your friend in that time. He paused, then added. If you would honor me. She looked at his hand, and he could see the uncertainty. The first, tangling roots of dogmatic hatred warring with the simple mind of a ten-year-old child. The scowl returned. We can't be friends. She huffed, crossing her arms. We can be. A.C., Akun. Acquaintances? He offered. She nodded blushing in embarrassment at having not recalled the word. Yeah. Then I'll be glad to be your acquaintance. He smiled sincerely. Zero. Pending evaluation what the hell does that even mean? Pending evaluation. Ryoko fumed, using exaggerated air quotes. We went into Iwa, won the whole goddamn thing and then crawled out of there with their princess and having killed one of their jounin behind us. That was, Megajiro sama and sensei actually. Kyofu pointed out. Details the girl scoffed. They should be demanding we accept the chonin rank. Pending evaluation. Ha! Naruto grinned. Oh come on. It won't be that bad. By tomorrow we'll all be sporting nice new vests. It's rare for a whole team to get promoted at once. Kyofu pointed out. Don't assume you're just gonna win. It'll be more disappointing if you... Oh come on. Ryoko interrupted. Of course we're gonna make it. We can't just fall behind Haku or that Kimimaro guy. I wasn't aware we were racing them. Of course we are. It's in the rule book. She grinned. Naruto laughed head looking out to Konoha in the waning sun. Day was just beginning to slip into dusk. Wanna get something to eat? Nah. Ryoko waved her off. After this long, even my parents have to have noticed I wasn't exactly around. I, guess I should go see them. She was reluctant, it was no secret her home was hardly what one would call idyllic. But it did have its good moments. Clearly, she was hoping after a nearly two months this might be one of the days the exception beat out the norm. I'll see you guys around. Kyofu shook her head as well, smiling sadly at him. Sorry Naruto-kun. But I'd like to go home too for now. How about tomorrow? He smiled in understanding. Sure. The purple-haired girl knelt and offered him a kiss on the cheek. Bye. The blonde waved watching her go. He understood, even felt happy for them. That didn't change the fact that it still stung knowing that they had someone waiting at home and, he didn't. Not even his friends, not for now, not for a while. He moved to leave when a hand fell over his shoulder. Might I be invited? He turned, blinking in surprised curiosity. Dan? The familiar silver-haired man smiled gently. We heard you came back. Tsunade went to get Shizun. He blinked for what? Dan gave him a look, as though this should be obvious. To celebrate you coming back of course. The child felt the wind knocked out of him, emotion building up from his chest and building an apple in his throat. Dan frowned. Are you alright kiddo? Naruto turned. Why yeah. He swallows then sharply turns around just, some dust in my eye. Dan, mercifully, makes nothing of it. Just grips his shoulder. Come on kid. Let's go celebrate and you can tell us all about the exam. Zero. The Rasengan? It was unmistakable. Orochimaru drawled. I'd recognize that technique anywhere. And then he. Used the theoretical version Minato had only started to experiment with. He infused the Rasengan with his wind element. Sarutobi shook his head. You're wrong. I'm not. You must be Orochimaru. The technique is a dead one and to not only use it but use its perfected form is. I'm not wrong I know exactly what I saw. Sarutobi was, in short, reeling. The Rasengan was Minato's personal technique. No one, not even his last remaining student, knew how to pull it off and without at least a rudimentary idea of how to make it function, all they had to go on was spinning chakra ball it sounds simplistic but the technique was absurdly complex given its pure chakra manipulation based execution. Rochimaru hadn't figured it out on his own quite yet, though supposedly with persistence and trial and error, he was getting close, same with Kakashi. Sarutobi hadn't even bothered. So the suggestion that a boy, 
who'd barely learned to even manipulate chakra two years earlier was pulling it off but even pulling off a form that Minato himself hadn't been able to achieve, was understandably, a rather thick pill to swallow. He was half tempted to call the child back and demand a demonstration. He stopped himself only because he, ultimately knew it'd be merely an exercise in redundancy. Rochimaru would recognize that technique anywhere and despite his protests the chances that his student was genuinely wrong was so close to zero it shouldn't even be worth considering. Who taught him? He asked. Orochimaru's lips turned down in a severe frown. He claims it was Jiraiya. Sarutobi blinked. Slowly, he leaned back in his chair, a creaking groan marking the motion as the weight shifted the old oaken seat. Jiraiya's dead. He finally says, for sheer lack of anything better. Orochimaru remains quiet, giving him a moment to gather his thoughts. At length, the older man sighs, removing his hat to rub at the back of his head then the front, temples throbbing with a quickly approaching headache. I thought we were past this. His groan is a miserable thing. A man bemoaning yet another burden to an already heavy weight that's already threatening to buckle him. Orochimaru's brows knit together, frowning. But still he asks. Your orders? Sarutobi opens his eyes and like molten steel poured into a mold, fire takes shape behind his eyes again. I assume you already investigated yourself. Your findings? Inoiki's assertion that his old memories would reassert themselves, or that the fabrications would fade in time has clearly been wrong. The man answers crisply. If anything, they've solidified and are threatening his sanity. When I spoke to him after the exam he was disoriented, delusional, didn't register pain. Clearly something is very wrong. Sarutobi rubbed his head again making a valiant effort to dismiss the pain portion of the explanation. Your recommendation? Have Inoiki seal away all of these false memories. The Sandaime sat up a little straighter. Memory sealing by the Yamanaka was a drastic action taken only by the highest-ranking Anbu or Hunter Nin going into deep cover. Everything that could be a threat to the village, every secret, every technique, every password every known official. Absolutely everything was carefully sealed away and other memories were implanted to fill in the breach to cause as little trauma as possible. It's a drastic action because, there was a 60% chance of there being permanent brain damage. Hence why it's only used on criminals or very high-risk missions. Are you out of your mind? He flatly asks. His psyche might very well be breaking under the stress. And so you want to add more stress to it? It's either take the risk now and save him or run the risk of him becoming completely non-functional down the road as the damage continues to erode his stability. He's six years old. If we were to seal up all the false memories he gained two years ago you might just seal away the real ones too. That's one third of his life Orochimaru. And his first two years he probably can't remember either. You'd be regressing him down to the state of a two-year-old or worse. The Yamanaka clan can fill in the ga. I won't authorize it. And even if I by some momentary delusion I somehow did, do you think Sonate would approve? She's the head doctor all these things have to pass through her desk as well. She may not be able to overrule me but she can make the job nearly impossible with her influence on the staff. The Sanin's frown deepened. At the very least he must be placed under a psychological ward. He will be given an evaluation but I am not going to just lock him in a padded room. He seemed fine just. Yes he always seems fine until those moments where he's simply not. Something happens. Itachi described a similar event months ago. It's going to happen again. He has to be observed in a controlled, measured environment away from as much familiar stimulus as possible until we can isolate what exactly is causing these episodes of his. Sarutobi once more leaned back in his chair. He does. The man agreed, lacing his hands together. Then, he looked at him and pointed. But not by you. The tilt of the Sanin's head was very much like that of a serpent observing a rather uppity rodent. Come again? You're far too close to this. The old monkey explained. You've known Naruto since he was born and at nearly any mention of Jiraiya you and Tsunade are quick to fly off the handle. You both act first and ask questions never. I'm not nearly as volatile as Haim. If by that you mean we won't find a body, then yes. You're absolutely right. We tend to find any one of her victims in several places. The older man stood glaring at him. As of right now your team is benched for two months time. On what grounds? The pale ninja hissed. On the grounds that they just completed a Chonin exam, ran the equivalent of two A-rank missions, one an escort and another a package delivery, 
collaborated and participated in the capture of Iwagakurs by Juu and deserve some time off. During this time I will be assigning someone to observe and evaluate Naruto's psychological welfare. I will get an unbiased report from him or her and decide how to proceed from there. Orochimaru opened his mouth to speak and the Sandaime held up his hand, stopping him. You try to go over my head on this like you did to get your nomination I'll see you locked in a cell for these two months if not longer. The man's mouth snapped shut though the growl reverberating through his chest indicated his displeasure. The silence between the two men was a pregnant thing before Sarutobi sat back down. You are not the one that can dictate the course here. Even without the QB, Naruto is still clearly a valuable asset to this village, one with immense potential if we were to just take in the three chakra affinities alone. His skill at being able to stall a down and help the daimyo escape another clearly shows that the boy will be immensely powerful when he's older. Your fear of these memories while certainly justifiable, does not change the fact that, if it lets him pull off a dead technique like the Rasengan and its more perfected version, this, anomaly might very well be an enormous treasure trove of techniques or skills that could make him more useful to us now than he ever was as a Jinchuriki with no knowledge on how to utilize his Baijuu. No matter what the risks to his psychological health are, I have to take full stock of what we stand to gain here and right now leaving the situation be as what's best for the village. The only reason I'm even giving him the evaluation is more to see if there's even a chance for the just-in-case-I'm-wrong scenario. He took a deep breath blowing out smoke from his nostrils. But I doubt very much that the evaluation will uncover something drastic enough that will merit a different course of action other than just letting it be and letting it run its course. The potential boon for the village more than warrants the risk involved for him. Orochimaru tilted his head. And here you always claim he's like a grandson to you. Sarutobi closed his eyes, then when he opened them again, he was glaring at the pale ninja. He is. Would you like to trade places? Through clenched jaw and glaring eyes after several moments the Sanin tried to change the subject. No doubt hoping to revisit this later. What will you do with the Baijuu? Seal it. Saru answered frankly. Secretly. In Naruto? No. We lost the Kyubi somehow. On the off chance it was some kind of fault in the seal or something other than an infiltrator we run the risk of losing the Inbi as well. Also it might somehow interfere with the three elements he's developed. The Inbi uses fire and earth. Naruto has earth, he does not have fire. It could just as easily develop in him as it could damage him by trying to change his chakra coils too drastically at this late stage of his coil development. And it's never wise to place all one's eggs in a single basket. In who then? Sarutobi gave him a look. Silly me. From my perspective this was something of a bomb you dropped on my desk. I'm sorry, I should have had a list of newborns ready for this eventuality. Orochimaru rolled his eyes. What sanctions will you demand from Iwa for their breach of the Chunin examination treaties? Sarutobi lit his pipe as he responded. None. Orochimaru wasn't sure whether he wished to face palm or growl in seething, angry surprise. What? Sarutobi chuckled under his breath. You've always been too quick to seek retribution. Always prickly. It's always been one of your biggest issues. Iwa has. Just lost their Jinchuriki. He interrupted, looking up at his student. We've gained their Baijuu where we had none. He shook his head. Do you really believe they want the world to know that? Not only did they violate the treaty signed by all five great villages, not only did they lose in effect a princess but also that they lost something so valuable? Iwa won't be bringing this event to light. They'll bury it like we buried losing the QB two years ago. But if you go airing their little escapade against us word will get out. And if word gets out what happens then Orochi? The snake sneered. He always did hate when his teacher still had something left to teach. The other villages will be made to think we now have two Jinchuriki. Saru nodded. Indeed. Once that gets out they won't sit idly by. QB was the strongest of the nine. Add to that the Yinbi and at the very least Kumo might start getting ideas to get to us before our new Jinchuriki comes of age and is made stronger. Iwa has everything to lose should it become public and we have very little to gain and much more to risk. What did I always tell you? Knowledge is power and power is guarded. The older man nodded, waving him away. Exactly. Now go. Celebrate with your team or lock yourself in a room with a scroll. I have a lot of work to oversee with these developments. Zero. The kissed Tsunade left him, he knew, left a big red lipstick stain on his forehead but he didn't mind it one bit as the female Sanin reached down to hug him goodbye with Dan ruffling his hair and Shizun chattering away. 
they'd treated him to one of the better restaurants in the village, paying for everything as they asked him about everything that happened in Iwa. He'd had to, skew the lines between the truth a bit when it came to just how he'd held off Kyuchi, and Tsunade had all but thrown a fit, ready to lead the charge for the next great war against Iwa when she heard they sick down and after them, at least according to Orochimaru, forming a bit of a scene. But it had been nice, to say the very least. He hadn't really, done something like this in his youth. That had always been, something of a bitter coil in his chest. A little, angry part of him that was always there when he saw other kids being congratulated by proud parents whenever they aced an exam, when they got their headbands or made it to Chonin. He hid the anger well, but he couldn't deny that an envious bitterness did linger within him. So this had been, very very nice and throughout the evening much to his embarrassment he actually had to swallow down the emotion that would have no doubt made him weepy if he let it linger too long. Shizun Chan had distracted him well enough, asking rapid-fire questions. What was the exam like? How many did you have to fight? What training did you and your team do to prepare? Were you nervous? What was Iwa like? Were they all earth users? Who the hell is this Haku girl? The last one had been asked by Tsunade. With a frown. And a glare. Dan listened, questioning certain, important events and tossing some black humor jokes at Iwa Nin's expense. Tsunade mostly listened, drinking some wine with her head resting on Dan's shoulder as she did. It was, strange, to see her so happy with Dan. Even at the best of times the smile he could remember on his Tsunade's face just couldn't match her smile here. He didn't really understand why. Well, he did. She was in love with him. But he didn't understand why this happiness was something that didn't exist for her back home. Dan, to him, was just so much like Uro Sen and Sans the super perverted Ness of course that he simply didn't understand why Jiraiya and Tsunade didn't work back then like Dan and she are working now. And that did make him a little sad at the thought. But still, those thoughts were pushed aside and he did his very best to enjoy the evening with all of them. It didn't take very much effort in that respect. But all things must eventually come to an end and soon enough Shizun had to leave to pack up for her first C-rank mission outside the village in the morning. Dan had to leave to file a report on a mission he'd completed a few hours ago and Tsunade had to return to the hospital. When they left, they said they were proud of him. He was proud of himself for keeping the happy tears from flowing until they were well out of sight. He smiled the whole way home. When he got home though. He opened the door and the smile fell. He squinted, peering into the darkness at the silhouette standing in the middle of his living room. He feels out its chakra Itachi? He asked closing the door behind him. He smiles. How'd you know I was back? Word gets around, she said simply, shrugging. By the dead, flat sound of her voice the hairs on the back of his neck stand on end in a sharp warning. This isn't the same as before this isn't Itachi being stoic it's, different in a very bad way. What's wrong? She says nothing. She stands in the center of the room, head cast down. The hair that was usually tied in a neat tail at the back of her head while wearing her mask now falls like sheets of midnight alongside the edges of her mask. Her shoulders are slumped and her chakra wavers within her coils. What's wrong? He demands, voice rising. Naruto. She breathes and Naruto has the distinct impression that she's not pausing because she wants to consider her words. I, I want you to promise something to me Naruto. His hackles rose, and immediately the worst of possibilities sprang to the forefront of his mind. Promise me you'll be friends with Sasuke. Naruto swallows thickly. Already? Had he really run out of time already? Itachi. He swallowed, fishing for words. He was struck by something. This would change things. In Suna he hadn't sought out Gara, Tamari or Konkuro. Because he hadn't wanted them to change from how he knew them. He'd shied away from change. And had been trying to walk this tight rope of not changing things too much ever since he arrived. Trying to keep the future predictable. Here now, may Sasuke forgive him, but he was tempted to do the same, tempted to let Itachi walk out of this house and go kill 200 and something men women and children. But, it wasn't the same. In Suna, not going to go see Gara didn't fall anywhere near the same league as allowing Sasuke's whole family to be slaughtered in a single night in allowing his friend to receive the single, harshest blow of his entire life. To let the single event that had broken his friend, and it had broken him, come to pass. He warred within himself and he was disgusted with himself as he did so. To think about letting this happen to Sasuke, because he was afraid of change. That's not the way friends treated each other. 
Promise me the girl hissed looking up at him, the sharp porcelain features of the mask staring at him. Naruto shook his head. What are you going to do? That's not your business. She answered flatly in a voice he recognized as that of the Itachi he had known. The S rank killer. Just. The steel was gone from her voice, then she shook her head. Never mind, this was foolish. She moved towards his window and Naruto knew, instantly that he couldn't let her walk out of here back to her compound. With a hand seal and a surge of chakra 40 shadow clones were in the room, hoping she'd just assume the snake taught him the technique. Go, he shouted. Itachi turned, one hand drawing a kunai when. The clones ran away. What are you doing? Naruto crossed his arms. I sent them scattering. The Hokage Tower, the Anbu headquarters, that stupid Jounin bar where Ka he caught himself Pusan and Dan go to get drunk sometimes. The hospital to get Tsunade Ba Chan. I can't stop you from doing something stupid. I'm not strong enough but they can. Knocking me out won't dispel them either. Her fist clenched, the kunai trembling in her grasp. You don't understand. He wished he could say that he did, that he knew exactly what she was gonna do. Instead he relaxed, lowering his tensed shoulders as he held his hands out to her. I understand that whatever you're thinking about doing if it's as bad as you make it seem like it is, and Chan then you don't have to do it. It doesn't have to be this way. She chuckled and the sound was a bitter, acid-filled thing. I do, that's the thing isn't it? You always have to do it, especially when you don't want to. There's always another way. He pleaded, it was something he'd said throughout his old life and it's something he would say here. He had to. There was always a better alternative, a way to do things right, not fast. She shook her head but before anything more could be said there was a puff of smoke between the two of them, revealing Kakashi, the snarling visage of the wolf mask sneering at his subordinate. Senpai. Itachi? Kakashi's hands are hidden beneath his cloak, but by his tense posture and voice, the Anbu captain is ready to defend himself and Naruto as well. Little Naruto tells me you're acting a little weird? Naruto wonders why Kakashi's so tense, but Itachi doesn't. He knows about the planned coup he's one of the only people that does know. He responded so fast to Naruto because no doubt he feared that Fugaku had gotten impatient and was demanding of her to seize the Kyubi Jinchuriki. No doubt a message had been sent to Anbu Outpost 4, the nearest one and from there it would take nothing more than a handful of minutes for every Anbu and Jounin to be on alert, 20 for the Chunin posts to receive word and for Jounin sensor teams to begin a thorough sweep of the village. It's over, the night of slaughter is over before it could have even begun. Foiled by a six-year-old who went and, tattled on her. She laughs. It's a wheezy, shaky thing. What will happen now? She could have undone this whole thing, slaughtered the whole clan, kept Sasuke safe from the inevitable crossfire once everything explodes in just a few more days. One dead clan, one missing nin for the world to hate and her brother would be safe. He would hate her, but he would live in the village, cared for and protected as the last heir to the esteemed Uchiha. The commoners would give him favor by mere tragedy and Donzo, Homura, Koharu would back off. And if they didn't Sarutobi would make them. There would be no need to go after one lonely child and the Sandaime would see that. He would be safe. She could live with that. Now she couldn't be sure. And for that, as grateful as she might have been to Naruto, that gratitude was eclipsed by anxiety and fear. Itachi. Kakashi's voice, it snaps her out of her thoughts and the man is standing before her, one hand held out. Give me the knife Itachi. It's clenched in her grip, but the fight's been drained out of her already. I just, I just wanted to keep him safe. Keep who safe? Sasuke. We'll keep him safe. The silver-haired Jounin assured. You have my word Itachi, no matter what happens with your clan or the Sandaime, Sasuke will be safe. I promise. Just give me your knife and we'll sit down and talk about things okay? Naruto watches from behind the copy ninja, tense and nervous, he senses other Anbu now, slips of chakra darting past his home to check other areas while others converge on the signature of the chief Jounin. He sees something fall from the bottom of the mask to hit the floor. It takes him a moment to realize its tears. He wonders if it was the same for the Itachi he remembers. If the man, despite his stoic nature really was as aloof about the whole thing as he had seemed or if this decision had haunted and tormented him as it does the Itachi he knows as Enchan. She's 14 years old. Naruto could barely pull himself through the grief of having lost his friends and family. And he's only barely managed with the knowledge that they're still there. That he could see them again. 
if it wasn't for that he might not have held together at all. As it is he knows he's not okay in the strictest sense of the word. And he certainly hadn't needed to kill all his friends and family like his Itachi had and this one plans too. He could only imagine how, horrible this has to be for anyone placed in these shoes. I was going to kill them all? She confessed. Who were you going to kill? The clan. She shrugged. 276 people. It would have been easy. Her draw was measured, bored. Like a bookkeeper discussing his ledger she was an assassin commenting on her tally. Most are Chaonin in the police force, they stick to schedules and are in bed after a certain point. Those would be the second. First would have been the ones getting ready to start their shift, once those two are out of the way, more cautiously deal deal with any late-nighters, then the guards patrolling the perimeter, they wouldn't suspect me coming around late. I don't sleep well sometimes. The real fight would be the four Jounin, Sishui too. But they won't be expecting it. No one would be expecting it. For each I'd approach under the pretense of being summoned to the clan house. Wait for them to turn their back to get ready. To look away or walk ahead. She laughed it would just be so, easy. That's the real thing, I could do it all in just a few hours. There would be no more coup. No future battles, no retribution from an enraged Konoha. No riots, no assassinations. They would be dead, I would be the killer and Sasuke would be the last tragic, most beloved heir. It doesn't have to be this way. Kakashi echoed Naruto's words, finally edging close enough to pull the knife from her slack hands. Before he could fully pull it free she gripped it, looking up at him. Just promise, promise me he'll be safe. The older man nodded. Finally, she let go. And as afraid of change or how much more complicated the already alternating paths of the future had become, how terrified he was of the misstep that would bring about his ultimate failure against the monster that was Toby or about how, once all was said and done he might not even recognize the people he'd once called and still calls precious to him. He couldn't help but feel good. For both his friends. Itachi and Sasuke who were just averted from their respective tragedies. When it changed them, he only hoped it would be for the better. Zero. Ah, sorry Toby Dono, Koto cried as he entered the common room. The Sandaime bowed. Mega Jiro Sam. Ah. The man bemoaned flailing his arms around. No no. We're old friends aren't we? Then without preamble the daimyo hugged him like he did the day he formally arrived. Sorry Toby awkwardly returned the gesture with one arm trapped between them. Koto pulled back smiling. Drink? He offered. No, thank you, I came when I heard you had some form of request for me. Ah yes. The daimyo seemed to remember at the reminder, gesturing for Sarutobi to sit as he poured himself a bit of sake. With heavy robes of black and red, the daimyo sat across from the white-robed Sarutobi. The younger man smiled congenially as he spoke. After these events, something's become rather obvious to me. And that is? I require a guard. Sarutobi raised an eyebrow, leaning forward, I assure you sir, your palace is well guarded by our forces at all time. Yes I know, you cycle through four teams of your jounin. Sixteen men on monthly assignments. I assigned those men to keep my children and wife safe. I need a personal guard. You had sixteen. Sarutobi points out. Sixteen jounin was not a force to scoff at. And now the daimyo was asking for more? What exactly is preventing you from doing away with these as well? My palace is enormous Sarutobi. Sixteen men are needed to guard at a reduction risks the safety of my family. Sarutobi's eyes narrowed. Then it hit him. This, isn't about you needing a guard. The younger man stares at him, dead serious. What exactly are you intending with the Iwa girl? He asked. Koto leaned back, lips pursed. The pieces came clicking into place as Sarutobi read the younger man he had known as a child like an open book. You don't want guards, you want tutors. The daimyo's eyes closed, dipping his head with a sound that was half a grunt, half a groan half an affirmation. Sarutobi leaned forward. You want to have us teach her? What for? The daimyo took a breath, sighing before opening his eyes to look at him again. While in Iwa. He began. There was something of a, remarkable experience really. He paused, opening and closing his mouth as though searching for the words. I was attacked. He finally said. At first, I believed it would be some foolish, disgruntled Chonin. Perhaps even a Jounin, someone who lost a loved one in our wars against Iwagakur but, imagine my surprise when, rather than a Chonin or a Jounin, 
the attacker was nothing more than a child of 10 years old. Sarutobi waited meeting Koto's eyes. Aren't you tired of it all? He asked. This, seething hatred that gnaws at both our countries? Sarutobi shook his head. Do you expect that, in the six years you have with her as your ward according to the agreement that you'll be able to, what, foster some kind of peace with Iwa? Koto sighed. It's a step in the right direction. I will open the door, and hope the next generation sees fit to walk through it. He smirked. Myself and Kurotsuchi could only ever be acquaintances I'm afraid, he chuckled. Sarutobi missed the joke. The daimyo sighed through his nostrils. I need no more than four. Preferably the specialists of your nin, tai and genjutsu with another you feel would be fitting. I don't think any would be fitting. Sarutobi answered frankly. You can foster peace without training her. True, but then there would be nothing gained. The only way people hold status in shinobi villages is through their sheer strength on the field of battle. Once she leaves she must be able to achieve a high enough rank in Iwa otherwise all the effort will be as significant as if I'd fostered Anaki's pet fish. You want me to authorize granting you four experts in the varying shinobi fields, Jounin to train a single girl who's then going to be returned to one of our most openly hostile neighbors, one that could very well declare war at any point in time, where she will be bound to fight us and turn our own teachings against us. Koto smiled sadly. I suppose I'd best become a very close acquaintance then. The shinobi was about to answer when the door opened, one of the samurai stepping inside. Forgive me Sandaime-sama, Megajiro-sama but there is someone here requesting to see Sandaime-sama immediately. Who? The older man asked. I do not know. He wears a wolf mask. Send him in, Sarutobi demanded, standing up and bowing to the daimyo. Excuse me for a moment. Koto nodded. Seconds later Sarutobi had turned, marched to the entrance of the large room to met the wolf make Donbu where both began to speak to each other in harsh whispers. The words didn't carry over to him. But whatever was being said it was obviously something very agitating to the older man. It was nearly ten whole minutes before the discussion ended and the older man sent wolf away with his orders. When the man returned, his face was severe, as ablaze with thought. It prompted Koto to ask. Is there anything I can help you with Sarutobi Dono? The man shook his head know it. Then he stopped. And looked at him. Koto could see the lines of thought converging, the answers clicking into place behind the man's eyes and the daimyo felt the words he'd said to Orochimaru after the exam were about to be used against him. Move your enemy. Do not be moved by him. Zero. He found the head. That was all that had been left of his old friend. Just the head. Even that was left as a mocking taunt. Roshi was dead. The girl was gone. In his report, he explained how he went after the samurai before realizing it was a decoy. He explained how, by the time he found the real trail, Konoha teams were converging. He explained how they'd reacted far earlier than should have been possible. How they were still beyond Konoha's borders. Still beyond the sphere of influence and unless they had the greatest luck imaginable there should not have been any interference, certainly not to the degree of having three or four teams converging on the daimyo. Anaki hadn't cared. All he knew was that his granddaughter was gone and his jinchuriki had failed in capturing her. He'd refused to believe his explanations. Calling them excuses had accused the armored jinchuriki of having let them go as another of his rebellious acts of which they'd been getting more and more brazen whenever he was on a mission. The reality here was that he wasn't lying. And while Anaki went on about his grandchild and the Baijuu, Han himself had lost an old friend, had carried his head back to the village, where it was, as he sat here, being disposed of like yesterday's garbage. While he was sitting in a cell for his, treason. And the lies he used to try and cover it up. He hated this place. He hated them all. In victory, they were ignored, in defeat they were blamed. In, existing. They were reviled. It wasn't Roshi's death, that they complained about, it wasn't that the man was gone. It was that they lost the Inbi. It was that they lost their precious little princess. Roshi was barely even worthy of a footnote. He hated these, creatures. These, cruel savage, selfish, deceitful, hateful parasites known as humans. I'll kill them all. He'd made the vow before, whispered it in those dark corners of thought when shadows closed in and the misery of his existence became such a palpable thing but this time. This time. The air shifted. His eyes opened, peering into the gloom of his cell. His hat was gone, 
most of his armor as well. Only his gauntlets remained. Even the steam container of his back was gone, they'd taken it. But he was not defenseless, never defenseless in front of these cruel, weak little things. Who are you? Just a friend Gobi-sama. You are not my friend human. He snarled. But I'm everyone's friend. The voice laughed before a face melted out of the gloom. Han peered. Who are you? The man tilted his head, childlike voice deepening to something, sinister. Toby is a good boy. Chapter 19 He cursed, dropping from the higher canopies, rushing to get away. He was getting careless. His ears twitched, hearing the distinct sound of a blade cutting through wind, headed straight for him. His hand lashed out, finding a solid grip on a branch that snapped with his momentum but was just enough to divert him from the kunai's path before he hit the ground with a roll. He was about to look up when he was forced to yank his hand back, narrowly avoiding the deadly, venom-laced bite of the little lizard that had been lying in wait there. He detected the illusion being thrown over his senses, and dispelled it a second too late, the impact came, literally from nowhere, a brutal hit that snapped his head and neck back, dispelling genjutsu that had been placed over him in time to see that spinning dervish of a weapon being thrust down to Gorham as he fell. He hit the ground and kept going, sinking beneath the surface as the weapon buried one of its four blades into dirt and rock rather than flesh and bone. He sensed the danger lying just beneath him a second before it came. With an explosion that sent him flying back up into the tree line with half the forest floor he barely had time for his eyes to adjust to the light of day before that light was quickly eclipsed by a monster. Eight limbs latched onto him, fangs piercing flesh and fabric to inject a paralyzing neurotoxin into his bloodstream. Then he vanished, replaced by a log. An alarm rang. What? Are you kidding me? Ryoko's shout of outrage could be heard back in the Konoha proper. Kyofu marched out of the shadows in the forest, barely a whisper of sound to announce her movement. Though she said nothing, the expression on her face spoke volumes towards her displeasure. Better luck next time. The Sanin drawled, stepping out of his own hiding place, face placid and calm as he faced his two fuming students. We were so damn close that time, Ryoko hissed. Close doesn't count. He drawled. Almost, cutting someone is about as useful as a glass hammer. He jerked his head, indicating the village. Go on. We're done for the day. They obeyed, with Ryoko giving off a mocking salute before she turned to leave. Rochimaru waited for them to be well out of earshot before he allowed his shoulders to sag, taking in a deep breath as he sat down, pulling his shirt to reveal the two holes that had punched into his flesh. He was getting old. Or he was a better teacher than he wished to be. At 18 and 21 respectively these children should still be years away from beating him. But they'd gotten close today. Saru Tobi had once told him a person is measured by the quality of the adversity. He wondered if that was more a compliment to his students or him at this moment. He grunted, standing up with something between a growl and a groan. Six years ago they were just the Genin of Team 8, and not even the most promising ones at that. The last thought brought a curl to his lips in a bitter sneer as he made his way back towards the village proper. Zero. She opened her eyes that morning and remained in bed, staring up at the ceiling. It almost felt surreal to be honest. So many just left so quickly. She took a breath sat up on her bed and began getting herself ready for the day, brushing out her shoulder-length dark hair. The one vanity she allowed herself really. She smiled, remembering how it had been a fight tooth and nail to convince her to keep it. There was a knock on the door. Come in. It slid open to reveal Kaza, one of the servants. The older woman bowed. Lady Kurotsuchi would you like your meal brought to you today or will you be eating in the dining room? I'll head out. The Iwa princess answered reaching towards her kunai pouch and other weapons. Tell them I'll be down in a few. The woman nodded, bowing again. Zero. The thundering beat of horse cloves drummed through the morning mists of the Konoha forest. A column of a good two dozen men was the guilty party, with one man in a suit of carved wooden armor, a standard bearer, and another in heavy robes of orange and green, riding at its head. Koto-sama. The man in the wooden armor pulled back on the reins of his horse, stopping as the scout galloped back. The way is clear my lord, the Sandaime-sama has sent out his escorts behind me. The daimyo looked up to the trees, wondering if he'd catch a glimpse, he doubted he would. We have made good time yes? I am thinking we will make it in time for lunch. The daimyo, with more salt than pepper in his beard now, chuckled. All you think about is food Raman. This is not true. 
I think of many things. It is merely easier to think of these other things when I am red-faced and full. Koto shook his head, smiling. It had not sat well with some members of the noble court that he'd appointed a foreigner as the head of his personal non-shinobi guard, but to those he would challenge to find a better duelist or a sharper eye. Raman's father had been a soldier once, hired as a mercenary during the Second War and being appointed as a captain by Koto's own father after the man had distinguished himself during the last year of fighting. Raman had been born six years later and had enlisted into the military as soon as he came of age, just in time to fight at the tail end of the Third War. For this he and his father were called the latecomers though rarely to their faces. His accent is heavy, his father's influence no doubt. Most of the time it sounded like the man was asking a question when making a statement, and making a statement when asking a question. But there was no one Koto would trust more after so many years. Come. The daimyo demanded. We have VIPs to escort. He kicked at his horse hard and the beast began galloping through the forest towards the village. Zero. A rolled-up folder came down over her head with a sharp thwack startling her awake as she shot upright in her chair. I'm up I'm up. She complained, before both hands came to her eyes, groaning in misery as light decided to make itself known to her retinas. No you're drooling all over your files again. Tsunade groaned miserably. Go away she despaired. I used to do this job before you got here. Let me go back to doing it my way. You mean the way it was when I got here? Where there was over eight months worth of backed up filing that still had to be sorted out. The people lived didn't they? After we had to spend hours on end searching for their medical histories. I never had to. I'm referring to every other doctor in this building. You know. The normal group of people. Tsunade opened a single bloodshot eye to glare at the little witch that was her niece. You were nicer and cuter when you were little. I'll cry myself to sleep at night with regret. She deadpanned, holding out the file she'd used to hit her. Tsunade glared flatly as she took it. Homer Akagase late sixties, near heart attack. Shizun recited. Again? Tsunade cursed as she stood up. I told him three months ago to lay off the salt. The brunette raised an eyebrow. What are you doing? I'm gonna go down there, curse him out beat the crap out of him, threaten his son to keep him off the damn salt and give him a foot in the ass out the door. She answered as she took her jacket off the peg. And the healing part? I'll fit that in somewhere if I'm in the mood. Zero. Akurotsuchi. Takeshio, Koto's eldest son smiled as she entered, she offered a nod and returned before looking down at what was coming her way. You lose this? She smirked as she knelt down plucking the little crawling terror up before it could escape past her to set itself loose on the unsuspecting palace. Sasami is Koto's second and youngest child. Born just a year and a half ago the joy that had overtaken the daimyo of Hai no Kuni at the birth of his daughter was tempered only by the price that had been paid for it. In her mid-forties, well into a time where childbirth would be dangerous, Lady Inoue didn't survive the birth. She remembered that she had tried, somewhere in her mind not to cry that day. She'd failed. After six years, despite all those words of caution at the back of her mind and knowledge that they were or could someday be enemies she had grown, fond of them to say the very least. Koto had never treated her as anything less than if she'd been his own child. Takeshio and the late Lady Inoue had done much the same. She smiled down at the little baby, who squealed out her displeasure at having been denied her quick escape. You're getting fast aren't you? She marched up towards the table the baby grunting in response before another of the servants took her, and more came to clear her place at the table beside the acting lord of Hai no Kuni. She sat down, eating the food presented to her in silence besides Takeshio. Not five minutes into the meal, he smiled. It's too quiet. She agreed. The palace felt, empty. He looked at her out the corner of his eye. You'll be leaving us soon too. He pointed out. The hitch in her movement was barely noticeable before she recovered. Two more months. She intoned, trying to keep her voice level. We'll miss you Kurotsuchi. She looked up at the young man, offering her own smile in response. Thanks. She caught movement out of the corner of her eye. I'll miss Sasami's escapes. He looked confused for a moment before one of the servants marched out of a side hallway, large strides carrying her straight towards the crawling baby that was still determined to shine the floor with her belly in the mad dash towards the courtyard. Takeshio chuckled. They ate in silence for a little longer before someone else approached them. My lord. The old man said, bowing deeply at the waist. There are reports that your cousin Kotaro will be arriving by nightfall. 
I understand. He nodded. Thank you Toby certain his rooms are made ready. The old man bowed again. Of course. Before shuffling back to leave. Zero. Koto pulled back the reins of his horse, the eastern wooden gates of the leaf village looming over him now with the white-robed Sarutobi standing at the gates to greet them flanked by a half-dozen of his shinobi. He trotted the horse forward, dismounting quickly, fast enough to no doubt have his guards cursing him for his recklessness as they tried to move fast enough to guard him properly. Sarutobi, he laughed, opening his arms wide before hugging the stiff village leader like he always did. As expected his old friend awkwardly returned it after a moment. You didn't send word you were coming. Sorry Toby drawled as they pulled apart. I was behooved to keep my plans a secret on pain of not being shown where to acquire the best ramen in the country. Sorry Toby raised a single bushy eyebrow, a smirk tugging at his lips before he tilted his head to peer around Koto's shoulder where five shinobi he easily recognized knelt, waiting for him to give them leave to stand again and welcome them home. Still. There were six when last I checked. He drawled. Koto turned looking over his shoulder to the five men. He chuckled. I suppose the boy simply couldn't contain himself. Zero. We almost had him. She was practically stabbing the meat on her plate with the chopsticks. Fucking alarm. Fucking kawarimi. Fucking sensei. We'll get him next time, Kyofu said absently, smiling as she scratched the lizard summon under the chin, feeding it fish in between bites of her own meal. That's what you said last time, Ryoko said with her mouth full and we got closer this time than we ever have. If at first you don't succeed. Then try and try and try again Ryoko finished bitterly, once more stabbing her food as though it was the guilty transgressor here. Kyofu chuckled. We're two Chonin who can nearly take down one of the Sanin. Come on, stop being so glum. It'd be cooler to be two Chonins that can take down a Sanin. Cutting out the nearly makes it sound so much better. Well maybe if you had a third member. Someone sing song behind them. The lady stiffened, turning to look before a grin swept up Ryoko's features. Anko. The purple-haired Jounin grinned, twirling a stick of dengo between her fingers as she wiggled them in a mock hello in one hand while eating off the last dumplings on the was dressed, mostly in black and dark purple, her clothes were form-fitting, leaving only her navel and arms exposed. Hey girls. Miss me? Maybe. Kyofu smirked, the lizard summoned crawling up her torso to coil around her shoulder and neck. How'd your mission go? Ryoko asked. Not bad. Killed the guy, killed his guard, hitched a ride back. Simple. You make it sound more boring than simple. The silver-haired teen shot back. You're actually making me dread getting that strong one day. Where's the fun in life without challenge? You could always just go back to Sensei to challengingly get your ass kicked. The glare she got in response was just priceless. Anko looked around. Where is the old man anyway? Don't know. Kyofu shrugged. He dismissed us after the match. We came to eat. Probably stuffed his face in a book somewhere. Anko nodded. Right, well I'm off then. I'll see you around. The snake mistress replied before swiveling on her heel and marching off. When the girls finally left their training grounds to return to the village, it was with some surprise that they noticed a rather peculiar sight on their home's most noticeable landmark. It was painted. Ridiculous swirls and graffiti crisscrossed the four faces in headache bright colors. The San Daime actually had a sign above his head that read he's really really old. Kyofu raised an eyebrow. How the hell did they manage to pull that off in the middle of the day? Dunno. Clever bastards whoever they were, or our guards just suck that badly. Zero. The hospital was a place of quiet, at least outside of the maternity and pediatric wards, a place where the sick and wounded could recover nursed back to health in peace and comfort by some of the best medical minds and hands in the whole of Hai no Kuni. Some might have even been lucky enough to be treated by the undisputed best. Such as it was, the surprise of quite a few nurses and patients, was great indeed when suddenly an ear-piercing shriek nearly deafened whomever was within 200 or so square feet from the source, even a few people on the floors above and below the source. Oh my god you're here. The delighted laugh drowned out the sound of cracking ribs as the victim was subjected to a bone-crushing hug. Hi Tsunadine. He groaned, laughing, literally, breathlessly as he returned the hug as best he could. Can you let go now? She pulled away, holding him by the shoulders she looked him up and down. You've gotten big. I've got to tell Dan, I've got to tell Shizun. I've got to tell she stopped the smile overpowering her face. 
Oh, they'll be so glad you're home. She looked him up and down. You've gotten so much bigger now. She repeated. She remembered the little boy that barely reached her hip, now here he was at her navel or so. The daimyo seal was emblazoned on his shoulder right beneath the leaf symbol. He still hadn't grown out of his love for orange though. Naruto smiled, warmed by the welcome. You know where Ryoko-chan and Kyofu-chan are? I want to see them but don't even know where to start. Orochimaru probably dragged them off to the woods somewhere. Oh I've got to tell everyone. The staff called me to find out what you were yelling Aboa. This time Naruto was fairly certain his ears were bleeding as he was suddenly glomped from behind, his body lurching forward as Shizun damn near tackled him and picked him up, squeezing the air out of him like an oversized plushie. Naruto you're back. How Shizun's little arms were applying more crushing force than Tsunade he had no idea, but it was happening. I've got to go tell Dan. And just like that Tsunade abandoned him to his painful fate, even as he reached towards her for help. Zero. From that point, it didn't take long for word to spread through the village. Uzumaki Naruto was back. Either they knew him as the child prodigy sponsored by the snake Sanin, or they knew him as the Kyubi Jinchuriki, word that he'd returned from his long time abroad with the daimyo had spread through the village grapevine that had been somewhat starved of good gossip lately. As such, it didn't take long for one particular individual to hear of it. Calmly, and slowly, Orochimaru finished his meal, wiping his mouth before asking for the check and paying. In the same fashion he made his way out of the restaurant, focusing for a moment on the seals he'd placed over his two students to locate them both quickly and efficiently, and sending two clones off to go collect them. Then, in his mind he began checking off the places the boy could be, eyes absently trailing up to notice the paint several genin were cursing to high heaven as they tried to clean it off the four faces. He raised an eyebrow. A testament to his skills, or the guard's utter lack of any. It took a few minutes as his mind catalogued and filed away locations and people and what most likely the boy he'd known would do upon arriving. Finally he reached a conclusion and headed off. Zero. She didn't know what she should feel, standing here again. The sense of, emptiness though, that the compound exhumed was decidedly strange when she compared it to the crowded place she recalled. She entered quietly, without ceremony or announcement. Made her way back into the house, through shaded halls and empty corridors before she found her old room, pristine and immaculate, as though waiting for her. She bathed and changed, glad to be free from the grit and grime of travel and it was in the middle of this that she finally heard the arrival of another. Itachi? She turned, looking over her shoulder towards the door. Mother. She was surprised, though not very much so when the woman dropped what she was carrying and walked over to envelop her in a hug. Her mother was always the most affectionate in the family outside of Sasuke. Mikoto pulled away, a smile on her features and Itachi wondered if the woman had any idea that she'd been on the verge of killing her six years ago. Come. Your father and brother will be home soon, they'll be overjoyed to see you. At least one of them will the young woman thought. Zero. Aren't you too like, really busy at the hospital? Naruto asked as he walked down the street. Yes but. No we're not. Tsunade interrupted. Besides you've come back. We're allowed to go out and celebrate this. That's not how it. Shush. Besides this is special. It's Dan's turn today but he won't mind if I steal his thunder for a day. Dan's turn for what? Naruto asked, confused. Tsunade kept her smile but said nothing. To his surprise and bemusement, soon enough they were standing in front of the academy gates with other parents already waiting to pick up their children in a few minutes. What are we doing here? He questioned. Yeah what are you doing here? A familiar voice sounded off behind him and Naruto turned to look over his shoulder finding a confused Dan walking up to the three. Though confused, he smiled at Naruto, hey kiddo, we missed you. Though not nearly as enthusiastic, painful, as Tsunade and Shizun's greetings, the smile on his face was no less heartfelt. Naruto appreciated that. But still, his mind kept on going back to the question of what the hell they were doing here. And while he wasn't the sharpest kunai in the holster, even his mind was starting to slowly acquire a sneaking suspicion. Dan plus Tsunade plus relationship plus academy equals. Before he could reach the conclusion his mind was practically beating him in the face with, the doors opened and out poured the children into their parents' waiting arms. Naruto looked with wide eyes, heart beating a little stronger in his chest as he waited with what he didn't realize was bated breath. He was infinitely surprised however, with the child that eventually approached with a smile as bright as the sun. 
Not because it was a little girl. Not because she was smaller than all her peers, he'd already done the mental math and realized that she could be no older than six before he'd ever seen her. Not even because she actually called Tsunade Ka-chan. No. What surprised him was the fact that, rather than her hair being Tsunade's shade of blonde, or Dan's silver, her hair was red. Bright, fiery red hair. Hi honey. How was your day? Tsunade smiled as she hugged her, listening as the girl began to go off a mile a minute. It was great. Iruka sensei taught us all about the Hokage. Did you know the fourth was the fastest person ever? No. Really? The girl nodded. Yeah and GG knows like a billion jutsu. He's old enough for it. Tsunade snickered. Come on there's someone here you should meet. When Tsunade brought her forward the smile Naruto gave was a genuine one, the kind he'd nearly forgotten how to give in such a long time. Hi. He knelt down. I'm Naruto, what's your name? Akane. She answered back, bemused. He touched her hand. Her skin was hot to the touch. Zero. Itachi. Her name was half a statement, half a question and half a greeting all at once as she turned her gaze towards the surprised clan head. Father. She nodded, her tone devoid of disapproval or affection in any case. The man paused at the doorway before he finally entered, almost hesitant. We, did not know you were returning. Koto-sama gave no announcement. She offered by way of explanation. The man nodded. It is, good to see you home again. Sasuke will be overjoyed to see you. I've missed him. She confessed. If he noticed the fact that he was not included he gave no indication as he took his place at the head of the table. Reaching for the steaming pot of jasmine tea that had been simmering in front of Itachi when she arrived. How, was your time abroad? he asked, fishing for small talk as he served himself. Productive. She answered curtly. I learned much. Naruto-kun learned even more. She caught the look he offered out of the corner of her eye. There was no warning before you left. One day you were here, the next night you were gone. It was best to keep my leaving a secret. She looked at him. For security reasons. He trailed a thumb over the rim of his cup. Much has changed. Has it? His lips thinned, eyes narrowing. There was a tense silence between father and daughter, thick with unspoken sentiment. She took another sip of her tea. I didn't think so. She placed the cup into its proper place, stood and left the room. Zero. The door flew open and cracked against the wall, an irritated-looking blonde standing there. Rochi. Akane screamed, delighted as she ran into the home where a pale snake Sanin smiled a wide, Fang smirk as he knelt down to pick her up as she came close. There's my little morsel, he chuckled low in his throat as he lifted her, Tsunade stepping into her own home. This is breaking and entering you inconsiderate mother triple times F. Dan's hand was suddenly clamped around her mouth, choking down the word. Their precious, innocent daughter was very much in earshot after all. Behind him there was a loud bang as Kyofu slipped off the stool she'd been sitting on, startled expression turning to the back of her sensei's head. You said she invited us here for a celebration. Ryoko was looking at the tea she'd been drinking and wondering if it would be better to apologize profusely or just dump it all on Orochimaru's lap and call it even. Oh she did. The serpent drawled, before tilting his head in a very serpentine manner to look behind the blonde woman and her husband. It's not every day little Naruto-chan comes home after all. It calls for a celebration. The steaming pot Ryoko had been about to chuck at the back of her sensei's head, slipped from her grip and landed on the counter with a clatter. Say what now? The blonde chose that moment to step into the house, bags in hand with Shizun following. Hey what's Rohi blinked. Then waved and smiled. Hi guys. Zero. The door slid open with a crack slamming against the wall at the end of its railings. Itachi smiled. The cry of her name was just a second earlier than the massive hug that knocked her from her sitting position to land flat on her back. Sasuke's face pressed into the crook of her neck. She laughed and smiled, genuinely, since she first stepped foot in here. You're back. You're back. Sasuke repeated hugging her tighter. She craned her head down, kissing the top of his head, her hair tickling her nose. So I am. She held him close for a few more seconds. They tell me you're about to graduate the academy. He pulled away, smirking in a way that was far too like their father for her liking. Yeah. Rookie of the year too. He gloated. Oh? She raised an eyebrow, 
shifting her position to reach her feet. So you think you're good enough to throw a kunai straight now? He blinked for a moment before narrowing his eyes and smirking. You were supposed to practice with me. She chuckled. His smile turned mischievous. To make up for it you'll have to teach me one of your jutsu. Her smile was gentle. She could have survived his hate. She could have shouldered the burden of it for the rest of her days. She was so grateful she didn't have to though. As long as you teach me what you've learned since I've been gone. I'll show you as many jutsu as you want Sasu-chan. He glared. She laughed. Zero. Kotaro was not an imposing young man, even though the armor added to his shoulders and chest, at 5'7 there was simply little that could make him physically overwhelming as far as intimidation went. That's not to say however, that the daimyo's nephew didn't command presence. He strode into the court as though the palace was his own, and many a servant and nobleman scampered clear of his path as he shot across the room like an arrow head aimed at his cousin. Kurotsuchi watched him approach, struggling to keep the displeasure from her gaze. Out of the daimyo's entire family, she mistrusted him the most. Cousin, Takeshio cried, smiling as he stood. Kotaro knelt as his cousin and the heir to the country descended the stairs to approach. Takeshio-sama I have. How many times must I tell you? We're family cousin. Stand up, Takeshio demanded, reaching down to pull Kotaro to his feet. At least once more. The shorter man responded blandly, returning Takeshio's disgruntled frown with a deadpan stare. Your sense of formality will see your hair grow gray before its time. Seeing no real response or repost forthcoming Takeshio sighed, quickly being reminded why his cousin's visits usually turned out to be such boring things. I take it there is buisness you'd rather discuss in private. There is. Takeshio nodded, I understand, come we'll talk in father's solar. Watching the two men leave Kurotsuchi quickly realized there would be next to nothing for her to do here. She turned, looking towards the nearest empty corner. My sparring partners have left, would one of you mind to go? The empty space offered no answer. She rolled her eyes. Two more months. Never thought she'd find the day she actually missed that annoying leaf brat. Zero. Can't believe you broke into my house. Tsunade muttered, still glaring at the snake sawning over the rim of her sake cup. Oh come off it. The snake rolled his eyes. You've done the same to me, and more often I might add. That's different. She scoffed. The snake's eyebrow arched, very very high. Oh do tell. I'm a woman with a daughter. She needs peace of mind that creepy pale guys won't just show up here randomly. You're the eternal loner that doesn't need the peace of mind. So I'll take it that gives you a faux pass for that time you and Dan were fighting and I got home to find you sprawled over my beat having eaten my food, drank my sake and changed into some of my old clothes. You weren't using M. And besides you were supposed to be gone for another three days on that mission. That arched brow notched itself a little higher. That makes it better, how? Shut up. She grumbled. I suppose I'm also supposed to overlook that time you tore my door off its hinges and dragged me out of my own home in the middle of the night. It was 4 a.m. and I was going into labor you ass. Dan was out training his team on survival exercises and Shizun was on a mission. Besides I paid for the damn door. Yes you did. You neglected to pay for the broken end table, the shattered kitchen counter, or my concussion however. She was glaring now so Dan decided to cut in before something in their house was broken, like say the house. So Maru, how's life been treating you lately? Well enough. The Sanin replied shrugging. Missions have tapered down somewhat. Normally happens right before something big. Tsunade scowled poking at his knee with her toe. Don't go wishing for another war just to abate your eternal bore tomorrow. The man raised his arms in a placating gesture. Oh with Naruto here, I'm certain there will be plenty of entertainment. She jabbed that toe a little harder into his knee. This is supposed to be a celebration for his return. Not a chance for you to go dick measuring with the four sensei that have been teaching him on the daimyo's dime. You wound me. Have I made any untoward gesture all night? Why, the boy seems to be doing an apt job of celebrating as we speak. Tsunade turned her head towards the kitchen, where one Naruto was chatting excitedly with Ryoko and Kyofu and another was playing hide and seek with Akane, with her little girl currently looking for him inside the lower cabinets. She knew the snake was just waiting for a chance too. All right. She suddenly heard Ryoko shout with quite a bit of enthusiasm. Tomorrow me and Kyofu are gonna see just how easy it'll be to kick your ass again Naruto. I beat you all the time when we were kids. 
So what again are you talking about? And out comes the ruler. Looking at her teammate's placidly innocent expression Tsunade wondered how much it had cost to bust her door over his head and give him another concussion. Chapter 20 As per his usual morning ritual there was a bowl of hot, just shy of steaming, water waiting for Koto as he entered the room where he was to bathe and make himself ready for the day. The daimyo of Hai no Kuni splashed the hot water over his face, rubbing the sleep from his eyes in slow cheek to forehead motions before proceeding with the rest of his face, droplets of water pelted the surface of the bowl with a sound that told his brain more than anything else it was time to get up. He dried himself off ready to enter the adjacent chamber to bathe before a voice directly behind him nearly made the daimyo leap to the ceiling. I trust you had a good rest? The middle-aged ruler whirled around, one hand over his heart. Don't do that Sarutobi. Forgive me. The Sandaime drawled, lighting his pipe. Sometimes I forget myself. Koto waited a moment to make certain he wasn't about to suffer from cardiac arrest before he took a breath and spoke. I suppose there's a good reason for you to be scaring off the last decade of my life this early in the day? Turning around he made his way towards the bathing room and closed the door firmly behind him. To speak of Naruto in a setting where you have no need to watch protocol. The Sandaime answered through the door and your office couldn't do? Truth be told, I was anxious. Wondering if anything unusual had changed during the return to Kanahagakur? No old friend, like the last six occasions you asked me, and the last dozen or so when you deigned to question the instructors you provided for him and Kurotsuchi. He responded drolly. Quite frankly, he is a remarkable boy. If it wasn't for you saying something's wrong with him I'd have never even suspected. As it is I'm beginning to have doubts on the claim. Sorry Toby puffed on his pipe at that, not responding. He was having his own doubts. The daimyo's request for four tutors to train the Iwa princess had been fortuitous in its timing. Allowing him to kill several birds with one proverbial stone. He had granted the daimyo's request with minimal fuss, staying well within the man's good graces and most likely earning a favor or two, a thing that Koto was known to repay. He'd sent Itachi away, eliminating a threat to the Uchiha clan as well as eliminating Fugaku's ace in the hole ripping the wind out of the revolutionary clan's sails long enough to decide on a proper response without tipping his hand as to his knowledge of their planned mutiny by honoring the clan heiress with an assignment from the daimyo himself. In that same gesture getting the girl away from such a volatile environment that was clearly weighing on her psychological health, if murdering her whole family had seemed like the most adequate outcome in her mind. Lastly he'd place Naruto in a controlled environment where the tutors, the daimyo, and the next cycled unit of the daimyo's Anbu guard, could observe him carefully over an extended period while also giving their prodigy the same skills and advantages Iwa's princess was going to get. Putting, at least in theory, one of his own on equal if not greater footing than Anaki's granddaughter. While simultaneously pushing him well out of Orochimaru's sphere of influence where the snake couldn't affect the outcome in any way. Move your enemy, do not be moved by him. Had held true and had turned that very stressful day into an easy turnaround with Koto's unexpected request. Orochimaru had been furious. It wasn't something he outwardly demonstrated by shouting or destroying something. But Sarutobi had known the boy since he was twelve. He knew him well enough to tell. He wanted the world to know that Naruto was his success, his apprentice. With four other tutors, ones under the daimyo's aegis no less, he now had to share in the credit, and snakes were always very territorial creatures. Outside of his estranged students' grievances, the one hang-up of this plan that had not panned out were the reports. He continued to receive conflicting views from his sources. Some claimed the boy was perfectly healthy while others, even though admitting they could not put their finger on the issue stressed that something was clearly off with the former Jinchuriki. Everything from random, snippets of knowledge or comments that shouldn't come from him, to episodes of clearly zoning out, to the point that it took physical contact to snap him out of it. But there was nothing big like the events described by Itachi and Orochimaru six years ago. And most importantly there wasn't a firm diagnosis. Some of his ninja claimed PTSD, another claimed schizophrenia, one had claimed simple ad, whom had been firmly rebuked by Sarutobi. He insisted that was not a disease or condition it was a lack of discipline by over-medicating stupid parents that didn't want to admit their incompetence. HMPF. There were at least three other diagnoses and none of them really fit when held under strict scrutiny. There were two reasons he was hesitant to really act on this. Firstly, because Naruto was growing powerful. That was the first and foremost reason. At the rate he was going, Sarutobi had no doubt that Naruto would easily easily be as powerful as his father when he grew. And to stunt that growth now was the very last thing he would do if it could be avoided. And secondly, it was Minato and Kushina's son. 
He didn't want the boy needlessly institutionalized not only for practical concerns of his rapidly growing strength, but for emotional ones as well. And he didn't want the boy to be led to greater harm by sheer inaction. Koto and many others, including some of the more concerned observers said he was a functional gentle child. Still, he wasn't sure what to do. Are you still there Saru? Koto called and Saru Tobi decided he'd intruded on the daimyo's good graces long enough. As quietly as he came, he left, ignoring the daimyo's muttering of ninja and their stealth. Zero. The knock on the door startled him awake Naruto blinked dazedly, panicking for a half second at the unfamiliar surroundings before he remembered where he was. He spread his senses out, more curious than concerned as he realized who was at the door. He hopped off the bed, grumbling as he scratched at his head and eyes, making his way towards the door. Opening it with a click he looked out to Ryoko and Kyofu. What's up? He drawled. Why are you staying at a hotel? Ryoko asked. Naruto blinked do you have any idea how filthy a place is after years with no cleaning? It's gonna take my clones all day to get that place to livable conditions again. Both girls offered grimaces of disgust. Yeah. The silver-haired teammate drawled. Got a point there. The blonde smiled and opened the door wider, walking back towards the bed as they walked into the room. So what's up? It's been six years Naruto. Kyofu smiled. We decided to come spend the day with you. Yeah. Ryoko smirked as she sat herself down in the cheap hotel chair. Show you around, get you reacquainted, build up that happiness level before savoring your defeat later today. Naruto smirked back. Challenge bloody accepted. Still think you can beat me huh? With a big goddamn smile on my face, she laughed. Naruto smirked, hopping onto the bed, his face scrunching up in thought for a moment. Hey, tell me something. I didn't want to really talk about it last night with Tsunade but, Akane. She's as young as I was when I joined the academy. I remembered Tsunade trying to talk me out of joining till she was blue in the face so. Ryoko shrugged. Beats me. Kyofu, sitting down in the bed beside him hummed in thought. Well she and Dan are two of our strongest reputed ninja. Tsunade-sama especially with her medical skills. Perhaps she was put under pressure to return as quickly as possible to the hospital and Dan to return to the field. Six years with our top healer and one of our top operatives only working part-time, at best, isn't something a village can just take lying down easily. Naruto frowned. He hadn't thought of that. Many shinobi families often had one of the parents retire when the child was born, usually it was the ninja of lower rank, since the other was one, more valuable to the village, and two, made more money. But with both Tsunade and Dan being high-ranking, high-demand ninja, neither one was a loss the village would be willing to just take. Not to mention that Akane herself, if his suspicions were correct, is the new Jinchuriki of Son Goku. Lineage, necessity, and Jinchuriki, three reasons why Sarutobi would be all but shoving her into the academy door. He didn't like that picture over much really. Zero. You can't let this occur, talk sense into your father. Takeshio was a patient man, a quality he believed he'd inherited well from Koto, but his cousin's insistence was beginning to wear even on his placid, calm personality. The two were in the gardens. They were supposed to be enjoying breakfast together but instead were back to discussing the subject they'd been deadlocked over since his cousin's arrival just yesterday. Kurotsuchi will be returning home Kotaro. She is too valuable for you to just hand back as if Iwa isn't simply looking for an excuse. And you would give them that excuse. Anaki has lost his daughter and one of his sons. He only has the one left and this one grandchild. He can be cowed by threatening her. Do not misuse this advantage. You both have to see that the second she is outside our borders Iwa will be making open preparations to attack us again, and Kumo will not be far behind. Takeshio shook his head. She is returning home, he said. We had an agreement with Anaki. One that didn't live for a day before he sicked his two Jinchuriki against your father to try and break it. And just because he continued, glaring now. There are inherent dangers and disadvantages to honoring our word, there is no reason to break it. Kurotsuchi deserves to see her father and grandfather again and we will let her. And have our doors open to her should she ever wish to return. Kotaro leaned forward glaring into Takeshio's eyes with a cold anger. You won't help me convince Koto-sama then. Takeshio nodded. I believe we're getting somewhere now. The shorter, dark-haired man leaned back. If that's the case then I request we take some precautions. The daimyo's son sighed through his nostrils. 
He'd been hoping this conversation would just be over. Such as? As a start I would like to be allowed to take stock of our grain and treasury reserves. I would also like to be given permission to execute repairs on the roads, and requisition orders for a recruitment draft after the harvest is over and done with. As a start, you say? Takeshio drawled, turning his gaze away from Kotaro's cold gaze after a moment. I can approve you taking stock of our reserves but for the rest you'll have to ask father. It will have to do I suppose. Kotaro drawled, clearly displeased with the words. While Takeshio understood his cousin's misgivings about Iwa, he was not, and he was certain his father was not, about to let those misgivings lead them to betray Kurotsuchi's trust. None in Iwa were trusted by them, and Anaki was a ruthless, opportunistic cutthroat when it came right down to it. The legacy of his master's teachings, the Naidaim Suchikich. But Kurotsuchi, after having near raised the girl since she was ten, was not someone they wanted to stab in the back, much less hold hostage with the threat of death. His father would have been able to convince him, bring him about to his way of thinking. Koto could usually do that. He might have even managed it before their food got cold. A shame he hadn't inherited his father's good graces. Zero. As he marched through the village streets again, Naruto's eyes couldn't help but gaze, almost forlornly at the sights around him. His teammates took in his expression, mistaking it for curiosity at all the new changes that had happened over the last six years. The new shops that had cropped up, the bazaar that had opened with the current booming trade with Suna and Kiri using Konoha and some of its territories as way stations for their own markets. It's nice isn't it? Kyofu ventured, gesturing towards what was rapidly becoming a bazaar just beside the main square. Silks from Suna, medicines and steel from Kiri, jewels from bird country. Being in the center of the continent has opened up trade for us very well. She commented. Yeah, especially since no one has to worry about Iwa getting uppity with the daimyo holding their princess on a leash, Ryoko chuckled. Naruto frowned. Hey Kurotsuchi's a friend and Koto isn't holding her hostage. Ryoko raised an eyebrow, incredulous before she shrugged. If you say so Naruto. I don't know either of them. Just saying what the word on the mill is. How well do you know the daimyo and the Tsuchikage's granddaughter Naruto? Kyofu asked as they made their way through the hub. The blonde grinned. Pretty good I think. They're both good people. Though Kuro-chan's a lot easier to prank than Koto. You tried to prank the daimyo if anyone was competing for a way to pull off looking aghast and murderous simultaneously, then Kyofu was certainly a contender. Was it a good one? Naruto laughed. Oh I tried everything, painting his clothes pink, putting itching cream in his soaps, putting glue on the throne. I never got him. I blame the Anbu guard. I can sneak past one set of eyes easy but twelve is a little much even for me. Ryoko scoffed playfully. Excuses excuses she darted out of his reach as he swiped at her, both of them oblivious to the horror-filled look in Kyofu's eyes. It was through the crowds that Naruto caught the shock of brightly colored clothes. Oh. Hey Ramon. The olive-skinned man started looking this way and that way as he searched for the voice before finding them as Naruto called again. Oh Naruto it is good you've come. He held held out a wall tapestry, its images and bright colors depicting a colored map of the entire continent, complete with a legend of sorts, of the major cities, ports and military fortresses in each. I am thinking this will look good on my wall. The blonde shrugged, he wasn't much into tapestry art, though the head of the daimyo's guard certainly was. His rooms in the palace was one of the most interesting, brightly colored monstrosities he'd ever laid eyes on really. Red seat pillows, carpets of purples, oranges and reds, various tapestries and tile murals. And several kinds of incense for different days of the week or holidays. It was weird, but it suited the foreigner. Who's this guy? Ah, sorry. Naruto apologized. Ryoko-chan, Kyofu-chan this is Ramon, head of the daimyo's honor guard. You are making me sound old now. He smiled, a set of white teeth on what most would refer to as a baby face as he held his hand forward. It is pleasure to meet Naru's teammates. Ryoko took the offered hand first, Kyofu a second later. You seem young to hold such a high position. The mocha-skinned Chonin noted. It is family curse you see. He grinned. We stay forever handsome no matter what age we make. I thought that only applied to your maturity. Naruto snickered. Hush you. Respect the old. Considering his current track record with Sarutobi that was not very likely to happen. But Rahman was allowed his hopes and dreams. The foreigner looked around raising a curious eyebrow. Where is Itachi girl? 
you two were always connected at pelvis back in the palace. Ryoko laughed and Naruto blushed, the red blooming across his face to creep down his neck and up the tip of his ears. That's not he growled as he caught the man's sly little smirk, damn bastard using his accent as an excuse. Kyofu grinned with a raised eyebrow. Oh? Does our Naruto have another girlfriend then? First it was that Kiri girl, now this Kuro-chan and now a new Itachi? And you're just twelve? Working fast their big guy. The boy makes any man jealous truly. You know. Kyofu grinned. You're not allowed to have a girlfriend until she passes Ryoko in my screening test right Naruto? Ha! Ah. Naruto drawled, glaring at them now as he crossed his arms. No seriously. Ryoko decided to continue the joke waggling her finger in front of his face. No dating until she gets the seal of approval from us. Naruto's teeth clamped down where the offending digit had been with an audible clack. Oh I bet she likes that. Can we get to the training ground soon? He ventured, a gleam in his eye. Suddenly I'm looking forward to our friendly match more than I was before. Zero. It was a while later that the three did in fact, find themselves in the training grounds, only, unexpectedly there was someone waiting for them. Naruto blinked in curiosity. Itachi? The raven-haired Uchiha turned, looking over her shoulder, near waist-length hair allowed to hang down like a curtain behind her as she turned. Naruto. She paused, as though waiting for something before Naruto caught himself at Kyofu's point at a hem. Oh, ah, uh, Ryoko-chan, Kyofu-chan, this is Ncha I mean Itachi. He hastily corrected. He really did have to grow out of that nickname he'd given her when he was a kid. He could feel his silver-haired teammate's wolf-like smile behind him. Oh that's so sweet you have pet names already. I'm going to murder you. Naruto deadpanned. Slowly, I'll enjoy it. Itachi raised an eyebrow. Ignoring his snickering teammate he decided to try and avert the subject again. So what's up? Word got around as to your little bout and I thought I'd drop by. She drawled. You'd either need a fourth member or an extraordinary strong opponent. I figured I could fill either role. She shrugged. That and she'd wanted to leave the house for a few hours. Without Sasuke beside her, the place felt less like a home and more like a residence she had to keep returning to. And her brother still had school for another four hours. Naruto grinned. You wanna try and take us three on one? Or two on two? Kyofu supplied. You're not trying to weasel out of our rematch right? Ryoko chuckled. Naruto scratched at his cheek. Well we could go two on two but whoever has Itachi on their side is most likely gonna win in that case. That piqued the wind user's interest? You think your girlfriend's that strong? If she expected some kind of reaction, she was to be disappointed. The placid, almost bored features of the Uchiha princess didn't even twitch in anything remotely resembling surprise. Naruto though, started to nod. Yeah she hey she's not my girlfriend. Zero. There was nothing for it really. She was bored. Bored out of her goddamn mind. After six years of living with four instructors, a little ball of hyperactivity that wouldn't shut up and the best damn training partner a girl could ask for, along with Koto and Lady Inoue to keep her occupied, she had never really taken stock of just how much actual time she shared with them. With each one suddenly recalled back to Konoha, it was like the carpet had been ripped out from under her and she didn't like it. She didn't like it at all. Worse was the fact that while there were certainly people at the palace, None of them, not a single one, really had time for anything, least of all with her, the quote slash unquote most dangerous person there. What with her being the only hostile ninja on the grounds. The only one who seemed to really have desire to speak was Takeshio, and Takeshio, in lieu of his father's leave, was understandably busy. So he didn't have the time. And she had nothing to do. She'd already done her morning exercises, she'd already rifled through the library yesterday for a book she hadn't read, and read said book she'd even slept early and woken up late. All just to try and bleed the hours away. So she just wandered. Literally marching through the entire palace, down the corridors, into empty rooms, across the rooftops. She had no doubt at least one of the Anbu were following her around, but she really didn't care. If he or she decided to make themselves known and say she was cut off from X or Y wing, which had never happened in the years she'd been here, it'd break the dreadful monotony. It wasn't until she heard a faint crying that she found something to do. Channeling chakra to her feet she swiveled under the overhang of the tiled roof, following the sound towards one of the many palace windows. 
She peeked in and wasn't surprised to find Sasami wailing at the top of her powerful little lungs as the nursemaid rocked her, trying to calm the grouchy baby to take its midday nap. When the baby's eyes opened and found her hanging upside down outside her window, she paused in her screams, blinking in confusion. Kurotsuchi sidestepped, hiding behind the wall. Sasami screamed again. Until the brunette peeked her head back out. That Tsuchikage's granddaughter wasn't sure if it was more of a novelty, or just plain old sad that the most entertaining part of her day so far was playing the ninja version of Peekaboo with the daimyo's infant daughter. Zero. Naruto is excited, despite himself, all but bouncing on the balls of his feet. This is gonna be fun. He chuckles. Better not have gotten sloppy on me Naru-chan. Ryoko smirks, pulling her weapon free from where it had been resting on her back, beginning to spin it lazily in one hand. Course not. Be careful though. Itachi's sneaky, real sneaky, likes her genjutsu more than anything. The Uchiha era strolled out a flat response. As she unclasped the heavier shirt, leaving her clad only in a skin-tight garment he wouldn't be surprised to find guy wearing if it had been green. She reached down, tightening the bandages on her ankles to keep her pants from flaring out and rustling. Stealth then. Giving away my secrets Naruto-kun? Just a few. He smiled. You know some of mine so it's only fair. She didn't answer. What are you thinking? Ryoko threw to the side soft enough so the Uchiha couldn't hear. I'll go in at once, or two while number three hangs back and waits for an opening. Kyofu shook her head, one hand on her chin, thinking. No, Naruto goes in alone. The blonde pouted. Mo, why am I getting the tough job? Because you know the most about her. She answered. You'll push her to reveal more than the preliminary tactics she'd use on us if we tried to charge and head first. Naruto shrugged. Made sense. Remember. Kyofu warned. We have three minutes on the clock from the first attack. Best two out of three wins. She put her hands on her watch. He grinned, forming a familiar hand-shaped cross-cage bunshine no jutsu. Two versions of the Jinchuriki were suddenly in his place and both rushed forward. The Uchiha stood placidly, the caw of a crow sounding off from somewhere directly behind her, and Naruto recognized it as one of her many genjutsu triggers, fluctuating the chakra violently through his body in order to dispel the illusion before it even formed. She jumped into the air and he dispelled the single clone, the sudden influx of chakra and brief memories enough to disrupt the second, and third illusion placed over him. He stopped, turned on his heel, pivoting fast before he launched three wind-powered shuriken into the trees, the blades rapidly extending to blanket a whole swathe of greenery. She fell out of the trees, one foot latching onto the trunk to hold herself aloft over the mulched ground that was jut hoping she'd land in it to sink. She formed her own hand seals, fire bellowing out of her mouth to catch the three shuriken overhead, infusing the flames with the wind, the whole forest canopy quickly became a blanket of fire. Naruto cursed, sheer heat making his eyes water as he saw her bleed back into the smoke to hide. Damn it looks like our jobs just got a lot harder. He heard Kyofu curse. She didn't know the half of it though. Itachi's skill with Genjutsu, even without the use of the Sharingan was something he was understandably leery of. She could literally use anything as a trigger mechanism to trap you into an illusion. A sound, a sensation, a scent. If she was able to slither her way through the consciousness defenses into the subconscious, masking it as just so much background noise the brain processed every minute of the day, she could grab you. With the heat and the smoke and the smell and the flames the brain literally had a buffet line of new input for her to mask her illusions with. Luckily he came prepared. Pulling a scroll from his kunai pouch the blonde unrolled it with a grin. What exploded out of the thing was water. And water. And water. A literal lake poured out of the scroll and into the air, drenching everything and dousing the better part of the flames. Jeez Louise. What the fuck? Ryoko protested, thoroughly drenched now and standing in waterlogged mud. Naruto shrugged. I might have a water affinity, but I'm no nidime that can just pull moisture out the air. So scrolls. He pointed at the unrolled piece of gear by way of answer. I love Fuyu Ninjutsu. That just leaves one issue. Kyofu deadpanned. Where is she? Naruto looked back into the drenched forest, other than the last few flames and some scorched tree tops, it was pretty much unchecked. He stepped forward, sloshing in the water, eyes narrowed. Ryoko looked down at her feet. Anyone else wondering why it's taking this last inch of water so long to get sucked up by the dirt? Her two teammates paused, then, all three jumped straight up into the trees as the water at their feet flash boiled. 
The three ninja were in the charred tree tops, with Naruto quickly forming a hand seal, gathering the water in a crude torrent and sending it hurtling off to boil somewhere else. Underground, Kyofu shouted. On it. His silver haired teammate sprang into action, that custom double volgue, now far more adequate in terms of size, charged with wind chakra as she drove one blade down into the ground to the base. Naruto's eyes widened a bit as he saw the wind that had been coating the weapon simply spear itself down, deep into the earth before the ground around the Chonin exploded upwards, like an explosion going off below. Itachi's form was visible within the debris then, hovering above. Got her. A cloud of smoke obscured Kyofu and Naruto caught four blurs shooting out from it, it took his eyes a moment to figure out they were summons. Bird summons. But, wasn't Kyofu a lizard summoner? One shot towards the raven-haired beauty faster than the others, hurtling towards her like an arrow before Itachi's body dispersed into the ravens she was beginning to truly favor, the birds were like black smoke, dispersing and reforming when touched, flying off in different directions before they once again adopted their human shape outside the boundaries of Ryoko's little donut crater. Interesting technique. She drawled, brushing off her shoulders and shirt. I've never seen it. Ryoko grinned. Like it? Developed it to get sensei. He loves his doton techniques and escapes. Drive the wind chakra into the ground, split in in four directions, and expand it rapidly. Gets em every time. Could you incorporate blades into it? She asked. Ryoko grinned. Not perfected. But working on it. This is still a friendly match though so I didn't want to kill you. The Uchiha nodded, if she could incorporate wind blades, then the match would have been theirs. Kyofu's bird suddenly smacked headfirst into trees, vanishing moments later in puffs of smoke. What the she caught on, eyes widening. You placed my summons in an illusion? Impossible to do on normal animals. But summoned beasts are intelligent. She explained. Their brain functions and processing of information are far more similar to our own especially the eyes. Her gobsmacked expression was priceless. That was a weakness she'd never faced yet. Not even Orochimaru had been able to succeed in bringing her summons under an illusion. Kyofu's watch alarm went off. Ryoko cursed. Three-minute matches suck. Oftentimes battles are decided in less. Itachi shrugged. Besides it's sparring, not an exercise in needlessly risking injury. Okay so this round is. Your win. Itachi interrupted. That win technique actually hit me, if it had been the lethal version, needless to say I'd be dead. She shrugged. I promise though, you won't get the last win you need. She smirked. Zero. Meanwhile, Sarutobi was back in his office, doing what he and every other village leader disliked most of all. Paperwork of course. The stack was fairly mild today, though that was likely to change in a handful of months. He raised his eyes over the file's edge as he looked up at his guest, staring expectantly. It's done. The man drawled. I've sent off two of my best to keep an eye on Iwagakur and gather intelligence. If they're planning anything against our daimyo or his family, after they recover their princess they'll report back to us. And we'll be able to make preparations. The older man drawled, he reached up, scratching at his bald, liver-spotted scalp. Have you considered my offer? The Anbu nodded. I have. The answer is no. The older man took a breath and slowly let it out. It's sad to hear. You should pass on your skills before it's too late Kakashi-kun. My place is in the Anbu Hokage-sama. I don't wish to leave. A shame, he said, though his heart wasn't truly in it. Kakashi was his best agent. A front-runner to replace him next to Tsunade and Orochimaru. Probably even more favored due to his relative youth in comparison. To still have him on the front, running missions and assignments rather than in the rear teaching students wasn't exactly a loss that was going to keep him awake at night. You still have three months before this graduation if you choose to change your mind Kakashi. I'll keep it in mind sir. Alright guys, that's it for the video. If you enjoyed it, please feel free to leave a like and subscribe. As always, the rest of the story is already out over on Patreon, link to that will be in the description. Anyways, until next time, peace.